Good morning. I'm Sarah Alexander, Executive Director of the Maine Organic Farmers and Gardeners Association. Good morning. I'm Beth Schiller. I am the Mofka Board President, and I am a farmer in Bodenham, Maine. And we're here this morning. We're excited to welcome you back to day three of the 44th annual Common Ground Country Fair this year online. We're here at the Common Ground Education Center in Unity, Maine. Our beautiful campus is behind us here. As you can see, um, Beth and I are the only ones here today. But we're excited that you're able to tune in online. And we want to start this morning with a land acknowledgement of this beautiful land that we're on. So we are situated here in the homeland of the Wabanaki people, and we express our respect to the indigenous communities who have lived on these ancestral lands for almost 15,000 years and to the future generations who will come. With this acknowledgement, we recognize the legacies of settler colonialism, and we signal an ongoing commitment to building relationships with the Wabanaki. We are deeply honored to partner with the Wabanaki community members who participate in our programs each year, including the Maine Indian Basket Makers Alliance, which has participated in the Common Ground Country Fair for more than 25 years. And we encourage everyone participating in the online fair this year to learn more about Maine's tribes by going to Wabanaki Alliance com. There's another way that you can also learn a little bit more about the Maine Indian Basket Makers Alliance. We actually, one of our uh, aspects of the Common Ground online fair this year is a video library. And if you go to fair.mofka.org, we have an incredible selection of curated videos that you can navigate through every aspect of the fair, including the Maine Indian Basket Makers Alliance, and see videos from those communities that are showcasing the artisan uh, skills and crafts that they've been carrying on for many generations. Um, so there are many other ways to participate today too. This is all new for us this year, but on day three, hopefully you've had a little bit of a chance to try out some of the new things. Um, so certainly the live stream is number one. Hopefully you found us and you're watching us now. We are at fair.mofka.org and it's broadcasting on Facebook Live and YouTube Live. So there are a few ways to interact there through questions for our presenters. Almost each of our presenters today will be doing a live question and answer. So if you go to Facebook Live or YouTube Live, you will be able to, to log in there and ask questions of our speakers. We're also excited to partner with some of our media sponsors this morning, including WERU Radio. They are going to be simulcasting our keynote speaker at 11 a.m., which is going to be Winona LaDuke. So if you're in the radio broadcast area or online and you want to listen in on radio, please go to WERU, and we thank them for their support and partnership and longstanding sponsorship of the fair. We also want to thank our media sponsors, Omain Studios, who are right here with us today at the Common Ground Education Center, um, and are, who are helping make all of this possible to get it out to you all, um, wherever you're streaming in from, at home, hopefully safe and sound with your family and loved ones this morning. So thank you to Omain Studios. Now, just in case you haven't done it yet, Beth and I are wearing our Common Ground <laughs> Country Fair t-shirts this morning, um, all local and organic, printed by Liberty Graphics, just a few miles down the road here from us in Unity, Maine. And you can get your own Common Ground Country Fair t-shirt by going onto our website and clicking on the store or going straight to store.mofka.org and you can get t-shirts, bags, aprons, all of the wonderful things that have our beautiful bee bomb print on it this morning. Um, so you can do that. And then we also hope that while you're on the website, you will become a member or renew your membership to Mofka. So we count on members like you and the fair is our most important time each year to renew those memberships and sign up new members. Um, so please don't hesitate in becoming a member today or renewing your membership. So we've got a great day planned for you and Beth is gonna tell us a little bit about our first speaker. Great. Uh, it's an honor to be here with all of you in this capacity. I've gone to the fair almost every year of my life. And over the trajectory, uh, I have experienced the fair as a youth that was teaching other youth about recycling. And I have over time grown into a commercial gardener. And throughout that whole trajectory, I've always made sure to go to Will's Talks. He is an incredible presenter who has a really vast array of knowledge that can apply both to home gardens and commercial production. And also I think just creates a lot of expansiveness for anyone who wants to learn more about where their food comes from and how it's grown. Um, 
and he also is really excellent at answering questions. So I hope you both listen to the talk and then stick around for the question session after. Uh, Will also has a book, so if you can't quite grab all of the knowledge, because there's going to be a lot in the short time ahead, please look up his book, Radical Self and Reliant Gardening. Um, and it's another way to learn more about what he has to offer and add to your library. So we are pretty excited to shift on over to learn more about Will and what he is offering us today. Thanks for being here. Hi everyone, Will Bonsell here from the Scatterseed Project and uh, we're welcome to the 2020 Common Ground Fair, um, virtual fair that is, because of the current pandemic we can't all get together in person and enjoy this as we have other years, but uh, this is the best we can do so we're, we're going to go work with that. Um, times like this coming, this past year, really drive home as much as anything possibly could that we need to be have resilient food systems that can can uh, provide for us in very troubled times like this. And uh, that implies uh, to me being self-reliant for uh, things like water and fertility and energy and seeds certainly. And so uh, being more, th this is very much dramatically documented by the fact that uh, the seed industry generally in this country is in disarray. They've had so much trouble trying to keep things on the shelf and uh, whatever they're They've been outstocked again and again. Uh, and big message in that for you if you're in the habit of growing your food but to buy your seeds from the catalog. We need to learn how to do more of it ourselves. The whole general topic of seed saving is far too big a topic to, for me to even try to cover in our very limited time here. And so I'm going to focus on two very specific things. Uh, one is the how do you know when your seed plants or the seeds themselves are really ready, are really mature? Because if you harvest them too soon, they will be worthless. So we're going to talk about that. And uh, uh, secondly, once you've got the seeds, how do you process them, uh, whether it's drying them or cleaning them so that they're ready for storage and for replanting? So those are the two things we're going to focus on. Unlike most crop species, squash will continue to mature even after harvesting. We said before with other things that when they're dry, dead, mature and all that, that's when the seed is ready. Well, in the case of a few things, particularly squash and pumpkins come to mind, is even after this is picked, it is now separated from the mother. The seed in this will continue to mature even more, to get even better, if left in here for the time being. If we don't cut it open, take the seeds out right away. And the reason why is because the fruit, the, the squash, like a tomato, it's actually uh, a placenta. I know that's not very appealing when you're trying to think of mashing up your steamed squash for supper, but uh, it is. And as long as these seeds are connected by that little string, that little umbilical to the placenta, they are still getting nutrients from the fruit, even though the fruit is now separate from the plant. So therefore, this curing process, aging this thing, the seed, if I cut it open right now and took the seeds out, they'd be fine. But if I were to leave this in storage for weeks or even months from now, um, then it will improve even further. So that's a handy thing to keep in mind. Uh, the only other example that I think of is if we're talking about tomatoes, um, likewise, by when the thing is picked, it will continue to mature to the point where, and this is getting back to this, this is very handy to know. If you really want to leave your fruits until they're full, your tomatoes until they're good bright red and all that before you harvest them, it's really good to do that. What if you can't? What if you have a killing frost comes along tonight and wipes out your plants? And let's say you've got a lot of them that are like this, that are green. Big, full-sized, shiny, glossy, maybe a tinge of color, but even if not, uh, they're, they're definitely not mature and not right for seed at this point. But you've got to, but it's all you've got. And so I'd say go ahead and pick them. Be sure and pick them before the frost, because the, if they freeze, then they're goners. Then put it on a perhaps a warm, sunny windowsill in the house or something and let them continue to after ripen uh, and they will, and they will eventually uh, get to be uh, ripe enough to cut them open. And the seed, which may have not been viable at the time that you picked it, will become viable again. It's feeding off from the placenta for some more time. It's critical that the seed be, that the fruits be uh, shiny green. If they're uh, not glossy but matte colored, uh, then even if they do color up, they won't color up very well. And even if they don't, the seed is just too mature, it almost certainly won't germinate. So it's a handy thing to know that. Um, now, um, here, just for example, is a cuke. 
that is ready to eat, but no good for seed. The seeds in it are not even filled out yet. It's quite useless. Here, on the other hand, is a cucumber, which is totally useless for seed. It's so gone by, but perfect for seed. Okay, so this is what we want. You have to let it go by till it gets like that. In other words, if you'll pardon the expression, you, you can't uh, have your cuc and eat it too. Uh, so in the case of, here's an eggplant, one which is probably not ripe for seed yet. Here's one which is the way it's supposed to be. Nice little zucchini, perfect for eating. Wouldn't want to get much bigger than that, but useless for seed. Here's one which is useless for uh, eating and perfect for seed. Uh, tomatoes. This tomato is useless for seed, although I have more to say about that after. This one is okay. This one is actually better yet. It's at the point where you might throw it at a, at a crooked politician or a bad actor on the stage or something. This is, it's uh, overripe. And for seed purposes, that is perfect. However, this is also just good if you want to have your tomato and not, not have your seed and not throw away the rest of it. So there's just some examples. Um, here's a green bean, wonderful for eating, no good for seed. Here is ready for seed and no good for eating unless it happens to be a dry bean variety, of course. Uh, likewise, um, a snow pea. This is rather gone by for a snow pea, but nowhere near ready for uh, use as seed. These are pea vines, which are pretty much dry. They'd be nice if they were a little, had less green in them, but these pods, they're good. They're ready. They're dry. They're brittle. Okay, that's what we, how we know. Um, a carrot. These are the carrots are a biennial, so you spend this year, most people have grown carrots all their life, and all they've ever seen is carrots. They've never seen the seed. They've often asked me, where does the seed come from? It's because it's a biennial. Go to the second year, and you'll get something that looks like this. Okay, by the way, Queen Anne's lace is wild carrot or feral carrot, so it'll look just like this. So this is carrot that's gone to seed, but not yet. It's gone to flower, but not ripe seed. Here's one which has got ripe seed. If I clean that off, I've got good carrot seed. So you see, you, if you're... If you're doing two different things, you have to decide which are you trying to get food out of this or you're trying to get seed. You can't always do both. Um, now, let's see. Uh, then, uh, in addition to that, um, the process of cleaning the seeds uh, is based on the fact, the very fortunate fact, that the seeds are always the densest, not necessarily the heaviest, but the densest part of its respective plant. Talk a minute about why that is. Uh, and that helps us if we're trying to clean it, particularly by threshing and winnowing. Um, the densest part is the seed. Well, when you think about it, I mean, why, why wouldn't it be? If you, all the other parts of the plant, the stem, the dried leaves, the, all the other things, those are basically cellulose. or They're, they're basically um, carbohydrate structural stuff, or the leaves are the uh, photosynthesizing part. They don't need to have a lot of density to do that. But the seed, if you'll stop and think about it, is where the most important part of the plant is. It's where the information is stored. And that information is stored in an alphabet consisting of four letters, uh, A, C, D, G, adenine, cytosine, guanine, thiamine, the four amino acids that make up DNA. And these strains of DNA, which may be miles long, are all curled up into tight little packages called seeds. And so uh, when you think about it, the seed is a combination of the plant's uh, owner's operation manual, all the information about what, how it's supposed to do different things is in there. It's also the family Bible. It's also that plant's history of its past, its ancestors going back to the dawn of life. And every, every thing that happened, every challenge that it met, every success it had, every failure it had, actually no failures because if it had a failure, then the seed wouldn't be here. But the successes are all recorded in that. So it only makes sense that that incredible amount of material is going to be concentrated in something very, very dense. And so the seeds are, that's where it's at. That's also part of the reason why seeds tend to be the most nutritional uh, for food part of things. That's where the, that's where the good stuff is. Um, so anyway, so that's very helpful to us when we're trying to clean seeds. Um, and I think this is a good point for me to demonstrate uh, a few things. Um, I could start with any number of things, but let's just, for example, uh, I'm going to start with one of the simplest things to clean. I've got some coriander here. Coriander plants, which are very, very ripe, as you can see, and got lots of ripe seed on them. So in this case, if I had a big a bucket or something here, what I would do is take the whole plant or a wash tub or something, put it in there and scrunch it. But I can just do that with some of them right here in my hands. Okay, just rub it. Look at that stuff. Just shatters right off in there. Falls off. Seed, a little bits of the broken stem. 
Uh, lots of if there is any dried leaf or anything left on it, that'll come off too. And I've got to separate them. I don't want them to, to, to be together. Okay, let's some seed and some junk, dust and stuff. Okay, uh, when you're cleaning seeds, dried seeds, basically uh, use some combination of threshing and winnowing. Not enough to break the seed, but rubbing around to get so the seed is separate from the from the dust and stuff. And then here, at this small scale, I just so there goes the junk. I may have to do it more than once because there's something still clean. And now I end up with some quite clean coriander seed here, ready to store for either eating for for using and putting in your applesauce as ground up coriander, which to me is the main way to use um, coriander, if that shows. And uh, or to store for seed, either way. Okay, well, I could do that with zillions of these things. I won't uh, take the time to do all of them, but basically that's what it consists of. Taking things and rubbing it in your hands. Um, these carrot seeds, I would do the same way. Uh, charred seed. Oh, I also didn't get to show you. This is second year Swiss chard plant. It's still got the dirt on it. It's still alive, would be still growing, except it got dug up. It's all covered with green seed things on it. Okay, not ripe yet. This should not be harvested at this stage, except for purposes of demonstrating to you. What is useful, here's another plant, which is mature, basically dead. And the parts are mostly dry. And again, I've got lots of seed on it. I could thresh that off and winnow it in my hands, and I would end up with lots and lots of nice charred seed. Okay, and so it goes for pretty much all of these uh, crops. Um, it's pretty straightforward, with a couple of major exceptions. Um, there are a couple of species where the mature seed is inside of a succulent wet fruit. Mainly we're thinking of tomatoes and cucumbers, okay? So you have to process those in a different way. And um, uh, I didn't bring a knife with me, but I think I can, hmm, didn't think of that. I'll find some way of getting through it. Um, and there are several ways of doing it. Uh, with this ripe tomato, for example, I'm gonna start with a, cu a cucumber, okay? Let's see. We can improvise here. That's what we do in a crisis year like this. We learn to improvise. See, you, you thought that was a spoon. <laughs> Silly you. Not razor sharp, but does cut the thing open. And in there, we should find lots of cucumber seed. Now we'll use the cucumber, the spoon for a spoon and scoop this thing out. Okay. When I'm doing a large amount, I'll put them in a five gallon plastic bucket and I'll end up with gallons of this stuff. Seeds and all the gooey stuff around it, all the guts. Okay, that works just fine, except we can't leave it that way. Uh, and the same thing I would get when I do tomatoes, which I'm about to. Um, you would end up with the seed and all the guts around it. Well, the problem is with those guts is, yes, you can dry them and store them, but it doesn't, and it will work, but not very well because those little, each of those little gooey like frog's eggs things around each seed. When that dries, it's full of sugars and protein things, which will basically, they'll tend to hold moisture. Even when it's dry, it'll still tend to take up moisture. But also when you plant the seed next spring, those, that bit of stuff will tend to harbor the spores of the disease, which causes damping off. And so your seed will not, not keep for many years. It may be not very good even the, second, the first year, the year after you grew it. Um, so we really want to get rid of that stuff. And it's fairly simple how to do it. We do it by fermentation which accomplishes a couple of important things. Um, first of all, um, let me bring these over here. In the case of tomatoes, let's say instead of the cucumber, I'd done the tomato. Cut it in half, squeeze the guts into here. And if it's not overripe, I might still throw the, the leftover uh, uh, fruit into the uh, ketchup pot or whatever. But I, in most cases, you, you lose the fruit along with the seed. And then, then I want to ferment it. And so I put it in, this is one that was started just yesterday and there's nothing going on there yet. Just kind of milky juice around it, some seeds in it. This one is a few days later. And you see this, all the scuzz on the top of it, that thing of mold looks gross, good. If it doesn't look gross, it's probably not ready yet. I, when people ask me, how do I know when it's done? Put it in a sunny window, for example, for a few days and until it's done. When someone says, how do you know if it's done? Is basically your signif significant other will say, get this stuff the hell out of here. It's, uh, it's got fruit flies flying around it and so on. You know it's done. Then to separate it, 
Oh, if I can get this off. There we go. And by the way, it has a gauze thing on it or something so that it can breathe. It could have nothing at all, but this keeps the fruit flies from getting at it. Okay, now I'm going to take this. Okay, I've already tied this up. I'm just going to throw this away because I don't need that cucumber and I do need the bowl. Okay, so we put it in here. Or actually, I can do it in the, in the jar. I scrunch this up really good because in with that pulp, the crap that's floating on the top, there are some perfectly good seeds or might be perfectly good. And the only way I'm going to know is if I release it. Okay, this is every bit as gross as it looks and uh, not for the squeamish, moldy, mucky stuff. And when I do this, break it all up so everything's free floating. So if it keeps floating, then it's no good. If it sinks, then we know it's good. Okay, I'm doing this. I'm going to fill it up with some more water. Usually I'll do this like in a quart jar or sometimes with cubes I'm doing like gallons of it. I'll do it in a big bucket. Okay. I'm going to be moving around a little bit here. We're going to do this, and as, I don't know if you can see it or not, with a taller jar you can see it. The seeds, everything's swirling around there, and as it does so, the crappy stuff will swirl around and go to the float back to floating again. The good seed will swirl around to the bottom and separate. And not 100%, but enough to help you. So I'm dumping this crap out here. Not too much, because I don't want to lose the seed with it. I'm not taking it down too far. I'm gonna do it in stages, okay? I've already gotten a lot off. There's still some crap left there, and I may have lost a few seeds. By the way, if you're worried about those seeds, you see some still seeds in there? Maybe, but maybe not. That's the reason why I was so, tried to be so uh, diligent in, in uh, squishing it, so it all gets separate. The seeds that still persist in going down may look perfectly good. This is especially the case with cucumbers. Sometimes a fairly big percentage of your seed will stay floating on the top. If you're really worried about it, take that seed and dry it out. It will probably shrink to be, become hollow, or if you plant it, it probably won't grow. It turns out that that gas, that, that the, the uh, fatness in it is uh, the, the reason why it's fat is the same reason as a baby's smile it's got gas okay and uh, that uh, so it, that makes it float there's no good seed in there okay now I'm going to do this again because I didn't get a very good job with cucumbers I often do it 20 times particularly if I'm doing commercial cucumbers they have to be very very clean same thing all over again swirl it around now you see it a little bit better the seeds going to the bottom and the pulp going to the top and once again Hi everyone, Will Bonsell here from the Scatter Seed Project, and uh, we're watch to, to concern me. So next, I don't want all that extra water in there, and so I'm going to pour it into here, using more water to get it all out. Okay, and then I take this and hurt it all together and gently squish it to get the water out. See, now I've got really quite clean seed. There's none of that crappy stuff around it before. Once I've got, or sometimes if I have a washcloth or something, I'll put it under it to kind of wick that stuff away, but that's not, not critical. Then I will take, sometimes I just use a piece of newspaper or something, but what's ideal is coffee filter because it's so absorbent. I will spread this on there. I will write the name of the variety on that paper. I will put it on a sunny windowsill and leave it there for at least two, three days till it gets really, really dry. And then I can put it away and store it. So there are two big reasons for doing this fermentation process with cukes or with tomatoes. In the first place, like I just said, you get rid of that crap that's gonna be holding moisture and disease spores and so on. But when you ferment it, it not only gets rid of that, but the fermentation process also, um, impregnates the seed coat with some some kind of antibiotic materials or something which will basically uh, make it not only not only not prone to diseases but make it have some resistance to diseases and so it's a definitely a good good way to process seeds like i say with most of the other seeds it's a case of they're dry you thresh and winnow them unlike most crop species squash will continue to mature even after harvesting. We said before with other things that when they're dry, dead, mature, and all that, that's when the seed is ready. Well, in the case of a few things, particularly squash and pumpkins come to mind, is even after this is picked, it is now separated from the mother. The seed in this will continue to mature even more, to get even better, if left in here for the time being, if we don't cut it open and take the seeds out right away. And the reason why is because 
the fruit, this, this squash, like a tomato, it's actually uh, a placenta. I know that's not very appealing when you're trying to think of mashing up your steamed squash for supper, but uh, it is. And as long as these seeds are connected by that little string, that little umbilical to the placenta, they are still getting nutrients from the fruit, even though the fruit is now separate from the plant. So therefore, this curing process, aging this thing, the seed, if I cut it open right now and took the seeds out, they'd be fine. But if I were to leave this in storage for weeks or even months from now, um, then it will improve even further. So that's a handy thing to keep in mind. Uh, the only other example that I think of is if we're talking about tomatoes, um, likewise, by when the thing is picked, it will continue to mature to the point where, and this is getting back to this, this is very handy to know. If you really want to leave your fruits until they're full, your tomatoes until they're good bright red and all that before you harvest them, it's really good to do that. But what if you can't? What if you have a killing frost comes along tonight and wipes out your plants? And let's say you've got a lot of them that are like this, that are green. Big, full-sized, shiny, glossy, maybe a tinge of color, but even if not, uh, they're, they're definitely not mature and not ripe for seed at this point. But you've got to, but it's all you've got. And so I'd say go ahead and pick them. Be sure and pick them before the frost, because the, if they freeze, then they're goners. Then put it on a perhaps a warm, sunny windowsill in the house or something, and let them continue to after ripen uh, and they will, and they will eventually uh, get to be uh, ripe enough to cut them open. And the seed, which may have not been viable at the time that you picked it, will become viable again. It's feeding off from the placenta for some more time. It's critical that the seed be, that the fruits be uh, shiny green. If they're uh, not glossy but matte colored, uh, then even if they do color up, they won't color up very well. And even if they don't, the seed is just too mature, it almost certainly won't germinate. So it's a handy thing to know that. So that's about what I have to offer about this. I hope it's been useful to you. Um, I, what I really want to urge you all to, uh, whether you've saved seeds or not, get into it wherever you are on that learning curve, get on it and go from there. It's a very steep learning curve. And uh, if you're starting out and you're afraid of making mistakes, by all means, make mistakes. Make them now and learn how to deal with them. Because being able to uh, save, propagate and save your own seed um, is a major step on the uh, path to becoming more self-reliant and having a more uh, resilient uh, food source. Uh, far beyond what I've talked about here in this session, uh, some other excellent sources are. One of the best that comes to mind is the book Seed to Seed by Suzanne Ashworth, um, which is very comprehensive, and I'd urge you to get that. Um, somewhat less comprehensive, but uh, to be uh, uh, self-serving about this, is my uh, book that I've written uh, has a unit in it on uh, uh, seed savings, plant propagation, and the book is called Will Bonsall's Essential Guide to Radical Sustainable Gardening. The title wasn't my idea, but it's okay. Um, anyway, uh, so those and other sources, just uh, go from wherever you're at and learn to be more self-reliant for seeds. Um, also, my Scatter Seed Project has an online uh, website. You can find me there if you have questions and so on. Um, but uh, that's, uh, that's it, and next year, Let's all look forward to getting together here in person. And I'll be doing classes on seed saving, I think every one of the three days of the fair. And uh, we will, uh, the, the fair will go back to being the glorious event and, and uh, festival celebration of rural living that it's always been. Hope to see you then. Bye. Hi everybody. Um, we're organic. working to get Will onto the live Zoom question and answer. And here in you rural Maine, well. you know, we, we have internet difficulties and this is a live broadcast, so oh, this is well, no different. So we're going to take a few minutes and we've got a special video um, that actually showcases John Bunker and his incredible apple detective work right, well, and a little bit of our work with the Maine Heritage Orchard here on the Common Ground Education Center. Um, well, so let's on, learn a little bit more on, about apples. I am a apple historian. I track down, attempt to identify, and preserve rare apples. By the middle of the 19th century, there were hundreds of apple varieties being grown in Maine. But the commodity form of agriculture forced us into sort of the one size fits all. This apple here is the quintessential Maine apple. This is a Macintosh. Inside this Mac, there are seeds. And if you want to obtain a Macintosh tree, 
You cannot do it by the seed because every seed will yield some new apple, something that has never been before, just like you and me. All of us have two biological parents and we are similar to both of them, but we are not identical to either of them. If the Macintosh seed does not come true to type, how are we gonna get more Macintosh trees? Well, we do that by grafting. And when you graft, you take a tiny piece of the variety that you want to replicate and you splice it onto a tree with roots. That's called the rootstock. And here we have a graft that I did this past spring. That right there is the piece that I grafted on. That's called the scion, S-C-I-O-N. And this is the splice I made, the graft. And this is what it grew this year. Now here, I did another graft. And you can see there's the graft there, there's the scion. Just a little piece is all you need of the variety you want to replicate. I spliced it onto this, so we'll have two varieties on this tree eventually. What I wound up doing was creating a library of varieties. And on each tree, if I found a rare variety that I thought I needed to save, then I would graft it onto a branch. This is your cyan wood for next spring. And it'll, it will have lost its uh, leaves. They'll all drop off. A stick this long, that's the new wood. That's the graftable wood. This is enough to do maybe one, two, three. You could get four or five grafts, new trees, out of just this stick. So each one of these uh, represents another graft and another variety that I would save. And uh, you could see they all have tags. This is the Cray apple, which came from Arusta County. It's just a provisional name that I gave it. This tree has multiple varieties on it, but it's primarily on the top is Northern Spy. This apple here is Roxbury Russet and makes fabulous applesauce. This apple is yellow bellflower. This is Black Oxford. It keeps really well in the root cellar. This apple is called Redfield. I particularly love for its winter applesauce. I combine it with Roxbury Russet and the two together make a fabulous sauce. This is not a dessert apple, so it's a bit tart, but it does make a wonderful pie and a wonderful sauce. So as I was getting more deeply into the varieties that were historically grown in Maine, I decided that I had to find a way of saving them because the old trees were dying, but we didn't have the space to do an entire tree of each variety. And that was when we got the idea of doing the Maine Heritage Orchard, an educational orchard of varieties historically grown in Maine. The orchard here is a pretty important collection. It has so many varieties that were grown traditionally in Maine and are now here preserved for future generations. Almost all of the varieties planted here in this orchard would be considered to be heirlooms. And these trees were the first year's planting, which is in 2014. So some of these trees are just now coming into bearing age. All of these trees have been grafted and grown in the nursery for two years prior to planting. Well, the planting effort is actually done largely by volunteers, which is really excellent. Each spring we have a group of volunteers come to plant trees with us, and we'll do a demonstration of how to plant a tree, how deep into the soil it goes, and then people are set out with their, their little trees all wrapped up in shovels, and they'll go dig the holes and, and put the trees in there and water them in and put wood chips around them. And this is a tree that's just starting to bear for the first year and it has just a few apples on it and it was a uh, one with a tentative name its tag says Pisca Mountain which is where it came from the old original tree was there and now that it has fruit brought some to John and he said oh well, that's a northern spy so now here's another <laughs> another apple that's been identified many of them are, are pretty exciting in that way as the first fruits are in some cases, people haven't seen for decades. The primary reason for planting them was to have the trees to propagate for cyan wood so that the varieties would not be lost, <laughs> but as a, a byproduct, really, <laughs> or some people might say the main product of the trees are the apples. So we'll use many of them 
on the fairgrounds for Mafka events and classes. I'm sure some will continue to donate to food pantries and give to volunteers. Part of the goal of this collection is for people to be able to, to start using these apples again and to do different test batches and see if this one makes a good pie or a good sauce or is good for apple brownies or uh, many other uses. And to have these trees available for anyone to come and see and to be able to grow more trees from them is a great little treasure we have here at Mafka. The Maine Heritage Orchard is open to the public year-round every day, so anyone is welcome to come visit any time. People ask me if they should save their old apple tree. With a little pruning, they will produce new wood, and from that new wood, they will produce fruit. And you never know, you may have some rare historic variety that only grew in your town, and you may be the caretaker and the savior of something that should be in the Maine Heritage Orchard. Hi, Will. This is Beth again here with you, and thank you so much for your wonderful presentation. Uh, I am now going to sit with you, and we're going to have a conversation to bring in some of the questions from the listeners who are with us online. The first question is from Sigwini, and Sigwini asks, my potatoes produced fruit this year. Would I treat them the same as I would tomato seeds? Wonderful question, and good morning, Beth, and Sigourney, and all the other listeners, and welcome to say Glad you could join us this morning. Uh, regarding true potato seed, first of all, the the simple answer to that is yes, treat it just like, make sure they're as ripe as they possibly can get, and I usually cut them through the equator, squeeze out the seed, and let it ferment, uh, uh, just like we talked about with um, with tomatoes. However, you should be advised that potato seed, sexual seed, will not come true. So when you save the seed from potatoes, you're not going to get the same variety. You're basically being a plant breeder. You're creating new varieties, which is fun and exciting to do. But uh, don't think you're going to take some, some sexual seed. If you want to get that variety and maintain it, you need to do it asexually by cutting the tuber up. Perhaps you already know that, but that's a heads up for anyone thinking of saving true potato seed. Great. Uh, thank you. And I will tell all of our listeners, if you have any follow-up, to your answers from Will, please uh, send along your follow-up questions and I will try to get to those as well. Um, so our next question is coming from Tracy and Tracy wants to know, uh, or Tracy asks, how do I know if the plant I purchased as a seedling from a greenhouse is not GMO? And if it is, can I save the seed anyway? And will I get a good viable plant the next season? First of all, you don't know it. Although, if we're talking about something like tomatoes, I don't know that you're likely to get a GMO tomato. You're more likely to get a hybrid tomato, uh, in which case th those are legal to save seed from and so forth, under, unlike GMOs. But the problem there is that you would be getting something that would not come true to type. Um, as, far as, as far as the saving the seeds, it's, 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 in any case, it's the same procedure. But it's a case of whether you legally can save the seeds, and in the case of a hybrid, whether the seeds are going to be valuable to, to you. Again, you're making yourself a plant breeder, not just a seed saver, and that's a whole new level of complexity, which I wouldn't discourage anyone from doing, but just know that you're doing it. Hmm. So one follow-up to that is you made mention in there that um, the legality of it, and um, could you speak a little bit more to that and how some seeds may be legal to save and continue with it? and others may not? Yeah, thanks, that's a very good point. Um, some, some varieties of various crops are either patented, it's like a copyright, so that you cannot legally uh, grow the seed. But t technically, it's, it's a little more complicated than that. You may grow the seed for your own use and save the stuff for your own use, but you may not turn around and re-offer the seed to anyone else. You may not sell that seed, it is legally protected, just like um, copyright to a book or something. Um, that's different from um, whether it's a GMO varieties, I think, are by definition are all copyright, are all patented. So you cannot legally uh, grow those. Hybrids, um, that's one of the reasons for making a hybrid, is so the breeder, the seller of the seeds, has a captive market. 
is he doesn't have to um, he or she doesn't have to to patent the variety because again without knowing the combination that went into creating it you can't you can't recapitulate that cross you can't make you can't use that hybrid seed. Thank you. There's so much nuance, so much nuance in the life that we uh, that we are. There is. <laughs> um, Susan asks. Uh, Susan says some of my carrots and one parsnip are going to seed, even though I planted them this spring. So Susan wants to know if those seeds are going to be available for her to use, or if they're viable for her. They may be. They may well be viable, but you don't want them. If we're talking about first-year carrots that you planted this spring and they're bolting to seed, then by definition you don't want those. They're crap. They're going to the offspring are going to tend to bolt to seed. You don't want that. You want them to be strictly biennial. If they don't take, if they t if they start acting like an annual, then they're useless to you. Um, I've not usually known carrots to do that, but chards. They're quite, and, and beets don't ordinarily do it. But I've known quite a few chard varieties that a lot of them will bolt to seed or early in the in the first year. And again, you don't want them. This is a very, very thing that you want to breed against. You want to select uh, against. Can you speak a little bit more to that? Like, why would someone not want them? Is the quality of the fruit going to be different? Or is it because you're then uh, decreasing away from, like, the longevity of the gene pool as a whole? Well, no. You've, you've, what you've done, basically, by saving seed from those plants, you've selected for annualism as opposed to perennialism. And so that means so all the chart that you plant is going to bolt the seed right off for, for in your first year. You want to get a full year of picking the chard, harvesting greens from it, and the second year have it go to seed. And uh, mankind has been selecting uh, those crops for biennialism for a long time. And their wild ancestors would have had a mixture, perhaps, of, of annual and biennial. But we've gone to great lengths, to great effort to get rid of uh, bolters, uh, those plants that go to seed in the first year. And so to use, try to save seed from those is just uh, going backwards. It's just uh, counterproductive. You will, you will be breeding something which does not have the main property that you need, which is that it makes, spends a whole year making greens and doesn't go to seed the first year. Great, thank you. I know, so like, I think the take home in part is that like, uh, we want the crop for its intended purpose. We want the carrot for its carrot roots, not for its seeds, even though the seeds are unbelievably vital and important to the carrot. And the exactly. Um, we have a question from Hannah. Hannah asks, or Hannah says that she has a baby Hubbard that's been in storage for almost a year. Can I still save the seeds? Oh, absolutely. And that's a good point, which I think I mentioned in the presentation. Um, in some ways, the seed actually improves by being stored because keep in mind the squash is a placenta and the seed is, even though it's separate from the plant, being picked from the vine, as long as it's within the fruit, the placenta, it to some extent continues to mature somewhat. Now, is it possible to do that too much? Yes, it is. But the main thing you will find out when you cut it open, if the seeds have started to sprout, mm -hmm. then you've blown and you've waited too long. But if the seeds are still dormant, uh, and viable, then you, you yes, it's, you definitely can use them. In fact, it's probably better than if you take them out when the squash was first harvested. Yes. Great. Longevity, uh, longevity reigns. It's a beautiful thing to have the plant be in the fruit be its own storage vessel. Yeah. Uh, Krista asks, Krista says, will it, I left my Pishto, I don't know if I'm pronouncing this correctly, P-I-S-H-I-T-O, tomato seeds fermenting for weeks. Can I still save them? So can you over-ferment your tomato seeds? Over-ferment tomato seeds. Okay, I wasn't sure I was hearing you right at first. Well, you can, but basically, uh, as long as they haven't broken dormancy, if, they, if you leave them for too long in that gooey, smelly stuff, then they'll start to sprout at some point. Um, it can happen. I've known it happen, but most varieties will keep pretty well for quite a while. Um, so it's possible, but not not likely. And, and you'll you'll know it because they'll actually be sprouting. You'll see little little sprouts on them. Then you've waited too long. Great. Um, what about tomato seeds? It almost seems like they have little sprouts on them right when you take them from the tomato. It seems like some varieties almost inherently look like they have little sprouts. I don't think I know the answer to that. Um, I'm not sure I've seen that. If if they have uh, somehow began to uh, you know initiate some sprouting, gee, um, well again, if you would make, cur curtail the fermentation, just have it do for two or three days or something, and mm -hmm. then get clean them up and dry them out as soon as possible, 
and hope that the sprouting has not gone to the point where they'll die. Uh, I'm not used to seeing that, so I'm not sure whether it's even possible. They, they, if they're spreaded at all, they may be no good right off the top. I, I don't know that. It's a true organic process. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> unfortunately. Um, this is your talk is inspiring a lot of questions, which is really lovely. So for those of you, I mean, I realize we're going from question to question and you'll have to perhaps get Will's book to follow up uh, and come to the Common Ground Bears to get more information. Um, the next question is from Michaela. Michaela says or asks, do you have recommendations for what type of container to store seeds in? She says that she has had, or Michaela says that they have had bad luck using glass jars and getting mold. Okay, um, and thanks for the plug, by the way. Um, the um, if if the, if you had bad luck doing it in glass jars, then the seeds were not properly dried. If the seeds were properly dried, glass jars would be actually ideal. Um, in fact, the only way to make glass jars any better is if you like seal the thing with wax or something. But if they're good good like jars with uh, that inner seal on them, then that should be ideal. The only again, the only way it would not be ideal would be if the seeds are not properly dried. In which case, any way you store them is not going to do well. If if you have some doubts about your seeds being stored, then then if you put them in regular seed packets, paper packets, then yes, then they can continue to dry. But um, on the other hand, they'll that's if if they're properly dried, the best way to do it is in a jar or a tight like a plastic Ziploc envelope or you know something very airtight. Again, um, it's it's they need to breathe to until they're perfectly dry. But when they're perfectly dry, you don't want them to breathe or take moisture or anything from the air. So I think she just should have dried her seeds better if they got moldy. Make sure the inside of the jar also is very thoroughly dried out. No, no uh, condensation on the glass at all. Uh, I guess I, there are like two follow-ups. One is, do you have any hints about how to tell if your seeds are indeed thoroughly dry? Yeah, that's a very good question. And I'm not sure I don't do. With, with things like beans and peas and large seeds, uh, they would be very hard and brittle. With smaller seeds, like tomato seeds, it's not so obvious. The main thing is to err on the side of, of too much. It's, 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 you're not going to, by ambient air conditions, you're not going to get them overly dry. So put them in a very dry, airy place and leave them for too long. If it's a week or two, no problem. So l longer is better than shorter if you have any doubts at all about it. Beyond that, I'm not sure unless you have, you know, there's equipment for testing moisture in seeds, but, you know, you and I don't have it. And most people are not going to, and shouldn't need it. It's, 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 there's practical ways of doing it just by letting them sit in the air in a good situation until they get over dry. And I guess the next follow up is where should Michaela then put that container? You talked about condensation in the glass jar, so uh, I suspect there are places one way. Uh, if, 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 if Michaela got the seeds very thoroughly dried and put them in a jar properly with a tight seal, it shouldn't matter at all where she keeps them, although it should not be in sunlight or someplace where what little humidity there is might draw. Uh, in, in other words, they might still condense on the jar um, if it's in like a, a sunny place. Any place in the dark, um, cold is better. It's not essential, but if you want to keep something for a long term, then even in the freezer is ideal. Again, as long as it's moisture, air, airtight and moisture proof, then the colder they are, the better. They, you, can, you can double or triple the length of time. Uh, seeds that might only be good for two or three years in a packet in, a, in your seed drawer might be good for eight or 10 years in the freezer in a tight jar or Ziploc or something. So um, cold, dry is better than damp and cold is better than warm. Uh, if you have to err on either one, I've, I've read this hearsay that research shows that dryness is more important. If you had to store them at room temperature, but they were very dry, that would be better than if you stored them in a very cold place, but they weren't so dry. Thank you. Uh, so the next question is, um, what is the best way to attract flies to pollinate my carrots? And I will interject that I love that it's a question about pollinators because we're wearing the bee bomb t-shirts um, and part of this year's Mofka t-shirt is celebrating pollinators. And so uh, what is the best way to attract flies to pollinate carrots? Um, is the best way to attract flies to pollinate carrots is to have carrots. Um, the pollinators, by the way, for, for carrots and the umbellifera family, parsley and parsnips and stuff, the main one, the best one, is the surfeit wasps or hoverflies, they're sometimes called. And they're, they're around. You don't have to attract them. You will be attracting them by, by having carrots and parsnips and things going to seed. 
So it's, it's uh, asking the question backwards, perhaps. Uh, have something there for them to eat and uh, build it, and they will come. You know, if they, they will show up, there's a nectar source there. Um, and the the same individual. Let me just mention. By, let me just mention. By the way, Beth, that an advantage to having those things there, carrots and parsnips and stuff, even if you do not care about the seed, is that they will attract pollinators, and those pollinators uh, will be useful to your overall garden uh, ecosystem. Some of those things that are att attracted um, to your pollinators at other stages in their life, they will be eating your aphids and things like that. They will be. They will be, become a natural. Um, uh, beneficial predator. So there's plenty of reasons to have biennials or, or things going to seed, um, even if you don't care about the seed. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, uh, I guess the next question, also related to pollination, comes from John. And John wants to know if heirloom varieties of tomatoes will cross-pollinate with other heirloom varieties. That's a really good question. And the answer to most of them is no, they will not. Tomatoes tend to be highly self-pollinating, particularly in Maine in, in, in uh, cooler climates. Um, and so you could have any number of them all in the same garden and not worry about crossing. There is an important exception, and the, the exception is more commonly found among heirlooms, is there are varieties which the only way to, to identify for sure is to look at the blossom. But as a rule, the so-called potato leaf tomatoes, which have more entire foliage, they're not quite as ferny and divided up foliage as the most tomatoes are. Those type, for the most part, um, will cross-pollinate, and some that are not potato leaf types can cross-pollinate. The main way you can know, although it may be too late by the time you find out, is if when the tomato blossom is there formed, if you see the girl parts, the I never can remember whether they're stamens, pistols, all those Latin words, um, but basically I call them boy parts or girl parts. If the girl parts are sticking out beyond that cone of the, the boy parts, make kind of a, a cone-shaped structure. If they're sticking out beyond that, then they can get stray pollen from anywhere else. And mm -hmm. so you can tell it by looking at them, those little thread-like things with the pads on the end of them. If they're sticking out, then they're a problem. With most varieties, they'll be totally contained, cloistered, we call it. They'll be within that uh, cone so that they will only be impregnated, they will only be pollinated by the pollen from that same blossom. And so they're guaranteed. So with most varieties, there's no issue. But with some heirloom varieties, again, you need to know, is it a, is it a potato leaf type in particular? And luckily, you can know that while it's in the greenhouse, while you're growing your plants, you, just, you can long before it flowers, long before you plant it out, you can look at it and see, ah, this has got that kind of foliage. And therefore, I better isolate it, put it in a place where it's maybe 100 feet or so away from, um, from any other tomatoes. Short of that, don't worry about it. Put them all together and save seed from all of them. Like, would one example perhaps be like the Brandywine table tomato that is so commonly known by name as a potato variety? That yes, I think that's a very good example. I've heard that's one that, um, yeah, that, that would be an example. Okay. I'm not sure of what others, because of the, 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 potato, the tomatoes that I grow and maintain, um, for the most part, I don't know whether they're heirlooms or not. So a lot of them are. Some of them you can tell by their name or something. You know, Aunt Mary's or something is probably going to be an heirloom tomato, but uh, some varieties may have names that would indicate that they are, or vice versa. So, um, and, and heirloom doesn't necessarily tell you that much. Um, most heirlooms will also not be crossing, but I'm just saying that a disproportionate amount of the crossing varieties are among heirlooms. So the only way to know it for sure is to, well, either do a little research, find out about the variety, uh, other people's experience, or again, to watch it. Um, watch it when it's growing and especially watch it when it's flowering. So I feel like uh, we'll continue with some more questions in a moment, but knowing that we won't get to all of them, it seems like one of the take-homes might be to be bold. So even if you don't know if it's an heirloom or you don't know if it's a hybrid or if it's crossed, like sometimes it doesn't hurt just to save the seeds anyway and see what happens. That's a good point um, because it's not like the seeds from any of those things that we mentioned are not going to be useful. I mean, carrot seed will become useless if it crosses with Queen Anne's lace, with a wild carrot. But let's say if you've got two different tomatoes, and if one of them is a hybrid, or one of them, let's say, does cross with something else, you will end up with seed that will not come true to type, which may or may not be that important to you. Um, it may still be a very wonderful variety. In fact, it could be an improvement. It may be accidentally breeding a new superior variety. So, um, so yes, I would, I would, more than anything else, I would like to urge listeners to not be daunted by uncertainties, go ahead and do it. And it's not likely that your screwing up is gonna to be too serious. 
um, it's, it is important to make sure that when you're sharing seed with others, passing it along, that you're not passing along errors to make sure that you've done it right and it's true and all that kind of thing. And just incidentally, you, we have a limited time today, but I'm very free with my email address. If anyone wants to email me at any time with further questions, or as you say, they can get my book or other books, the sources, but they can always just email me at wabonsall at gmail.com. And I try, although I'm always overwhelmed by doing this foolish thing, um, I will try to get back with good answers as soon as possible. Great. Do you think, uh, well, maybe this is just advice that applies to me, but uh, another piece of advice might be that, you know, if you're not sure if you've saved your seed correctly or if it's going to be the kind of variety that you're expecting to maybe not count on it for your whole crop, have it be like the fun experimental patch at the end of the long row where you know that you're going to get the tomatoes that you want for storage for your favorite sauce, for example. That's a very good idea. That way you have room to play around, to take chances, to be bold. And on the other hand, the ones that you're, the ones you need to be certain of, you will be certain of. Yeah, mm -hmm. very good point. Um, I guess we do have just a couple more minutes left. So to get back to some more of the more specific questions related to that is uh, someone wants to know, uh, Laura asks, that if her dill plant that bolted very early and then was left out to frost still has seeds that are going to be viable for her. Uh, I want to be sure I understand that. Could you say that one more time? Yeah. And... Uh, Laura asks, I'll just read the question very specifically. She says, my dill plant bolted early in the season. Can I save those uh, seeds? And also, they were left out in the frost. Are those seeds still good to save? Okay. So um, the frost may or may not have destroyed the, the pollen. I'm not sure. Dill is quite hardy. Uh, all the umbiliferous are. So I've had dill plants that were still perfectly good after a heavy frost. And... Um, flowers that were good to dry to use for food, whether the pollen in them is viable. Um, on the other hand, by that point, um, if we're talking about uh, late in the season, uh, it probably wouldn't have time. I, I think maybe what Laura is asking is if the seed is formed mm -hmm. and maybe still a little green and it's not quite uh, fully ripened yet and it gets hit by a hard frost, will it be ruined? And there, there's not a clear black or white answer. Um, it depends how mature it is, how heavy the frost was. I have saved some seed from, from that family of things that had gotten hit before they were quite mature and had them do very well. And I've also had them not be. Uh, the, the only way to check that out would be to save those seeds anyway. Um, let them, she might uh, let them keep going though. If they've been hit by the frost and you're not sure, if they have not been hurt by that frost, they're probably not gonna be hurt that much by the next one. You might wanna just go ahead and leave them to ripen to get riper. And then when you harvest them, do a ger germination test, and then you'll know better than, than I do now um, mm. whether, they'll, whether they'll go or not. Great. Um, and I think that this is about the end of our time here together. Are there any quick take homes that you wanna give to folks before we transition? I can't think of anything, and uh, I'm uh, I, again for any of those people that didn't had a question that didn't get to answer, go ahead and ask anyway to me directly. And uh, of course, uh, it's so sad in a way that we all have to be here, here, and not be at the today. Would be the, we'd be at the fairgrounds having fun together and doing talks and stuff. Next year we'll be doing that. So uh, um, let's uh, let's all get back together next year and save those questions. If you don't get them answered in the meantime, um, we'll we'll meet again in better times. Great. Well, again, I'm so grateful to be here in this way with you and to see how expansive our community can still be even in, uh, in our new adaptive climate. Um, so thank you so much, Will, and thanks for sharing all of your reference points. And for everyone who's still with us, uh, I really appreciate being here with you in this capacity. And we're now going to transition to a sauerkraut making demonstration by Wendy. Um, and so you will join Wendy and Sarah in our next stage. Thank you. All right, that was great to hear so much knowledge and information from Will Bonzel, and I hope folks will check out his book and learn more. There's so much to, to, to explore there for your home garden and for your farm. So we're out here outside at the Unity Common Ground Education Center for the 44th Annual Common Ground Country Fair. And I'm really excited today because we're gonna have a make-along demonstration. I know many of you out there maybe have heard about fermenting or maybe you've been interested in trying it or maybe you're an expert just looking to pick up a few new skills. So this morning, we're here with Wendy Watson 
She is the Common Ground Kitchen Coordinator and Food Liaison for the Common Ground Country Fair in a, in a normal year. It looked a little bit different this year, um, but you are a former chef and have a lot of experience with this. So tell us a little bit about how you got started with this and uh, what you're going to do today. So one of the things that I love doing as well as making food um, and eating it is growing it as well. And when I started growing um, excess cabbages in my garden, the best thing to do is turn it into sauerkraut and then you've got food for the winter um, and for the coming year. So it's a great way to preserve the harvest. And so I, it's just one of those things where I've been doing it every year now. It's like my annual thing to do and I get to share that all with you today, which is super exciting. Thank you, Sarah. And thank you, Mofka, for having me here today. Um, so I'm hoping to demystify some of the um, process of lacto-fermented foods, answer questions, and demonstrate, hopefully from start to finish, uh, what sauerkraut making in the lacto-fermented style is all about. Um, so today I'm going to be making a fall kraut. Um, I'm going to make a mix. It's going to be a five pound batch, uh, which will have approximately three tablespoons of um, fine grain sea salt that I'm using. And um, I decided I would rather than just use a plain green cabbage, I'm going to mix it up and make um, both green and red. And it'll end up with a really pretty rosy pink color. And I'm going to put some apples in, local organic apples, actually wild apples, <laughs> and some red onion from my garden. And I want to give a shout out to Peace Mill Farm. They were the ones that provided the cabbage for today because my cabbage is already um, since gone and made into sauerkraut. So, and I'll talk at the end too about different flavor combos, additions, flavor variations, um, but um, super excited to get started. So, um, one of the things, so hopefully some of you did get the uh, post on Facebook, I think it was Friday night for the make-along that gave you the recipe ingredients, which is five pounds of cabbage, um, whichever color that you choose, or mixture, and then the three tablespoons of salt. Other things are um, a kitchen scale, hopefully digital. Uh, I, that's what I like to use, it's so super helpful. Um, for measuring and also um, a little tip I'll talk about is measuring your sea salt. And then I've got a bowl to put it all in and I'm going to be making it in jars today. Um, you can also make it in crocks. Um, I, have a, I have like a two gallon crock, a three gallon crock at home. They're a little bit too big to transport but I have this cute little mini um, one gallon crock. Um, that you can also get. I've got it from my local hardware store and they're fairly inexpensive but I wanted to use jars today because that's something that most people can get their hands on easily so this is really kind of geared towards the um, the first fermentation that maybe you've ever done um, so hopefully you can make it along with me and then I'll at the end also I'll talk about some of the nifty little tools that if you get excited about um, and really bitten by the fermentation bug, as I have, uh, then you too can get some of these extras. But um, I'm going to keep it pretty simple today um, so that you can make it along. And then and if you aren't able to do this right in live time, you can also get this pre-recorded. So now, as you're getting started, um, yes. just a couple reminders for folks that we are live. And so they can ask questions sure. on Facebook Live or YouTube. So as you are watching what's going on here and you want to see and learn more, you can uh, just put your question in and we'll answer that. And then uh, my first question for you is actually, so to me, five pounds of cabbage sounds like a lot and we're going to see what it turns out to be. But as if folks are making along at home, you know what how much is this going to be in the end is it going to fit in these two jars yes. okay so yeah. so, so you'll end up with basically a half gallon it's like three quarts um, for a five pound batch um, when I did a two gallon um, crock full I did a ten pound batch and that fits very handily in a two gallon but today the five um, I'll be able to pack it in I should be able to pack it into the half gallon and the quart and these are going to be used as my weights okay so again kind of a simple um, way to without having to get a whole bunch of little gadgety things right away unless you know that you love this and want to do it some more but in terms of relative size I mean this is a pretty dense cabbage um, and this I 
weighed it beforehand, but this weighs approximately, oh, it's five pounds, five ounces. And this is without any outer leaves removed, without, with the core. And I'm gonna show you um, how I'm gonna do that. So, so if I was just going to do it today with, um, for five pounds, I could probably just use this one cabbage, but I'm gonna start with half of a green cabbage because it is um, so large. And then this one, I believe, weighs about three pounds four ounces so again i'll be using some of this and some of this and so one of the first things that you'll want to do and i left this on uh, just to show you is that if you have some really bad outer leaves definitely take those off so if they're you know slug eaten or worm eaten like some of mine were because this was a very dry summer um, then you could uh, just take those off entirely and uh, but i'm going to put aside the a couple of leaves that look pretty nice um, or at least marginally so like this you know that's yeah you know it's got a little bit of stuff on it so i'm probably going to use the next layer so i'm just going to peel that outer leaf off now you're setting those aside are you going to use those later for something else yes all right um, and i'm going to just stick it right here for now but um, this will be for a little um, as some people call it, a floaty trap. Okay. And so once the sauerkraut gets packed into the jar, this goes, you'll, I'll just probably tear it or you can cut it to about the, the diameter of the inside of the jar. And then that way that keeps like any little floaty pieces that, of shredded cabbage or whatever else you've got in there for your ferment from reaching the air. Because as soon as a piece of um, plant material whatever it's a shred of cabbage or a piece of apple or whatever um, then mold has something to kind of latch onto, and we know we've got molds all over in our environment that's not a bad thing but you just want to keep everything under the brine and so this is a dry salting self brining lacto fermented process and i know that sounds like a lot of terms but it just means that lacto is um, actually not about lactose but it's about lactic acid and um, it's, a, it's a way to um, that, so it's, it's referring to the lactobacillus um, organisms, the, healthy back, the helpful bacteria um, that are doing the power work for you, which I need right now. <laughs> um, so they're doing the job of converting sugars in the, um, in the vegetables into basically lactic acid, which helps preserve your final product and also gives it that sour tangy taste that people recognize as a dill pickle or, a, or sauerkraut, so. And those are naturally occurring, right? So one of the great things about this whole process um, and what makes it so easy for folks to start trying at home is that we're not adding anything to this. This is all right. naturally occurring, you know, right in what's already in the cabbage. And right. Um, so that makes it a little easier. Yeah, it is really easy. And, and I think, you know, if you've never done this before, it can be a little bit intimidating because it's like, well, how do, how do I do this? And it just seems so kind of mysterious. But it's one of those things that it reminds me of bread baking, right? You know, it's like you're using some of the natural yeast in the environment. And then they're going to work and doing this like mighty job of, you know, of making the dough rise. And in this case, making this, um, sauerkraut nice and tangy and you're not using vinegar you're not using heat um, those are kind of more commercial um, kind of more kind of indicative of, of the industrial kind of larger kind of we want to make everything the same kind of um, process so this is definitely more kind of home homemade and very safe um, and I'll give you tips and tricks along the way too to make sure that um, you can get a good quality sauerkraut in the end so I'm gonna leave because I'm gonna be using my mandolin and not all of you may have one at home. Um, but if, um, if you do wanna get one, I recommend a wide uh, version versus like a little handheld because cabbage is quite large. And um, I found that, um, you know, you can also use a food processor, but the food processor, it, you know, it just, uh, you have to cut it to fit the feed tube and it's kind of fussy and you just got a whole lot more pieces to have to clean up. So, I'm going to take off some of the leaves to this as well, on the outside of the red cabbage. Got one more leaf I think I'm going to 
pull off here. And you're just going to, because the other thing about fermentation is that you really want to start with fresh, good quality product. Um, the only time I've ever had a, a ferment go bad, a sauerkraut ferment go bad, I was using some onions from my home garden and I was using up some of the ones that had you know, maybe a little bit of outside decomposition going on. And so I just peeled that off, got to a nice inner core of the, of the onion that looked clean. And I actually ended up with mold um, towards the end of my ferment. And I'll talk about that when we get to that point. But um, mold is not a bad thing um, on the top of your ferment. And there's different types, which I can talk about later. So help me remember. Yeah. Um, but um, a little is OK. And but if it starts to smell really bad, that's not a good sign. So I'm going to just slice this one in half now, and then we'll start slicing it away on the mandolin. So that's a good tip for folks on using the freshest, highest quality produce. I have a habit of going to the farmer's market, getting a cabbage with the intention of, great, I'm going to make some sauerkraut this week. And then the cabbage sits in the refrigerator for a week and then two weeks go by and you know we don't want to do that we want folks to get started right away it's best if you can um, either harvest it from your garden and then make it soon after or go to the farmers market and then i would say within the week you know just make sure you're keeping it nice and cold in your fridge um, in the meantime so um, one of the things that i like to do with a digital scale is that you can you can actually weigh, um, and it's nice to have a nice big bowl like this because it just gives you more room to mix. But using a digital scale, it will zero it out for you. So it can tell you like, okay, now I'm gonna, now it's at zero with the bowl um, minus out. And so I can measure um, as I grate, I can put it right in here and make sure I get to five pounds. And the other thing I want to say about weight and salt proportions is that if you're adding anything else, that is part of the five pound weight. And so that's important because just like even in canning, if you get the proportions out of balance um, with water bath canning, you have you know the acid balance. And if it's not acid enough, it can spoil eventually. And so you want to make sure that um, you aren't going over that five pounds for the amount of salt that you're using. So, and I, because I am using the, um, the slicer mandolin, I'm also um, leaving the cores on. I usually don't put those in my ferment. I would cut them out if I was using a food processor um, because it's just, they're kind of tough but they're actually a great safety guard if you're um, shredding it with um, with the slicer here that I'm going to be using. I'm going to just set those right there for now. So let's get slicing. So in preparing for today, I, um, I haven't typically used my mandolin in the past. Um, I've always used a food processor, but they're loud. And as I said, they're kind of a little bit of a pain because you have to cut the, the chunks to fit in the tube. And, and I, I time myself. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh, if I can you know, use my, uh, my slicer and it will take me the same amount of time. And it pretty much did. But you can see how I'm holding it so that I've, unfortunately, it does come with a little safety guard, but it doesn't work for big hunks or wedges of cabbage. So I'm using um, the core kind of as my handhold and just going up and down. And I'm also, this particular um, mandolin comes with different slicing um, diff, uh, blades. And so I'm using the thin one. And I'm going to just kind of stop on it and show you what it looks like. So it's looking pretty nice. Um, it's pretty thin, although I've also used it. This is a 3.5 millimeter um, thickness blade. And um, yeah, so that I've used the thicker blade, which is 7 millimeters. And that also works, but I just, it'll, the fermentation will still work, even if it's a little bit thicker, but you, the other thing about the food processor is that you can't really get the same uniform slices um, that you can with something like this. 
Um, and if you have big chunks and then little strips and pieces, then eh, you know, then it just it's going to ferment at different times. And so it's nice to have. That said, I've always used a food processor, so it, it also works. So. You had a question. So it looks like it's about maybe the size of like coleslaw, like when you would make coleslaw. Um, that's the kind of consistency that folks are going for. Yeah. That kind of small, yeah. smaller shred. Yeah. Um, and again, um, you know, I this this batch, actually all three of these, and I'll talk about at the end. They were all made with the thicker side, so. But you can certainly do it on the thin side. It goes a little bit more quickly. Um, it sounds like the key thing is uniformity. So yeah. you just don't want a lot of variation in the size. You want everything to be pretty consistent. Pretty much so, yeah. I mean, and again, if you don't have any tools, usually everyone's got a chef's knife, right? So you can just you know, be doing the slice, slice, slice with your chef's knife just as well as using a mandolin. So I'm trying to kind of keep this uh, Keep it simple so that if you don't have like special tools or gadgets, that's okay. You know, it's like you can you can do this at home with just a knife, a cutting board, um, and a scale, and the cabbage and salt. So it will still work. So right now I'm getting close to a pound. You can tell this does take a little while. Um, Still have four more pounds to go here. Now, one of the reasons people might want to do this, um, you know, there's been more information about this coming out, is the health benefits mm -hmm. of, of fermented products. So there's a lot of probiotics. You know, you mentioned the lactobacillus is one of the common. Like, if you went to the store and you bought a supplement that was a probiotic, it's likely to have that in there. It's in, you know, yogurt and other fermented things as well. Um, but that's really helpful for the microbiome and the gut bacteria and helping people digest things. Exactly. Yeah. And that's one of the benefits of doing this yourself and making um, fresh sauerkraut because if you're you're buying a shelf stable product, you don't have the benefits of all those healthy microorganisms that help feed your gut and are in your gut. And you know, we know. There's a lot of information out there that we know based on kind of like the standard American diet and the industrial food system, you know, a lot of processed foods are just, you know, they don't make for a happy gut. And, uh, and this is one way to, um, to actually increase the bioavailability of those microbes for your digestive system. It's a great digestive tonic. It makes other nutrients more bioavailable. So mm -hmm. it's it's so great to know that something so simple can be like so good for you and tasty. Yeah. And this is another good way to use up all of, you know, what's in your garden. Um, so cabbage is what we're demonstrating today, but really you can ferment almost any vegetable, right? You really can. And I'm gonna, you know, one of the things that if you take away from today, it's like, I hope you, you know, maybe start here and then start branching out and experimenting with so many other things. Like now I just, I annually in the, in the late summer, I make all of my own pickles and um, I didn't bring any of them. I'm sorry. I wish I had thought of that, but, um, but I do my own lacto fermented pickles and they're so easy. Oh my gosh. You just like, you, again, use fresh pickles, put them in a crock that you actually make a brine for. So. Mm -hmm. Um, so things that you're doing whole, um, that isn't a, a self-brining process like the sauerkraut, um, you would actually just make a brine and then pour it over and then you can add whatever other kinds of flavor ingredients. So we're exactly two and a half pounds. So I'm going to get started on the red cabbage next. So while you're doing that, I'll just remind people, you mentioned water bath canning a little earlier. And actually we do have a presentation about yeah. water bath canning later today, which will be great. Um, but just to remind people about what some of the differences are there, um, you know, this is a fermentation process and it's the, the fermentation piece of it that's going to keep the um, product, you know, safe and healthy and available to eat. When you're water bath canning, you know, for folks who are just getting started or thinking about what these differences are, um, those are products that are not fermented. And so the water bath canning is actually the preservation method. 
and you add a lot of, you, you know, if you're making pickles, like your water bath canning pickles, you're probably gonna have a vinegar brine. Like I like to make um, spicy dilly bean pickles yes. that I water bath can. And so I use a vinegar brine for that mm -hmm. versus a fermentation brine um, where that's gonna be something that's gonna just, you know, go into the jar with the vegetables, um, ferment on its own, maybe, you know, in the open, room temperature air or in the refrigerator, and then that's gonna keep, and I'm not gonna can that because that heat is gonna kill that live, you know, um, probiotic right. bacteria that's in there that's really healthy for you. Exactly, it's kind of like, uh, for people who are familiar with miso, that's another live product, and I never try to cook with that. I will add it um, at the end of cooking so that it doesn't um, basically destroy the healthy bacteria that are in that live product. And I've started um, doing lacto-fermented dilly beans too. Mm. The one drawback is that if you don't have a root cellar to store all these things in, then, then you basically need to put it in your refrigerator when the ferment is done. Um, fortunately, I do have a root cellar, so I just keep what I'm gonna be eating in my fridge and then the rest of it uh, will go into the root cellar and that usually stays, you know, right now it's like 50. It's still not that cold out down in the root cellar yet, but it's cooler than my outside and I can't make room in my refrigerator for all my, <laughs> all my fermented foods, holy cow. I was actually borrowing a neighbor's fridge for a little while until the root cellar got at least down to 50, um, so. All right, so we've got two and a half pounds of the green cabbage. Now we're adding the red. That, look, that was about a pound there. I think I'm going to just take a little break from the cabbage and I'm going to do the onion. I'm going to leave this whole, well, let's see. Wait, wait, wait. I'm going to just do some uh, half moon slices of this because I want to make sure that I add in my other ingredients uh, before I get to the five pounds of just cabbage only unless that's what you're doing that's fine too so this is you know looks like it's becoming quite a large quantity here um, and I know it's going to get kind of pounded down a little bit yes but one of the other great things about this method is that if people only have one cabbage as long as they're doing it proportionally you can make just a quart jar of this kind of exactly. sauerkraut yep. so whatever quantity you have at home or you have on hand um, as long as you keep the proportions right people can really scale that to um, whatever size they want to do. Yeah, if you want to just start with a quart, I believe what you would need is about a pound and three quarters of finished product. So that would be cabbage and whatever else you want to put in there. Um, and then uh, a tablespoon of salt. And this might be a good time to talk about salt, actually. Um, so there are many different kinds of salt out there uh, that you could use. And I'm gonna talk about what I love to use the most, which is a mineral salt. And um, I happen to use this Redmond Real Salt, and um, it's a fine grain and um, full of minerals as well as sodium and chloride. So it's kind of a more, what I would call a natural salt. And I think it also helps with, um, provide a little bit more nutrients to the microbes that are doing the work. It gives it a more well-rounded flavor. Um, and, um, and so like you can either use like a Himalayan pink salt, but this is a really blocky grain. You, you would need to use something finer than that, but that's also a perfectly good uh, mineral sea salt to use. And um, so the salt also acts as the preservative and helps what um, the whole fermentation process get going. Um, so if you were trying to do like a no salt ferment, it's not going to work and mm. you're kind of, you're going to end up with like brown mush probably. And so, um, you, the salt will actually help the, um, the mic microbes do their work. And so you want to make sure that, um, and if you're using some, something like a refined sea salt, some of those salts have, um, additives in them and you don't want that. Um, so you want to have something without iodine, hopefully fine grain. Um, kosher salt works, although it too has been stripped of any kind of minerals. And so 
the salts that um, don't have any additives but are just uh, straight up like sodium chloride, uh, they're going to taste maybe a little bit more salty um, than if you were using um, a mineral salt because the uh, sodium chloride in a mineral salt is like 97%. Um, and uh, if you were using, if you were using a, a regular kind of refined commercial salt, that's going to be more like 99% um, um, sodium chloride. So I'm going to use um, I'm going to use the grater for these and just give them a a quick grate. You could also chop them if you'd like as well. Now are the apples for flavor? Yeah, this is a, um, you can both use all sorts of different vegetables um, when you're fermenting as well as fruit. And I'm just using this mostly for flavor and a little contrast and it's just, that's why I call this the fall kraut. Um, because it's basically, you know, the apples are in season now, the cabbage of course is, and, um, and the onions are, most people have harvested their onions now and are, they're very um, common and available at the farmer's market and so forth, so. I'm not, I'm just gonna go straight to the apple and I'm not even gonna cut it up. <laughs> now, are there any combinations that you might not want to try. So I see maybe over there you've got some carrots and cabbage. Um, you know, I've heard of beets, beets and carrots, and you know, there's there's lots of different combinations that as people start exploring this more, they can test out. But is there anything that just really doesn't work in terms of combinations? Um, well, the flavor combinations are really just as, you know, what you like and what you might want to do. Um, and I, People who know me know that I, I have a hard time doing things just kind of plain and simple. <laughs> uh, so I always like to spice it up. Um, and uh, that could be with just other vegetables or fruit. Um, the other thing, um, both, sh um, both carrots and beets have a high sugar content. So I, I'm try I try to be careful with adding, like not adding too much of those. Um, and the only other ferment that ever kind of went funky on me was um, I did, I love fermented carrots. Mm. And uh, I did a grated carrot, um, ginger, turmeric um, uh, ferment. And after one week, um, I went to check it and it was slimy. Oh. Um, and I found out afterwards, because I have to say, there's no such thing as failure when you're doing fermentation because um, you can learn from that and and that's kind of how i look at it uh, but um, you can rinse it and uh, and still eat it but you know the kind of the ick factor of the yeah. slime but it's because the sugars are high in carrots um, and i i do another thing um, that i'll talk about i'll just reference briefly is something called beet kvass and that's like amazing i love that and i can't wait to make it this fall i haven't made my a batch of it for this year and but that's a beverage right it is a beverage and you make it with cut up beets you leave the skins on you scrub it um so i want to just check my weight i'm wow i only need like three more ounces oh of, perfect um or actually a few more maybe it's more like eight um so i'm just taking the the whole hunk of cabbage here and I'm doing a little bit of grating and we're gonna go back to slicing. Um, so beet kvass is kind of an Eastern European drink or beverage that also is lacto-fermented. So you make a brine and you pour it over the um, chopped up beets and you just basically let it sit for a week or two and it will ferment on its own. And then, um, and you just basically let it go until it's your liking and you can add other things to it. I've done um, grated fresh ginger. Um, and I'll talk about that with the flavor combos too, because ginger is another great addition and I, I love ginger. Yeah. <laughs> and so I put it um, in a lot of my ferments and there we go. I just think I nicked myself, but that's okay. Cause it's right towards the end. How are we doing here? All right, we got about five pounds, so perfect. 
Perfect. I'm gonna put this away. Yep, and you know, just to remind everybody, we, we want everybody to be safe while they're doing this too, and um, you know, to keep an eye on your your fingers as you're getting close <laughs> on the slicer yeah. or the grater yeah. or with a knife. I mean, all of them are <laughs> prone, can be prone to um, accidents and cuts. So just remind everybody to yeah. that. And um, obviously you wanna be, be safe when you're working in the kitchen. I know another like fermented product that a lot of people I think have been trying at home and maybe it's been even more popular this last six months as a home project has been kombucha. And it's sort of a similar idea, right? That um, I know that there's a mother. So we had a vinegar making demonstration on Friday, actually. And anybody who wants to see that can can go see that. Um, but it's a, the same idea that we're using the natural um, bacteria, whether in cider, it's a mother, in kombucha, um, I think it's called a SCOBY. Um, but you're going to take some fresh product tea and you can add ginger, fruit or other things and you're going to let that ferment and the natural bacteria that are part of that mother are going to do that work to, to create that fermented beverage and that adds a lot of the great same great kind of probiotics that folks are looking for these days to be healthy. So I'm a great kombucha fan. I've been making it um, consistently for years now and uh, I, I love it. It's, it's really and in the summertime when there's lots of um, fresh um, product around, whether it's fruit or herbs and so forth, it's just delightful. So now I've got my five pounds um, all prepped and ready to go. And I'm going to measure out the salt. And the salt we want to measure because there is a, a wide variation of um, weights of salt. And also there's a variation even in terms of a tablespoon. Mm. And, um, and so this is one of the little tips that I learned recently that I've never measured, I've never weighed my salt. I've always measured it. Um, and I was starting to wonder like, why does one ferment batch taste a little bit saltier than another? And the way to get really consistent results with your kind of that saltiness, so it's just the right amount. And this is a three, um, tablespoons, 15 milli, milli, milliliters each, um, basically are what um, what makes for like a perfect 2% um, salinity. So, yeah, and the reason that they might be different weights is based on the size of the grain of salt, right? And exactly. how much air might be between those. Right. Um, so just like in baking, I know measuring things is really important and um, you know, this, this helps with that as well. Um, so it's, it's interesting. I, I had never thought of measuring salt for fermentation. Right. Me either. And I thought, wow, that's a really great idea. And that way um, you can get more consistent results. So you're doing three tablespoons. Yep. And there, but it's 15, um, it's 15 grams, sorry, I said 15 milliliter. grams. Yeah, 15 grams. Right, and just like with the bowl, you measure, you weighed the spoons first yes. and then zeroed it out. So yep. all you're getting is the 15 grams of salt there. Exactly. And another thing to know, too, is that um, fermentation, there's three different levers that um, can be kind of played with that and also are influenced in your final ferment. One is time one is temperature and one is salinity. And so we're controlling the salinity right now by measuring the salt and getting to uh, basically 15 grams um, for each tablespoon that I'm using. And um, I'm, I'm afraid I'm still bleeding. Do you have some t a towel? Um, we can definitely okay. grab a towel for you. <laughs> Thank you. And um, a mess here. Yeah, and I don't know if the camera can actually see this, but with the salt here, it's interesting because the the tablespoon isn't full. But as you were talking about with weighing it, the 15 grams, um, you get a more specific and accurate uh, measure here for for what you're going to be adding in. Exactly. Um, and it's just such an, a great visual just to see and show that um, it really is uh, makes a difference. So I'm going to do a one-handed uh, mix because I've got a little bit of uh, of my my nick on the um, 
slicing blade. So great. And here's okay, great. Thank towel. you. Actually, you know what would be great? Um, could you get me a plastic glove? Yeah. That would be awesome. And then I can kind of go to town with both hands. And if you want to get me two, that would be super duper. All right. We will make that happen. <laughs> this is uh, live cooking at its best. Gloves. Plastic gloves. Plastic gloves. <laughs> so the thing that you want to be doing now that I'm doing is massaging your ferment. Um, this is where the salt is going to get mixed in with your cabbage and it will start kind of pulling out the water through osmosis from the cabbage and so you want to be able to usually it's best just to you know with clean hands which mine are um, before i did this um, anyways then you can um, just mix with your hands you can also sprinkle the salt on it, give it a mix, and then kind of cover it and come back in an hour. Um, and that way um, it does the work for you. But um, at this point, um, this is a great, thank you so much, Sarah, I appreciate it. Yeah, and here's another towel. Okay, need that. perfect. And so we've got some gloves here. Oh, righty. And maybe I'll put some on too here, just just in case you need an extra hand, I can right. I can help out. Thank you. We can swap off now. Um, does it take a lot of um, upper body strength? We're going to do some pounding probably too, right? Do you? Well, does it take I, you know, a lot of strength? I don't. Um, you can pound, but mostly what I do, I am pounding uh, the ferment into the jar versus just pounding it right oh, now. Oh, okay. And. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to get the glove on on wet fingers. Yeah, so. can I do some mixing with my gloved yeah, please, hands? Yeah, go while... right in. Go right in here. So I'll just step in here, and you can just start massaging it. All right. It doesn't require a lot of upper body strength. It's just uh, it's kind of a little bit like you know kneading bread dough, um, and uh, you're just basically just mixing it all together. Smells good. I can smell the onion in there. Mm -hmm. And we're trying to get the salt kind of all mixed around. That's right. Yeah. All right, I'm gonna let Sarah keep. All right. And you can instruct me. I, I've made. Uh, sauerkraut before, but I actually haven't made this quite large of a batch. Um, so this is a new experience. I've just made a small batch that I can put in a quart jar. Okay, that's fine. get my gloves on. As I'm mixing it, I'm just making sure I'm getting everything mixed in here because um, there are some little little pouches of like green cabbage that pop up every once in a while. So I'm clear that I haven't actually gotten it fully mixed in. Thanks for stepping in there, Sarah. Yeah, teamwork. That's right. It's always more fun to make food with other people. Make food together. Exactly. All That's... right, are you ready to take over here? I am, Thank All right, you. I'll step away. All right, very good. So now that you've had a chance to mix it up, Thanks to Sarah. Um, then we're gonna then we're gonna actually pack it into jars. So, and you don't need a fun little tamper like this to do it, but it's a, a one of those kind of cool little tool gadgety things for for fermenting. Um, I I brought a spoon. Everyone's got a probably has a wooden spoon at home, so you can certainly use that. Um, but we're gonna take this and put it right in the jar now. I have a wide mouth funnel. Now, did you have to sanitize your jars ahead of time? Um, I always start with clean jars. Um, I usually just use hot water and soap. Okay. Um, I don't, um, 
like in water bath canning, since you've got the kettle going, um, I will sanitize, you know, and sterilize, I should say, my jars mm -hmm. um, prior to canning in them. But I have found that if your surfaces are clean, your hands are clean, again, it's all about the mighty microbes, and the salt helps to um, make a, a good blend of things. So you've got uh, a wide end and a narrow end, and depending upon your size jar, um, I could probably use this one without the without the wide mouth. So you want to pack it in as best as possible, um, and you can use your fist um, if you are more comfortable with that. And if you're using a crock or something where you had a larger opening to, it might be. Oh, that's what the really big ones this are. Is the, <laughs> this is the tool, the wooden plunger cabbage stomper <laughs> for your big sauerkraut crock. And it's really helpful because you can lean on it yeah. and just like, you know, have the crock on the ground and just like put your weight on it. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> All, right. All right. Well, it looks like the ferment is still in good shape, so yep. we're okay. All right. <laughs> there was uh, one oh, other. Yep, there's one more down here. <laughs> All right, well, live demos at their best. We're dealing with the elements here. Right, and, we've uh, got the wind. <laughs> all righty. So I'm about to put more in here. And so it's all about packing it down because you want to basically um, get rid of as many air pockets as possible um, for the ferment to do its thing. And you're actually, you can, I don't know if you can see this, but um, I'm going to move some of this over so you can. But there's some brine now that's starting to form. So when I push on this, you can see, look at that pretty color yeah, brine. Yeah, it's beautiful purple. It's a great color. And, uh, and that's what you're looking for is that juice or brine. And um, so it's, it's already doing its work here. And I must say, too, that doing the finer grate that we used um, on the slicer there, the finer slicing, it, um, it will start to do this a little bit more quickly and easily than if it's a, a kind of a wider or thicker um, kind of um, cut. So that's another advantage. And part of packing it down is making sure we get a lot of the air bubbles out, right? You don't want yes. any air in there. That's right. And you want to have the brine come up over the, the final product in your jar. And so I'm really pleased um, seeing how good it looks. It must be from all of your great massaging <laughs> that you did, Sarah. <laughs> well, I could tell those are really healthy, nice cabbages. Um, a lot of moisture in there, yes. too, because they're fresh. And like we were talking about earlier, using that really high quality local organic produce from your local farms or from yep. your garden, um, that's really going to help with the quality as well. Exactly. And, you know, I, I would say if you had a really dry cabbage, you're not going to get this kind of um, juice. So I'm going to stop here. Um, actually, I might even just take just a pinch out. You want to make sure that you leave headspace, um, partly because um, you're going to be putting a weight, which I'm using one of these jars as a weight, and it fits. So this is like a little jelly, jelly or jam jar um, that, I, that you can find in the supermarket or hardware store, and I use that as my weight. And so um, you want to leave like an inch, about an inch, no more than two, um, to basically get that in there, and uh, so that you can have the brine and the weight. So when you put the weight on there, you don't want the brine to be up over the top. So, and now I'm gonna talk about the final um, piece, which is a piece of your cabbage, actually, from earlier. That's why I set the pieces aside that are good quality. Um, and so you can basically just tear it and um, to be about the right size to fit on the top. And what this does, um, is basically act as a trap to keep all the loose pieces down below mm -hmm. the brine. And this is like a great simple way to do that. There's also um, something called a pickle weight, which you can put in there, um, or one of these. Those are kind of like fun little things. But um, this will work, and you want to make sure that there aren't any pieces of sauerkraut up along the outside edge above that because that too can also attract 
um, mold organisms. But so you're basically just putting that in just like that. And now you can take the jar and you don't need the lid on that. And I had another, there's the lid. Oh, so it's the lid that's gonna hold down the weight, I see. Yep, exactly. So here is your finished sauerkraut. And uh, so these two are still working. Um, I have, um, I can put the rest of this away after we're done, but I'll talk about just some of the different combinations that I've done in the past and maybe give you some ideas of things you might wanna try. So this is um, what I call a, a summer kraut. And basically it's just green cabbage, um, of course sea salt and some grated carrot and some chopped garlic. And whoa, was that ever um, pungent and fragrant when I first started it. Um, because, but the garlic really mellows over time. And by the end, I, this is actually finished. I, I took it out of my crock this morning to bring it and show you all. Um, but, uh, and I tasted it too. And it was, this is three weeks and there's brine in here. Um, and, um, and it was like the perfect amount of tang and it's nice and crunchy. So that's what you're looking for. So when you get to the point of about, so when you first ferment, again, um, the first three days are kind of crucial. You don't want to disturb it. You want to put it someplace out of your way, but not where you're going to forget it. And you're going to just let it sit for the first week. Um, because that first week, the organisms are really getting busy doing their thing. They're converting, um, they're basically con converting, you know, things like into lactic acid and helping it to ferment and bringing the pH down. So I don't recommend trying to taste it um, in the first week, but just keep an eye on it, like on a daily basis, um, just to make sure. And another thing that I recommend, put your jar in a bowl or a plate or some kind of dish to catch the ferment um, happening because it'll start the the types of um, lactobacilli bacteria that are in there the first three days or so they're basically getting busy uh, just doing the ferment and doing like the the real work in the beginning and you'll see lots of bubbles and then you might see some like liquid coming out and that's okay I just but I don't want it on my counter or on my floor so I just I put it in a tub if it's a big crock or just a little bowl um, so we've actually had a ton of questions oh, good. coming let's in get to while those. we've been doing this. So let's go to a few questions. So the first one is from Hannah who asks, do you worry about live yeast from the apples and do you need to adjust the salt to account for that? So if you were using, if you weren't using the apples, would you use a different amount of salt? I haven't. I mean, I've made sauerkraut before with um, with apples, I just don't use a large proportion of them, so it's just a little bit to add some sweetness and a little um, contrast to the flavor profile, but I've never found that I've needed to adjust the salt for that. Okay. And um, Tracy and Alina actually had sort of similar questions. So um, Tracy says, the deer ate my green cabbage. Can I use only red cabbage? And Alina wants to know, is there a variety of cabbage that's better to use for sauerkraut? I don't really think that there's a better uh, variety of cabbage. I think whatever you can get is will work. Um, and I'll just show you, this is my beet red sauerkraut, and this is nothing but red cabbage and a grated beet. And, um, and so it just comes out really, really dark. And you can see it's, it's stained the wood because it's still fermenting. This is on like week two now. This was three weeks that's done. And then of course, we just finished that one today. So you can use like all red and it doesn't really matter what variety you use. Okay, yep. And then D asks, can pink Himalayan salt be substituted for the sea salt? Most definitely, but just try to get it in something in um, a fine grain, or if you have a way to, to grate it. I mean, some people have like a salt mill because you don't want to use the big chunks um, of whatever kind of salt you're using. Even kosher salt can be a little bit large crystal for the ferment. It just takes longer to distribute and is not as ideal as the fine grain. Okay. And Barbara asks, she says she's been told that like with sourdough, metal should not be used. And obviously we used a metal bowl. So 
is that okay or is it just that it can't be stored in metal and then actually on the jar lids you know i know a lot of us have the the metal tops that we use from water bath canning um, and you have these nice reusable um, lids so is it possible how does metal play into this can you use it in the jars and in the prep well i've never had a problem with any of my ferments when i use a metal bowl um, it's not like like kombucha like the scoby is not supposed to come in contact with metal and but um, with sauerkraut everyone i know and myself included in terms of my own experience it's not a problem doing it i wouldn't I mean, some people use food safe plastic to put their ferments in, which I don't particularly care for. I'd rather use glass, but um, I don't think I would put it in metal, but I don't, I don't have any um, reference of why that might not be a good thing. And using the, the metal wide mouth funnel, again, not an issue, but I think glass is the best storage vehicle to put it in. And you can use, um, since that inner jar does not have um, a lid, and if all you have, I mean, I get these too at the hardware store, um, but if all you have are the regular water bath canning lids, that's fine too. You just might notice a little bit of corrosion from the salt on the inside of the metal band when mm -hmm. you take it off. Um, so just make sure you don't... Um, yeah. And, and do you want to put the lid as tight as it goes? Do you want to leave a little space for air to escape or how do you do that? Um, I wouldn't crank on it. Um, and try to get it as hard as possible. And as long as you're leaving enough room between the ferment that's below the brine and the jar and getting the, um, the lid on, you should be okay. Because as I said, like these two have been going now for two weeks and uh, I've had no issue with um, anything else with that. So you could use a metal one. Um, I just, for storage, Again, you're going to have to look at, um, for long-term storage, if you have only metal bands and lids, it, it can, the salt can eventually you know, do some corrosion mm -hmm. on it, but it's, it's perfectly fine inside. Okay. Steven asks, he says, I blanched and froze cabbage to store it. Can I still make sauerkraut out of that? Hmm. Well, that's going to be a whole different thing. The texture is going to be different. The tissues break down when, um, when you freeze things. And so it may end up being too mushy. Um, I've never experimented using um, frozen and blanched product in a live ferment. And sorry about the pun, but my gut senses that it may not work so well. <laughs> um, so a few folks asked about spices. Um, Martha asked, do you add caraway seed, which is a Lithuanian touch? And um, Krista was asking about Central American traditions of um, putting different color layers in the jar, but you know, what kinds of different spices and things can you add that might give it different flavors from around the world? Sure. Well, this one is a golden kraut, and this one has turmeric and grated gin fresh ginger, and, um, and, so that, and also garlic and black pepper, that because black pepper helps the, the cucumber um, the, in the turmeric, and so that makes it more bioavailable. And then the beet red kraut that I made, I used caraway, dill, celery seed um, in there, also some juniper berries, which you can crush or use whole. Um, they help flavor the ferment. But by all means, I mean, you can make a you know, you can add some cilantro, or you could add parsley, so other fresh herbs can be added. Um, I've never tried layering. The only thing that would be difficult with that would be making sure that everything is mixed equally mm. with the brine. So you'd have to have like little bits, I would think, of different, yeah, that would be a, a, an experiment. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> I haven't done that before. Um, Laura on YouTube um, is just asking you to explain again why we need to be careful about high sugar vegetables like carrots and beets. Yeah, when you're doing especially a ferment with only carrots or only beets that are grated especially, um, ha they have a high sugar content, so it tends to favor a different type of yeast. Um, and uh, so, I'm sorry, a different type of bacteria and they go a little nuts. It's like they're having a big party in there with all the sugar content um, that's higher in beets and carrots. So um, that's why if you're doing a ferment with only carrots um, or a, like a grated beet, um, something or other like a ferment with just grated beets, 
Um, you'll probably want to do that for a lot shorter period of time. Um, I think I did my carrot, um, grated carrot, turmeric, and ginger um, ferment for about a week, and it was already kind of getting slimy by then. Mm. So. Um, again, those are just a little trickier because of the high sugar content and the different type of um, bacterial strains that really enjoy that. Great. Um, and we might have a lot of first time people who are making it today. And we had somebody on YouTube who said, I've made a kraut a couple weeks ago, but I've abandoned it. It's my first kraut, so I'm intimidated. Um, and they ask, how can I look it straight in the eye and do what I need to do? Um, so does that mean, you know, can they revive it? Should they compost it? How is somebody going to know when it's actually ready? Really good question. I'm glad that that's one of the last questions that we may have time for. Um, because this is where I think people get really nervous. Like, is it done? Is it bad? You know, how do I tell the difference? And when it's done, it should, it should smell kind of somewhat mellow, a little bit you know, a little bit of pungent smell, but it's gonna have settled down from the beginning. And visually, you wanna look at it visually, you wanna smell it. Um, and there's something called calm yeast, and that's K-A-H-M, um, which is like a white film of yeast that may form on the surface. And that's not a bad thing, but um, you can skim it off. The only time that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, that the only time I've ever had a ferment that I felt like went south, it actually had colored mold and mm. it smelled bad. And even if I wanted to skim off the little bit of colored mold, which I could have done, I couldn't get past the smell factor. And I thought, okay, the combination of, of both of those, like, if, and I have a pretty sensitive nose, you know, my husband knows that. So uh, if, if I can't like, want to like enjoy it because it smells too pungent or like bad and it's got mold growing on it but if if she's got a ferment that's only several weeks old it's probably still fine um again it's like the and she can also take it out and, and maybe just take a little taste and mm -hmm. see how it tastes so yeah yeah well we've learned so much today we're we're, we're so excited i'm going to come over to this side as we get ready to go to our next segment here um, but thank you so much, Wendy, for sharing all of your knowledge. Um, this You're was welcome. this was so fun to get yeah. to do this together out here. And what a beautiful jar of sauerkraut that we made. And I um, I hope that it tastes as good as it looks, and and that maybe we'll get to taste test it in a, bring a some week back. or so. Yeah. yeah, we'll try it out here at the office. Um, well, thanks so much. And next, we're going to go to Beth, who's going to share a little bit more about the Common Ground Country Fair Country Store. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks. Hello, everyone. It's great to see you all again. Uh, as some of you know, a small portion of you know, I sell vegetables for a living and I believe in things that are really like touched with the earth and the ground. And similarly, I come to Mofka to the Common Ground Fair to kind of build the earthy grounded rootedness of part of the community vibrancy that's in me. And one way I hold that and one way I recognize that in the community is when I see Common Ground Fair t-shirts all over Maine and in other places in the country uh, and sometimes the world. So if you go to store.mofka.org, uh, you'll be able to see all of our great t-shirts and bags and other ways in which you can still be connected to the Common Ground Fair in this community throughout the year. And, you know, things are things, but these are very mine meaningful things. Um, they've been printed in Maine, they're on organic cotton, they feel great. And it's just a wonderful visual reminder when you see your friends and neighbors and strangers to know that you share some of the same values. And additionally, with my Mofka board hat on, uh, the fair is a way that we charge our batteries in so many ways, but it's also a way that we do help our budget. Uh, the Common Ground Fair t-shirts are a meaningful part of our income over the course of the year. And because we're not here in person, we still printed all of these t-shirts and still want you to take them home and you can support our organization and our community by continuing to buy them online. So please, if you normally come to the fair and take home a t-shirt or renew your membership, uh, do so just like any normal fair weekend day. Visit those places online and we'll see you more soon. Uh, we're now transitioning to Sarah, who's going to introduce us to Winona LeDuc. Um, and we will talk together again in a few minutes. Did Beth? 
All right, well, coming up next is Winona LaDuke. I'm so excited to um, get to talk with her. I actually worked with Winona at the White Earth Land Recovery Project for a number of years, so maybe we'll get to get into a little bit of that. Um, she's an indigenous Anishinaabe activist from Northwest Minnesota, and we've got a great presentation, so we hope you'll stay tuned. Thank you so much for inviting me today to talk about food and justice and seeds in this time that we are in. In this moment in time, you know, maybe our ancestors will look to this time as the time of the seventh fire, a time when we have a choice between two paths, one well-worn and scorched. Or maybe they would refer to this in the future as the time of the bat, because in Anishinaabe history and teachings, we've been told that a lot of times a small creature can change the world. And at this moment, so that the COVID pandemic came from a bat. In the larger picture, the United Nations talks about the loss of biodiversity as a cause of things like this pandemic, because the more that you encroach on the wild, the more dangerous things will come to your territory and to your people. That's a teaching of Anishinaabe people. That's a teaching of all of us. Don't mess with Mother Nature. So this is a talk about the times that we're in and the times that we opportunity we have in this time. I like what Erin Dottie Roy, the, the, the Indian writer, talks about. And she talks about the idea of a pandemic as a portal. In that, she says, historically, pandemics have forced humans to break with the past and imagine the world anew. This one is no different. It's a portal, a gateway between one world and the next. We can choose to walk through it, dragging the carcasses of our prejudice, and our hatred, our avarice, our data banks, and our dead ideas, our dead rivers, and smoky skies behind us. Or we can walk through it lightly, with little luggage, ready to imagine another world, and ready to fight with us. We intend to walk into that next world with our communities. So I want to talk about where we are in this time. First slide I got is a slide of, of uh, Gete Okosaman. That's like a, a really old squash. I call it the uh, Gete Okosaman, which, which means really cool old squash. And inside that squash is about uh, 1,600 seeds. 1,600 seeds. And to me, a seed, and to me, planting is a lot about promise. And the squash is a lot about promise. And indigenous seeds and indigenous foods are central to our survival in our future generations. And I'm gonna tell you why. America was once very great. And in that great, there was tremendous biodiversity from the 50 million buffalo to the agrobiodiversity of 8,000 varieties of corn. That's when America was great. The loss of biodiversity is associated with colonization and is associated with globalization. But remember in the great times that we were self-sufficient people and we could feed ourselves. They say you can't see your sovereign if you can't feed yourself, and I think that's a little of the challenge that we face now. But in this moment, what we find is, is that indigenous people's seeds and biodiversity still remain central to the potential to protect our world and protect future generations. That is through adaptation. You know, on a worldwide scale, they're spending about major corporations like Monsanto and Syngenta are talking about climate change adaptation varieties that they're developing. They're introducing those, sucking up pretty much billions of dollars to create climate smart varieties. $136 million is the average cost for climate smart species, seeds per species. In the meantime, indigenous nations worldwide are adapting our pre-petroleum varieties to the times ahead. Combined on a worldwide level, indigenous farmers are producing today 70% of the world's food. That's our future and that's food security. And remember also that indigenous people are the people that, although we are about 4% of the world's population, we live over and amongst about 75% of the world's biodiversity. That's where the wild things are. That's where we live. And so what you want in the time of COVID and the time of crisis is to figure out how we're gonna survive. This is really a, a small snapshot of what the future and climate change challenged world will be. And it is our opportunity to be smarter, not to try to go back to normal, but to be smarter. So how are we going to do that? We're going to learn what relocalization is about. Oma King, how to be here on our land, here to the land which the people belong. 
And why do I say that? Because in the big picture, you know, it turns out that size matters. And what I mean by that in this particular case is that big agricultural systems fail us in a time of COVID. That's to say that the average American meal travels 1,400 miles from farmer to table. That's not working. And we're just gonna, we've just taken a pretty big hit because of that. So during the beginning of the COVID pandemic by mid-March, farmers were dumping thousands of gallons of fresh milk into lagoons and manure pits. Idaho farmers dug ditches to bury millions of pounds of potatoes. 3.7 million gallons of milk daily and a single chicken processor was smashed 750,000 unhatched eggs every week. Big is not good, can't change fast. But what we have in our own communities is these traditional seeds. And we have this history that we are making of rematriation, the return of our seeds and the return of our traditional foods to our communities. And within that, and the transition to small scale renewable energy, it's really the security for our future. So let me talk about the potato. You know, today we are in this, we find that in Northern Minnesota, we are battling the single largest independent potato grower in the, in the country, that's RDO Offit. They grow one or two varieties of potatoes, but you know, climate change scientists are looking at how to adapt potatoes now and where they go to is of course, indigenous peoples. The potato park in Cusco, Peru is an epicenter potato diversity today. The Peruvian museums host over 5,000 varieties of potatoes, and the park itself has about 1,300 varieties growing in the sacred valley of the Inca. Potatoes which saved Europe from famine, because you know everything is underground and not above, have uh, saved Europe from famine 300 years ago, but then were also the source of the, of the Irish potato famine, are today being looked at to save our future generations. By sowing potatoes at different altitudes and different combinations, these potatoes are create new genetic expressions that will be very important to respond to the challenges of climate change. Indigenous potatoes from those uh, ancestors coming into the future. That is what we must do. We must rebuild our food systems. You can't travel 1,400 miles from farmer to table. And when we rebuild them, we, we rebuild them with a lot of our traditional varieties. Now everybody knows, or a lot of people know I'm a corn grower. I've been growing corn for about 30 years. That's because my father told me that he didn't want to hear my philosophy if I couldn't grow corn. So I've been growing corn and I, I grow pretty much this year, I'm growing a Mandan variety. I'm growing an Oneida white flint corn and I'm growing a Seneca pink lady, but I also grow a Bear Island flint. And what I noticed when I first grew my corn is that it was like really short. And I thought, oh, I have failed. But it turns out that a lot of these varieties don't need to grow tall. All they need to do is put on an ear. And if they could put on an ear, then they put on the food that you need. So a lot of our old school varieties from my region, the north, you know, Ojibwe people pushed corn nor furthest north in the world, about 100 miles north of Winnipeg is where we pushed it. Those varieties are not tall, they're short. And they're fr frost resistant and they're drought resistant. And when the big winds came through, they blew down Monsanto's varieties, but are stood. So plant for climate change and plant local. And then grow your food for your own community. You know, uh, we have to do some decolonizing to remember how it is that we grow and how it is that we eat. You know, like our hominy, our hominy food, when you know how to grow that and you know how to process that, that can really rock the B vitamins and improve your nutrition. You know, and what's happened to our communities like this whole country is that we took the Pillsbury Doughboy too seriously and we all started looking like him, a time to move on, you know, in this time. And then, you know, we need to adapt our technology because I was out on Pine Ridge Reservation last year and they were trying to grow their varieties of tomatoes and big hailstorms knocked it out, you know, a couple years in succession. So here in the White Earth Reservation and in our territory, first we grew some of our varieties in uh, wigwams and then, uh, there were high tunnels like, and then now we're building underground greenhouses because I want to be able to feed my children in the future generations. And, and uh, you know, it's good to keep it a little warmer and a little safer. And then, uh, you know, what we're looking at is post-petroleum agriculture because uh, pretty much we're slathering petroleum on everything in our food system for the 1400 miles from farmer to table to all the fossil fuels, additions, and all those things called side they put on food. You know, my feeling is, is that the word side, the suffix side, 
That has a lot to do with like homicide and suicide and genocide and fans with side, you shouldn't put it on your food. So we have this opportunity, crisis is opportunity to rebuild local food systems because the big food systems aren't going to work. And we do that, let's go organic. Let's get, go climate resilient varieties and let's grow with our hands and our love and our horses. And then I want to talk about uh, hemp. You know, um, I call that the new green revolution. And for the past five years, I've been growing hemp in the state of Minnesota, but I'm interested in fiber hemp. And I'm interested in fiber hemp because it is the new green revolution. The fact is, is that, you know, they say 70 years ago, we had a choice between a carbohydrate economy and a hydrocarbon economy. Carbohydrate or hydrocarbon, and we made the wrong choice. The carbohydrate economy was hemp. Anything that you can do with fossil fuels, you can do with hemp, plus more. And just think the fact that, you know, the word canvas comes from cannabis. And so it turns out that a lot of our tribes have both feral varieties of hemp left over from the, you know, eradication program. Somehow they didn't get to us. So there is some hemp in our territories, some cannabis sativa in our territories that still grows. But there is an initiative underway now for tribes with large land areas to begin looking at hemp as a part of transforming the materials economy. Because if you could take all the things you make of plastic and make them out of hemp, that'd be revolutionary. And that's what I want to see. So up in northern Minnesota, we're growing hemp. And this year I was really pleased. I sent hemp seeds out to a bunch of farmers and native farmers all around the region. And I just want to share a picture of uh, Madonna Thunderhawk and her daughter, uh, Marcella Gilbert. And they're in, of course, the movie Warrior Woman. And then I sent them their hemp seeds and they looked really happy. So, you know, it is good to be part of the revolution. This is what our fiber hemp crop looks like. Just showing you some pictures of it. And just to say again that, you know, if you want to transform the world, this is our opportunity. Uh, systems are crashing. Idols are falling. Fossil fuels are failing. Now would be the time to walk through that portal and to make that new, that new economy. And so uh, from my little neck of the woods up on the White Earth Reservation to all of you elsewhere, Let's get local, let's get renewable energy, let's get local foods, let's grow some hemp, and let's use our indigenous knowledge of transition. Remember, we're a people that are post-apocalyptic. We have lived through our own apocalypse, and as the world around is shaking, remember, we can be coherent because we know. We know how to get through this. Stick with our traditions and, and uh, pray hard. Miigwech, thank you for your time, and... Uh, Make sure you get yourself a green thumb. Now's the time, Miigwech. All right, well, welcome back. And we are here live with Winona LaDuke, who you just saw on video a little bit. And um, Beth Schiller and I are gonna be asking her questions and we're also gonna be fielding your live questions. So if you have questions for Winona, you can go to Facebook Live and YouTube Live and put those in and we'll make sure we can get those in. But Anin, Buju, Winona, it's so nice to see you in person live here uh, on this beautiful day and thank you for joining us. And it'd be great just to hear a little bit more about your work and, and what's been going on. So Anin, yeah, it's so nice to see you. Anin, Indoi, Magadu, to hello my relatives, my fellow farmers of the East and beyond. And of course, to Sarah and Justin and Flora, three of the long-term farm workers up on the reservation. Thank you for uh, inviting me back and nice to see you all virtually. Um, yeah, thanks for letting me show the video. I thought I might try to show a couple more slides of what we're doing particularly, you know, as we're in the middle of our, starting our hemp harvest. And I wanna talk a little bit more about hemp and then a little bit about, you know, some of the changes in the food system we're gonna need. So let me see if I can put up a couple of slides. Let us hold our breath here. Oh. Maybe, is that working? 
Yeah, we can see that. There you go. This is the new green revolution, as we are saying. And um, wait, I'm gonna go back one. So look, this is what I'm thinking. You know, in the in the moment that we're in, as systems are crashing, let's just make the next economy. You heard me say that over and over. And a part of that is this work on hemp. So I've been growing hemp for five years. This is my first, this is a picture when a, this is a tribal field and the neighbors complained about the weeds out there. And I was like, what weeds? And I went out there and it was this like nine foot tall hemp plants. I was like, holy buckets. So this is called my 60s flashback photo, which is what the hemp field looks like pretty much on white earth. And when you're trying to figure out what to do with, with 20 acres of hemp, which we have this year, you're working pretty hard at it, right? So I talked a little bit about it, but um. You know, it's, it's really, you know, this discussion of having a choice between a carbohydrate economy and a hydrocarbon economy. You know, that's what we had a hundred years ago and, and we pretty much made the wrong choice and we all know that <laughs> in light of the catastrophic catastrophes of biblical proportions which surround us from fossil fuels. So I really think that hemp cannabis is, the, is an antidote to the fossil fuel economy. And so I'm interested in kind of the, and I refer to it as the new green revolution, because if you could replace all the stuff that's fossil fuels with cannabis, that'd be so great. Plus our food systems, plus our materials economy, all of those things, you know? So I've been looking at it. And as I, as I kind of, as I kind of think about it, like just think about the clothes I'm wearing. So today I'm wearing cotton, but you know, cotton is uh, only part of what we're wearing. And most of us are wearing fossil fuels these days. You know, and they're saying that, you know, with H&M was like one of the most egregious jumps in, you know, I'm start, talking about that store H&M, like all those fast clothing stores, this egregious jump in fast clothing. And so 98 million tons of um, oil went into basically that fast clothing in 2015. And they're predicting that it's going to be 300 million uh, tons by 2050. So we need to stop that. You know, we don't need to turn into just more fossil fuels on our clothes. And I know that the oil industry and it's like last plug to try to hang on to its like fossil fuel empires trying to just move into plastics, like the solution to everything. So, you know, part of this opportunity we have now is this opportunity as farmers to grow the next economy. And that's what I want to see us do. And y'all are super cool out there in, in Maine. I've always wanted to go to this conference. So I'm super excited to be here. But, you know, also because we're all thinking like the same way. And so not all of us have got an extra 20 acres for hemp. Maybe you do. And of course, everybody who is listening here knows that there's no infrastructure for building a hemp economy in this country. And that's, you know, I've been working on this for the past five years, trying to figure out, like they say, you know, where's the, the what, who killed the electric car? Like the question is who killed the hemp industry? We know that, but where's the body? You know, we can't even find any body parts out there. There's no infrastructure, there's no milling. And so, you know, we're working, a, a lot of us are working to try to build the next value added infrastructure for hemp processing in this country. And it could be all kinds of scales. And I showed, I think a couple of pictures previously of our, of our more local scale of a lot of hand. You know, this is our team here. And I think I might've shown this picture before of, of our, um, this is what our hemp crop looked like a couple of years ago. And of course we had a hand decorticate it with this Chinese decorticator and, you know, uh, and then, um, you know, we, we, we've got the beginning of some of our crop, but the, um, you know, the larger scale, and, and what, the reason I'm saying that is, is that, you know, so say 150 years ago, every farm was required to grow hemp and required to grow linen because you could meet all of your rope making needs out of hemp. You know, and so I'm just kind of saying, like, even if you had as a part of a crop rotation, some hemp or some sums of us in our regions making hemp rope, you know, for all that stuff we got to do in farming, that's like still a good thing within the economy. And I'm just trying to point that out because we want to move up plastics and all of those. And as we look at the industry, I mean, the fact is, is that it's growing rapidly and there's not a domestic value added part in it. And that's what we really want to see. Our work up at White Earth is really in uh, building a set of uh, indigenous hemp farmers, supporting farmers who want to integrate into that. And uh, so I've been really proud of that. And then the other photo I want to show is um, a little of our value added work. And I just wanted to talk about that a little bit. Sarah and um, Sarah worked with us in the first time when uh, in 2003, when the uh, slow food movement 
uh, decided to acknowledge or, or acknowledged and, and awarded us the, uh, the award for biodiversity um, and defense of our, of our wild rice from uh, genetic engineering and patenting. That was the battle that we had at that time. And um, you know, we've won that battle so far. And this year was a really interesting year out there parching. This is a couple of pictures of Frank Bebo, who's our attorney. He, um, you know, in, in our battles against the pipeline company, but Frank is parching on the, on the I guess it'd be on your left or I don't know, in, in a uh, akik, uh, kata kick, which is that um, cast iron. That's one way of processing kind of old school. And then this is a larger processing facility um, for parched rice, which is like, you know, you get it up the lake in a couple hours and it's done, um, you know, parching on this and then you got to thrash it or dance on it and then fan, fan it with a uh, fanning mill or a new scotch and noggin. The reason I'm talking about this is the question of as we rebuild the food system, everybody who's listening here knows that we got to rebuild the infrastructure for that food system. And that's the challenge that we face now as the, as the world food systems and the globalized food systems and the big food systems collapse. We're sitting here on white earth trying to figure out how we're going to process our hemp. And we're working on that one. And then we're looking at our rice. I think we got that one. But, you know, things like uh, flour mills, we don't have that. Portable butchers, we got a couple of those, but we need more of those. You know, these questions of how we re rebuild a vertically integrated, self-sustaining food system, which I know you're all grappling with out there, but I'm super interested in what you're learning for our own region because we have the same kinds of challenges. So for instance, me, I decide I wanna make hemp pasta. I don't know if anybody wants to, knows any good pasta makers that wanna join with me, but I get it all figured out. But in the process of figuring it out, I realize that nobody is milling hemp in this country. And so if you have all these people growing hemp, where are they gonna get it milled? And it needs certain milling, you know, and any place you wanna go to a miller in, in my region, you can't go because they're already uh, filled up. You know, the grain mills are already filled up. So rebuilding like the infrastructure for food is what I really noticed that in this time is this opportunity to, is let's rebuild the whole infrastructure from, you know, the beginning on, you know, from, the, from, the, from that to the table. And then this is the other thing I want to talk about is, you know, I talked a little bit about wild rice um, briefly, and I think I talked about it in the video of restoring local uh, foods. And a lot of those foods are just in your natural world. And up in Maine, you're like us, you know, you got like maple syrup, you know, you got good things that come from trees and good things that come from your forest. Like I always look at the, the whole area, you know, my whole territory is my garden. It's not just the garden that I got you know, that's all, it's all locked up, you know, in, in some fences, it's the other garden. But my, my point is, is that this here is a picture of the signing of the Buffalo Treaty in 2017. And, you know, it, as we look at how we restore food systems, look also to how we restore Buffalo. And this uh, here, you know, I'm super proud of this uh, work. You know, this is what treaty should be about, restoring Buffalo. Treaty should be about, you know, collective and international and interagency collaborations to, to support life and to protect life. And so this is the 2017 signing of the Buffalo Treaty. I think that 29 indigenous nations, governments as well um, from, the, from, you know, different agencies have signed on to this treaty. And so I just wanted to kind of like think bigger because I think, you know, as you probably gathered from my my lecture, you know, I'm, I, I want to see things re restored that are, are uh, you know, the way they're supposed to be. And, you know, by and large, I don't think that cattle in the Northern Plains is a good idea. I think that uh, the infrastructure of industrial agriculture that's required to support a cattle economy in our region is way out of line with reality. And that, that, that you know, the solution is this work of restoring large herds of buffalo and 41 tribes are involved in the uh, intertribal bison Cooperative. So, you know, that's just a couple of thoughts I had, you know, about kind of the bigger picture, you know, and again, you know, always thinking that, you know, to me, seeds are about hope and promise. And that's why I like hanging out with farmers because, you know, we believe, we plant them seeds, we pray, and beautiful things happen. And I had the most substantial harvest I ever had this year. We really doubled down and doubled and tripled, quadrupled our production. I am just like probably the rest of you, like way more zucchinis. That was just the start. 71 Lakota squash. Good thing the sous chef is buying our squash, you know. Um, so much corn 
you know, varieties we put in, we put it, we, we, we got, you know, some good acreage of corn and then, um, you know, just happy to be part of the local food economy and uh, happy to be part of restoring all of that, you know, and here's our, um, just to share, this is um, the website for our agriculture work um, here in Anishinaabe Agriculture, where we're working on um, things like uh, uh, hemp curriculum and uh, tribal policies on food and agriculture and hemp. So that was kind of my, um, you know, a couple of pictures I wanted to just share to embellish, um, you know, what we're talking about. And I'm just happy to be here with all the cool farmers um, out there. Um, I don't know if y'all had some questions, but happy to answer them. Yeah, well, thank you for that, Winona. And actually, just to dive in a little bit further here, um, and just to share with an anecdote to start out with a comment that came in from Sigwani Dana, who is one of our uh, Wabanaki community members here in Maine, just wanted to say she's listening in and uh, she's doing that while she's harvesting Vermont cranberry beans, which is a variety that um, her ancestors have been growing here for thousands of years. So um, using that as a segue to talk about indigenous foods and indigenous food sovereignty, I know when you know, we worked together, which it's hard to believe it was, you know, 15 plus years ago now. Um, and some things have changed and some things haven't, but we were working uh, with tribes around the country. And I know you've, you've been doing this work for a long time around protecting indigenous knowledge and indigenous seeds and varieties um, and really fighting against biocolonialism from multinational corporations. And I, I wonder if you can just talk a little bit about how that work has evolved and, and what's going on now with that. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think that there was a bunch of us, you know, 15 years ago that were really, you know, working on this and inspired by our colleagues internationally like Vandana Shiva to stand up for our seas and keep things from coming in and taking our crops and patenting them. And, you know, so this movement emerged and, um, you know, sisters like Rowan White and Elizabeth Hoover and Tanafa, you know, there's so many great indigenous farming projects out there now that it, it you know, it's, it's, it's just exponential, you know, the amount of growth and the resurgence in all of their communities. And I'm just always proud to see, you know, I mean, in my lifetime, I never saw so much uh, growing in our communities. And I think everybody saw that this year. I mean, you know, the pandemic forced people to change how they lived and people farmed, and people gardened at a scale never before in my history, in my life. And even on White Earth, there was gardens. We put up gardens everywhere, grow boxes everywhere. And then I also saw, you know, a lot of people saving their seeds and these on every tribe in my area has got a seed and a farming restoration program. So it's really, really inspirational. And the, the other thing I noticed is that um, this year, you know, in terms of food sovereignty, you know, we, we as, as you remember, Sarah, we buy wild rice, you know, green at Lakeside and then Frank Bebo or Ronnie processes it, right? At our little mill and our cool wood fired thing. And we're all like, we, we have a good time doing that. Well, we had a hard time getting rice this year. It was a really interesting intersection and a couple things happened. One is, is that people kept their rice food security. People are like, well, I'm, I don't know when that COVID thing's going to end, but I'm going to hang out up here in the woods with my rice and maple syrup and deer meat. That's what I'm going to do. That's kind of my assessment of the North Country right now. It's like everybody's got a lot of food security they're working on and a lot of it, you know, is these harvested foods as well. And then the other thing I noticed is that it was interesting and a lot of you might deal with this, but my tribe had an agreement with USDA for the Commodity Foods Program to, I think, supply 25,000 pounds. I don't know that they're going to get that this year, which is a good idea on some level because you kind of redistributed your food at a, at a not, you know, not big profit to the tribe, but you redistributed your food then across the country to Indian communities that are in the commodities food program. And so, you know, low income people got wild rice, which is great idea. But, you know, it also is an interesting thing because it kind of puts a pressure on a local food economy to be exporting 25,000 pounds like that you know, at this, at this price. And so, you know, I just saw a lot of transitions, but I've seen a lot of people, you know, more locally than ever, uh, rebuilding their food systems and keeping their seeds and really, particularly Rowan White and the Indigenous Seed Savers, just, you know, so grateful to them. And, and, and you know, as a person, I mean, you, you hung out with me for, for quite a while, Sarah, like, you know, I'm always excited when the next generation of leadership is up. 
And then you can just kind of like hang in there and farm and occasionally show up and say, that's a good idea. Yeah, y'all are awesome. Yeah, so just another question on that and then we'll go to Beth for a question from YouTube after that. Um, you know, you're talking about um, feeding, feeding your, your community there versus exporting food. And one of the projects that I know that you um, were very intentional about for a long time was making sure that indigenous foods are going to the local community, um, to the people that need them to help with uh, health outcomes, to help combat diabetes and other things. And um, you had the Mino Mijum program for a long time delivering those amazing, you know, wild rice, buffalo, hominy. Can you just talk a little bit about how important it is to have those indigenous foods and varieties, you know, going to the communities that they're from? Yeah, I mean, so we grow at Winona's Hemp and Heritage Farm, uh, we grow uh, corn, beans, squash, potatoes, Jerusalem artichokes, and uh, tobacco, and now hemp, you know, and then we grow like all kind of cool tomatoes and everything like that, right? And so um, we quadrupled our production um, this year, largely to feed community needs. Uh, the White Earth Land Recovery Project, where you and I both formerly worked, has food boxes and are, they're kind of resuscitating the Minomichum program. And now, uh, thankfully, I'm just a producer, you know, and I don't have to worry about if there's gas in the truck to go and, and who's helping Margaret <laughs> move stuff out. They got that. You know, but um, I have seen that come back and, and a lot of the intention of our traditional foods is to be able to not only offer them uh, for our community to eat, but also to offer them for ceremonial purposes. Because a lot of our people don't, um, you know, the bandwidth and the land to grow co traditional corn varieties is a little more elusive than people think. You know, it's, it, they're not hard to grow, but you, you know, you can't grow like a little corn in your backyard. It's like corn needs territory, needs some land. And so, um, you know, I'm really, really proud to see our, our food go into a lot of our ceremonies. I say, you know, like I said, I, I sold some to the sous chef, you know, um, because um, they're cool. And I knew that our food would be highly respected if we were offering it to them, but then uh, kept the most, you know, most of the rest of it for um, traditional, um, you know, feasts and stuff. So yeah, you know, still doing that and trying to, and, and planning on growing that out as well. Thank you for sharing all of that. I think uh, just like in your homeland here, people are, exploring their green thumbs and our gardening at a far greater scale than they ever have before. I think that's definitely one of the gifts of the pandemic is people's interest in seeds and expansiveness. And one of the gifts of MOFCA is trying to provide as many resources as possible. But uh, I think similar to, or I guess holding your statement about corn needing territory, I think home gardeners are still figuring out like what works best for them and what to do with it. And in that vein, we have a question from YouTube. Uh, Quinn Edwards at um, that they, well, they say, how can someone get started with growing a small patch of hemp in a backyard and what can you use it for around a homestead? So does a small patch of hemp make sense and, and how should someone at a homestead level best plug into your chart in making best use? Yeah, I think it's definitely, I mean, you can get, you want fiber seeds. I don't know that we'll have seeds available, but um, through Winona's Hemp, but you, could, you need fiber seeds. And there's a couple places that, you know, I think sell them. If you look online, go get yourself, like, I, I think I got some of their like Chinese fiber seeds and it looked like a little freeze package, like about a pound, like it was a pound, you know, and I bought them just to see, and I ended up not planting them this year because I had these other fancy varieties from Europe and I didn't want to mess everything up. But, you know, if I took that, I would have just put it in my backyard and, and in that backyard, I would have, I would have uh, just planted like a one little section of hemp, you know, on some highly fertilized soil, soil because the difference is significant. Like, you know, I put, I put some out from last year and I use, you know, mostly horse manure because I got a lot of that, um, you know, to put in, put in, but um, where there was a lot of manure or where we put in some more, um, you know, some more um, fertilizer, I have eight, nine foot hemp, you know, mm -hmm. so it does, it really is for, it's nitrogen intensive, you know, mm -hmm. but then, you know, grow that bit and then take it and, uh, 
you know, when it's, when it's due, you know, you can take the seeds off of them to save them from last year. Take, clip the heads off. This is my recommendation to you. Or take the heads, you know, save your seeds. Save your seeds. And they say, you know, for fabric, don't let it go to seed. But since you're making rope, which is what I would suggest you do, then you take it and you cut off the head and then you, you take it and you, and you rent it. You like, you let it sit in the field, cut it, let it, let it sit for a little bit to kind of like chill out. Although you don't need to totally do that, but it's called redding, which is kind of like rotting or something, but it's like the microbes kind of separated out a little bit. And then after that, um, and then after that you take it and you can just kind of like hand strip it. And that's what, that's what we've been doing is hand stripping it. That's what you use for rope. And twining is the method, but there's also like a lot of antique rope makers that you can find like at a, you could probably find it, you know, anywhere now. And which adds to this whole discussion because, you know, all the equipment that we bought, which is kind of like intermediate scale field equipment came from China. And my point is, is that, you know, when we need to reindustrialize this economy appropriately. So you make stuff that you need here, you know, and uh, this is a good opportunity, but rope making equipment, you know, that's what I would use it for around the, around the, um, you know, twine, all that stuff for around the farm. You know, just do a little bit, try it out. I mean, they used to plant a quarter acre of hemp and a quarter acre of linen. That was the requirement by USDA, you know? Wonderful. I think from the cultural perspective in general, uh, how would you, how would you encourage people to get to know their seeds a little bit better and get to know the history behind what they're choosing and how to make it right for their place? Appreciating that farming and gardening is really cultural, social, biological, economic. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, there's a lot of places that you can order seeds that are kind of from your area. I try to generally grow from my territory. I think I tried something, you know, because I knew it was going to be a drier year, drier summer. And so I went for these northern, uh, north, you know, Mandan varieties of corn this year, as opposed to the Ojibwe varieties, you know, and I do have some very good Oneida corn that's coming in. I, apparently I have a longer, you know, we have this kind of a microclimate and everybody knows what this is like. You have like three, four parcels that you're growing on and a couple of mine have microclimates and they, they, they just like hang in a little longer. Things are not all frosted, you know, didn't, we didn't have a hard freeze, mm -hmm. you know, in some of those. And so, you know, knowing your own area and then kind of looking for seeds that are from that area, northern or you know and seed savers has a lot of them and certainly kind of continuing to grow those out is really important you know researching it and, and there's people who have knowledge of these seeds and and um you know it's um a lot of it is available indigenous seed savers have a lot of this information mm -hmm. and for people in our community who are starting to have conversations with one another about uh what it means to be growing their food i think one of those things where we're still learning we're still learning our own language our own language as individuals who are growing this food and how to talk about it in the most meaningful way to get people to hold the bigger picture. And um, I think personally one way to do that is to get together and have meals and share that food and share the excitement about what we have grown and why it's important to us. Uh, particularly during this COVID time, I know here we're meeting expansively, uh, but how do you have any ways in which you've witnessed in particular your community sharing that has felt the most meaningful that you would like to then share with us? Well, you know, I mean, the, the easiest thing is kind of what I've talked about, which is giving out these food boxes, mm -hmm. you know, and that's been really uh, well received, you know, and so 40, 50 of those are going out. Then we offered our food at that. We just gave it away at the grocery store. You know, I just got a little booth of giveaway, you know, I mean, and I just had like cool stuff there, tomatoes and all that cool, cool stuff. And then, um, you know, so that's how we've done it. But we have some ceremonies coming up and, and, um, you know, so I usually offer those up for those ceremonies. And that's, you know, it's a little bit different cultural context. You know, we may be doing some picnics for the get out the boat plan, you know, and I'll probably offer some of our traditional foods for the get out the boat folks too, you know just kind of serving stuff up at, at uh, out in an outdoor no. um, And I know one way as organic farmers, I feel like we are constantly teaching one another as I like to talk about like, we feed the soil, you know, and then we get the corn or we the beans or the greens. And that's one way that I feel like I can distinguish myself as an organic farmer from a conventional farmer. Um, and like your anecdote of the horse manure, like you feed the soil, 
your crop is going to show a return in general. Uh, in what ways do you talk about feeding the soil with people who are new to you in, in gardening and homesteading? Well, you know, I mean, we, we do most of our work right now with horse manure, but I'm, you know, really interested in the fish guts. I don't know if, you know, this is what you're talking about, but this is what I'm really interested in is how you build and rescale. Because right now I'm like getting, you know, because we have a large fishing economy up in our area. And so those fish guts need to go back to the soil or back to the, you know, it's like, don't lose those nutrients. And, you know, where I'm like, in where I'm living in Red Lake, you know, Red Lake has a commercial fisheries um, for walleye. And so I'm thinking of feeding the soil with more of their fish guts and trying to set up a, a commercial fish emulsion factory for them, yeah. you know, to kind of like scale up rather than me, you know, getting frozen, uh, you know, boxes of fish guts and distributing them you know, around my, you know, just to kind of grow out this whole scaling it up, because it's one thing to be like an individual farmer. It's another thing to provide, you know, the ability for to feed the soil across the board. So I'm looking kind of more systemically at, at yeah. where these holes are, you know, and, mm -hmm. and rebuilding it. Um, it's got good potential, you know, to, to grow out. And I'm hoping over the next year to see, you know, a lot more movement in, in growing out our local, um, our local soil growing economy of local fertilizers. Yeah, it really like exemplifies how much it comes from in and then goes out. It comes from our inner communities and then expands out uh, statewide and then nationally and globally. And I think in that vein, uh, there's someone that's written in that would like, Teresa uh, would like us to mention, or Teresa says, um, uh, to give voice to the great legacy of the Passamaquoddy Wild Blueberry Company and employing indigenous people and growing traditional food. And now there's a new film called The Voices from the Barrens. So that is a resource that is being shared here. Voices from the Barrens is a film to look for. Um, and our next comment uh, simply says, indigenous solidarity around native crops with a question mark. And I guess, Winona, like when you hear or read the comment, indigenous solidarity around native crops, uh, what does that mean to you? Well, you know, I think that they're just asking if we're, if we're, you know, working with people everywhere and for sure, you know, we are, you know, and, and a lot of, but, you know, I'm really a regionalist. I mean, I know that there's like international movements and I've been privileged to be part of the slow food movement and you know, to attend a lot of these really inspirational gatherings where people are, you know, protecting their seeds. You know, my, my interest in work is really in these northern varieties and the northern plains and the Great Lakes. And so I look into Canada and uh, there's some really, you know, the Métis Seed Savers Association. There's some excellent groups up in, uh, Win you know, Winnipeg area and more and more. I mean, you think about it and like, you know, we're all pretty pastoral, although Maine is kind of north too. But a lot of people don't see, you know, I mean, I see some really big stuff coming out of the north because of all that daylight in the summer, right? You know, I mean, there's some big, big things coming out there. I got some really big, you know, like my squash this year is like huge, mm -hmm. you know, and um, I don't, you know, and, and north, north of me is even more. And so, you know, I think that that kind of a solidarity that's regional and kind of is across your, you know, is across your, your, uh, What's it called? Your growing zone? Sure. Yeah. Like, yeah. That, you know, and then, but then the other thing I want to, I want to say is, is that interestingly in the hemp economy, I'm pretty much interested in Northern European varieties and technology. And, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know if other people are, you know, as interested in this, you should definitely look at our Winona's hemp stuff and email us at Winona's hemp, because this is like the next economy is about cooperation, not competition. Mm -hmm. If we're going to figure out how to, to transform the world, we got to work together. And, you know, so I've been looking at like super interested in my growing region across the north into Europe, particularly as you're looking at something like hemp, a crop that has been illegal in the United States for 80 years. You know, how do you, how do you bring it um, back? You probably should look across your latitude, you know, and grows well in the North country. That's what I know. And so I'm, you know, I'm, I'm kind of looking at these seed, 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 you know, sharing in, in, in my geography. I don't know if that answers your question. I do have a question for y'all. Maybe someone has already talked about this. So I also have been growing all these heritage potato varieties. And um, Flora, my friend from up there, she told me 
Like I said, how do y'all deal with those big potato companies and all their crazy stuff, you know, because Maine and Minnesota and, you know, Idaho are big potato states, you know, and, and these are evil potato companies. We're fighting RDO Offit, and Sarah remembers that from back in the day, you know, but um, we, uh, you know, so I was interested in other people's strategies to keep your heritage potatoes out of the fray of, the, of those guys and, you know, when the potato bug invasion comes. So I'm, I'm, we're doing a lot of working on how you restore these varieties and then also how you restore these varieties and push back industrial ag or plan, you know, for trying to protect your varieties. And so I was just kind of, you know, at some point people got some answers for, for how Maine is dealing with that or the organic farmers up there. I'd be super interested. I planted a little later, but this was the worst year for potato bugs in my life, mm. you know? I don't know what it was like for other people, but this was like big potato bug year. I don't know what they had going, but. Yeah, that's a, it's an interesting question. And I hope some of the people listening who particularly are connected to the potato industry in a larger scale or a smaller scale, write in with their response and I'll share them. Uh, but I'll say one way is, uh, I think being a commercial producer myself for related to potatoes, but other crops is really just the like starting in and then moving out and telling our story. And I think of it in terms of price, I've actually, cut back my potato production uh, and this year did not grow any because it is hard to compete price-wise with those other industries and I need to tell the story like why is this potato tastier why does this potato have value why does this potato look different than potatoes and then it's uh it's creating the cultural change that people are willing to pay for that like this is how I want to manage my potato beetles that feels right to my community that feels right to the earth so it takes more labor and that has a value because I want to pay a living wage. And so I think it really is telling the story, telling the story of all of our foods, telling the story of the squash with the hope and the seeds and the beauty of the corn and knowing that it might look different and it might taste different, but this is why and its value is, is more than economic. Yeah. Um, and then we need that to spread. But uh, I think that is part of the work of Mafka and definitely the work of all of us here. Um, but I feel like it's a big conversation. And one reason why I know personally, I'm so grateful that this conversation is happening in a virtual way so that hopefully more people can access it. Because as the producers, we can't be the only people having those conversations. Like we're out there squishing the bugs, you know? Um, really, there was a lot of bugs too. So many bugs, so many bugs this year. You know, our environment has different twists every year. Uh, and so I think we need to both be telling the story and have more people be telling that story as well. Um, and, and I think the, the cooperation that you're mentioning, Winona, is important too. And, um, you know, Northern Maine and Northern Minnesota are very similar in a lot of ways. And I know for a number of years, you had a great uh, collaboration with Jim Gerritsen at Wood Prairie Farm. I know you used to get some seed potato from him. And he's also right up there in Aroostook County in the heart of the, um, the larger, you know, potato, conventional potato growing. And I know that there's a lot that um, has a lot of work that's been done in that community to make sure that um, there are buffer zones, which I know is one of the challenges right at White Earth. Um, RDO Offit doesn't really have some of those same practices. And here in Maine, they've been working to do a lot of rotation. So organic potatoes, uh, turns out, is an important rotation with organic grain, which is critical to our, our brewing economy that's really um, sprouted up here in Maine and our baking economy. So um, doing those organic practices around, you know, crop rotation and really managing and taking care of the soil um, can also help with the the pests and the weeds and the other diseases. And, and I'm sure our organic growers, if you're not still connected with Jim, I'm sure he would love to reconnect and, and really do some of that knowledge sharing for, you know, what works here and what works, what works in Minnesota and how we can learn from each other. Yeah, I, I'd like that. And it would be good if you would reconnect us. And then also kind of this question that I noticed on the grains of where do you get your grains milled and who has a wind powered grain mill? You know, that's kind of my question now is how you rebuild intermediate scale because as I, you know, start walking into the hemp industry, I realized that this crop has a potential for so many purposes. And if you have all those seeds, you know, what if you turn more of them into this, you know, I mean, I, I did make some pasta out of it and we had some, you know, special people make the pasta for us. And, but now, you know, I'm like, well, 
now that I've got the recipe, where do I get more milk? You know, how many backflips do I got to do to do that? And then where's my local production, you know, my co-packers? So, you know, I know that in Maine, you have done a lot of thinking about this. Minnesota is obviously, you know, a pretty progressive state too, but very interested because if you guys have got a more infrastructure in your milling industry, we need it too. You know, that's what I really noticed at the, at the, at, you know, as I was looking into, you know, this year, I was like, wow, someone's got to rebuild the local milling structure. But, you know, what an opportunity. You know, what an opportunity. We've been, you know, ringing, not wringing our hands, but we've been pretty pissed off at the concentration in the food industry. And now it's collapsing. So, like, let's just step up, you know, and, and um, people, you know, that's how change is made. You know, I don't want to say crisis is opportunity any more times, but I'm like, you know, now would be a good time to rebuild those systems because it looks like I won't be getting any pork from Smithfield Foods this year. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, as you're talking about the the Green New Deal, the new economy that we're growing, you know, hemp is part of that. Um, but we're also dealing with climate change. And we, we had one of the worst droughts in Maine this summer. And Maine is usually a place that has a lot of water. And so you talk about growing the different corn varieties. But, you know, what do you see with climate change coming and, and the necessity of how we need to adapt? Yeah, I mean, like I said, I, I picked kind of the drier varieties and then I prayed and did our best. And, you know, as you, as you likely remember, we don't have irrigation, you know, in our fields. And so I'm interested in, you know, non-irrigated agriculture. And I'm in Minnesota, I should be able to manage that for crying out loud, you know, but it was dry and last bit. And then last year in comparison to that, we were like bobbing for potatoes, right? You know, and so that was, that was crazy and disastrous and time consuming and stressful. <laughs> this year we are bobbing for potatoes, but it was very dry. And then I just watched my varieties adapt. My theory is, is that those heritage varieties are smart and they can adapt. Those GMO varieties and, and hybrids can't, they aren't smart varieties. And so, you know, I watched my corn weight. I watched some of my corn come in lower, you know, or shorter. I watched, um, what else did I watch? I watched a bunch of, uh, I watched a bunch of my different plants just kind of like grow out differently that I might have seen them like a little like late, late start, you know, and you're like, are you coming? Are you down there? Are you down there? And all of a sudden they'd pop up, you know, and it'd be like two weeks later than you thought, but there they were, you know? So I, I'm pretty interested in, and that's one of the reasons that I believe in heritage varieties is because they seem to be smarter than I am, which really wouldn't take much if you're a plant, you know, just to figure that out, so. Yeah, and then you do so much work with bringing up the next generation who are going to be taking this work forward. I've, I've appreciated seeing, um, you know, some of your, your family members who I knew as just little ones who are now grown up um, who are involved. But how are you, how, how does that work? I mean, how do you get the next generation interested in moving forward with these things you're working on? Well, I mean, I don't want to go on that crisis is opportunity. Did I say it three or four times already? You know, but all those kids are quarantined at home. Nobody's going to school. So I'd say that's a pretty darn good opportunity to teach farming. You know, and so basically my grandkids, I, I ended up quarantining with, you know, there's four, sometimes eight kids, and then kind of a, a day program where kids come down because the school doesn't have any, you know, it's just crazy up here, like everywhere else, but we're real rural. And so I uh, just have those kids all working at the farm and they do their homework in the morning and they do their farm work in the afternoon, you know, before they get to ride the horses. And that's how we work, you know, but, um, you know, so a lot of people are probably doing similar things. Um, and, you know, I feel like that, um, I, you know, now is, you know, a lot of my kids, as you know, were homeschooled, right? And so, which was, you know, Sarah, you and Justin were the big home, and Flora too were the homeschoolers, right? I remember Justin used to do the math class, you know, because none of us want to do math class, right? But my point is, is that now is that time again, you know, every kid's mostly homeschooled in our area. You know, I, 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 I'm, I'm not allowing my grandchildren to go into the public schools because by fall, it's going to be really bad up here. You know, I mean, I just assume there's so darn many Republicans in northern Minnesota. I wouldn't send my kids to school with Republican children. That's a bad idea. You know, I'm just telling you the truth. They're scary up here, deep north and all, you know, but my, so, 
you know, looking at that, that's a really good opportunity. We used to call them survival schools in the 70s and 80s. The Native people had survival schools. And I'm like, these are the new survival schools, you know, or the new green revolution schools. And so, you know, that's what I plan to do is, is, is uh, try to train as many as possible and just keep inspiring them. I had a lot of kids come see the farm. They just like that stuff, you know, go give them a good example. Yeah, kids love to be outside, and um, I know one of the things you, you've you also had the kids involved with is um, solar panels and doing a lot of solar and alternative energy work there, too. Is that is that still happening during the pandemic? Yeah, yes, it is. We just did, um, you know, we, we took us a little while, because I think, I mean, like everywhere else, every system was in shock, right? And then what are you going to do? And I think that, you know, somebody at a certain point realized it's going to get cold in the winter anyway, so maybe we better just stick with some of these plans like solar you know, and, and get that, get that all moving along. And so I feel, I feel pretty, you know, I feel good about our solar thermal uh, work on the reservation and we've been installing more. And then, um, you know, the other thing we've done a lot of is mural projects. Um, you know, we started painting up the houses at, in, a, in one of our housing projects because, you know, they're ugly 50 year old housing projects are just ugly as could be. And so, you know, we've been, we're doing the outside and we'll do the inside during the, during the, during the winter time of some of our travel buildings. But you know that's kind of my my philosophy is try to keep uh, kids engaged in in you know restorative work, restorative agriculture, restorative culture work, restorative you know healing work, and um, yeah, it's been and 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 the renewable energy work. So we're eight fire solar is what we're called, and uh, we've been installing solar thermal panels on the on the on people's houses for quite a while here. I'm gonna actually try to find a picture of our eighth fire solar while, while we visit here for a minute. Ask me another question and I'll show you a really cool picture, okay? Is that okay? Yeah, we're excited. And I know we're close to end, right? Yeah, we've got about five minutes left here. And you know, while you're pulling up that picture, I just wanna um, share some acknowledgements. So we've been doing a Wabanaki land acknowledgement that we are on Wabanaki land here at the Maine Organic Farmers and Gardeners Association campus. Um, all of Maine was as Wabanaki territory um, and the tribes that are here and the communities that are still here today. And there are a lot of amazing projects that are happening in Maine as well. Um, the Eastern Woodlands Rematriation Project, the Maine Indian Basket Makers Alliance, um, every community, every indigenous community here in Maine is, is working on the same sorts of things that you're talking about, Winona, restoring traditional foods, um, protecting and preserving language and culture and heritage, and um, really fighting for sovereignty and, and survival. The, the Maine tribes have been fighting for that for for a long time. And um, so here at the Maine Organic Farmers and Gardeners Association, you know, we're primarily um, largely non-native white, you know, ally group. And so we want to be as supportive of allies as we can. And, and we're doing a lot to learn and center indigenous voices and build those relationships with indigenous communities here. And um, we encourage everybody to do that in their communities because it really is about building building relationships listening and and um, centering the indigenous voices for your communities so awesome to see the pictures here Winona and I don't know if you want to just share yeah, any just, other yeah just a couple and I'm, I'm really you know thank you for for saying that and reaffirming like the hard work in these communities and I and you know I think a lot of people get like indigenous people you know we never really you know nothing trickled down <laughs> we'll go with that for this economy and so you know a long time we figured we better try to take care of this stuff ourselves and we're doing our best you know and so um on, on white earth we you know ronnie runs this thing she knows who ronnie is eighth fire solar ronnie is doing these uh, this is the solar thermal installs and this is what you know that equipment looks like and you can put them on the south side of your wall and this is in a housing project and it could save about 20 percent of your heating bill and, you know, the intersection between food poverty and energy, po you know, or heat poverty, you know, is pretty significant in the North Country. And this is our manufacturing facility here. Um, and um, so, you know, we're, we're, do we're doing this on the reservation and, and making these solar thermal panels, these eight fire solar panels. I've been really, you know, proud of, of that work. And, and, and you know, in, as, we, as we continue on, you know, I think that the... That the um, you know, part of what we need to do clearly is just rebuild local economies, all the facets of them. And this is that opportunity. And, you know, I don't know, um, you know, 
I don't know all of the mechanisms and I know that we all better vote so we can like take back the country if you want to say that. I, I like to take it back a little bit more than even an election, but you know, just just start with that. But you know, just know that as we go through this winter, it's gonna be cold. And so let's figure out how to cut our bills and, and make things better. And um, you know, a lot of that is relocalizing a food economy and relocalizing an energy economy. Those are two like need needs things for sure. I like John Simmons' dog. Is that an Aussie Shepherd, John? Yeah, so actually John is going to be coming up next with a talk about the sheepdog demonstrations. And so we Very are good. going to go to that here in just a minute. But with the, the last minute we have left here, Winona, um, anything else you'd like to share about any of your work or any parting thoughts for folks? Yeah, I mean, the other thing is, is that we are doing this horse farming, which you gathered. And I'm, I'm neighbors with the Amish. And I just want to say it's super interesting kind of like Amish economics, which I know you've all looked at, but like kind of this, we call it the Amish Anabe economic model. You know, it's this relocalization with your Amish relatives, but we're doing a lot of horse farming work and learning from them. But I'm super interested in as we build a post petroleum agriculture economy, I know you all out there have done a lot more work with horse farming than some of us in our region. And, um, you know, I just want to encourage just the more post-petroleum uh, farming we can do. And thank you for that. Make sure you share with us if there's like some awesome workshops that we can, you know, look into or something uh, to just kind of keep building our capacity in that. But, you know, my, my fellow Northerners, keep it up. Grow cool squash, grow a lot of good corn, grow awesome potatoes, fight the bad guys off, eat well, be happy, be grateful, and grow some hemp. <laughs> awesome. Well, miigwech, Winona. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we really appreciate it. And we look forward to fostering those collaborations and partnerships between our, our northern growers and the indigenous communities here. So thanks, Winona. Yes, miigwech. Thanks to you, Sarah, and all miigwech. Have a good day. You Thank too. You. Thank you. So next up here at the 44th annual Common Ground Country Fair, um, Beth and I are gonna be signing off here shortly. We are gonna be handing it over to Anna and Eli who are gonna take you through the afternoon programming. Um, and just coming up next is our amazing sheepdog demonstration. So John Simmons is gonna be live here with us and going to be sharing more about why should you work with dogs? So let's take it away. Let's hear from John. Wait here. Right there, right now. Wendy, come on. Wait. Good morning. I'm John Simmons and uh, welcome to Stoneheart Farm. We're here in Western Maine. And uh, we'd rather be in unity with all of you uh, at the Real Common Ground Fair, but we're going to have to make do with what we can do this year, and uh, we're, we're happy to be a part of it. So at our farm, we run about 80 sheep, mostly Katahdin and Katahdin Dorper crosses, and we use border collies for lots of things. And we just want to share with you uh, some today of how we use them and how things work and why they work and maybe sometimes why it doesn't work and give you a little bit of an idea of uh, what it's like uh, living with a, a working border collie. I have two dogs that I use on about 80 sheep and really you could you could use one dog but two dogs is it's number one it's more fun but actually uh, the dogs have become so important to us and such an integral part of the farm that, you know, unfortunately dogs get old. And when, when a dog gets old, uh, you know, you can't just go down to Walmart and get another dog and have her working the next day. So we like to have dogs staggered in age a little bit. So one's coming up while one's getting closer to retirement and, and one is right in the middle, ready to go. So uh, these are my two girls here. Uh, Gwenny is on the left. She's 12 years old. And that's, you know, that's getting some age on a dog. And, uh, you know, in some ways she's starting to show her age. You see, she doesn't jump over the fence uh, like the younger one does. She can't clear a 42 inch fence like she used to, but she really hasn't lost her heart. Um, and she wants to be 
part of the game, and and uh, she does. She wants, to, you know, last thing she wants to do is be retired. It's just not in the the working uh, dog's vocabulary, retirement. So she can't do the things that she used to do or at the speed she used to do them. But uh, and you'll see that I I'll tend to use. Uh, the younger dog more just because she's got the energy and the stamina and, and you know the physical capabilities to do what I asked her to do. So the other my dog on the on the right is B, um, and she's seven years old, and she still thinks she's a puppy, but uh, she's a lot of fun. She has a lot of energy. Uh, she loves to work. Uh, both these dogs would rather work than eat. It's just it's just what they want to do. Um, you know, it's like they say, girls just want to have fun, and, and to, to these girls, work is fun. And that's, that's what they get up in the morning and, and hope to do. So how do we make these dogs work? How do we talk to them? How do we communicate with them? Well, we want them to be able to move the sheep. And they, they, they do that with the, this predatory stare. When the, she, when the dog looks at the sheep, the, the sheep's thinking, geez, this dog wants to eat me. I think I'll move over here, get out of the way. And that's kind of how it works. You know, it's, it, back in the, the back brain of that sheep, you know, they were, a, they were a predator. So they don't, you know, as far as these, they're concerned, these dogs look like wolves and coyotes and, and, and they're not to be trusted. You know, the sheep are over there. I can't use, you know, go to the left or go to the right because my left might be their right, depending on our orientation. So we use commands for clockwise and counterclockwise. So, you know, the whole clockwise thing is important for the dogs. And that's why I never let our puppies wear a digital watch because I want them to get the counterclockwise and clockwise down concept pad. So if I want them to go clockwise around the sheep, I'll, I'll tell them come by. If I want them to go counterclockwise around the sheep, the command is away or away to me. If I want them to approach the sheep, I'll say walk up. If I want them to lay down, down, lay down. And, you know, that's an important command because it takes pressure off of the sheep. If, if the sheep sees the dogs lying down, it knows it's not going to, you know, go at them or, do, you know, it feels a little bit safer. It's like it's on base a little bit. So those are, I mean, there's lots of other commands, get back, look back and, and whatnot. But those are the basic things that make things happen. So we'll try to show you that a little bit. You may notice sometimes I whistle and sometimes I talk, but most of these commands you can you can transmit with the whistle too, which is very handy because if you know you look around here, we have some pretty big open spaces. If the wind's blowing, I mean the sheep may be you know more than a hundred yards, they may be hundreds of yards away, and you need to communicate to the, the dog what you're trying to do. Um, and it's hard to yell. Yeah, I don't like yelling, but you know, whistle. This week things come by, go away, lay down, walk up. So those, all those things are much easier to, to whistle, especially in the open, than uh, with the wind. With the wind going. So one thing we always like to say about these dogs is. Are working dogs, and everybody likes them. You know, they're, they're like, oh, glad I love a dog like that. But these dogs do not make great pets. These dogs need to be busy. They need to be busy physically and mentally. They got to be working. They got to be thinking about stuff. And if they don't, if you're not giving them something to do, they're going to find something to do, and it's frequently not going to be what you had in mind. And they can come up with a lot of bad habits and a lot of vices, and and. Uh, worst thing you do is just have a border collie, have a pet in the backyard to go to work for eight hours. That dog's going to be stir crazy by the time he got home because that, that, you know, that, that dog's life is not hanging out in, in your backyard. She want, the dogs want way more than that. So we don't recommend them for pets. We only recommend them for working situations. And that, in that instance, uh, they can be a great part of your family and a great help. That natural instinct of a border collie is to go around the sheep and bring them to you that they're called a gathering it's called gathering there are some herding dogs that are driving dogs where they are going to be behind the animal and push them away uh, that's a driving dog 
and these are herding dogs. So let's take B and send her on a counterclockwise uh, run around the sheep and kind of head them over this direction. B, go away. Wait, B, wait. Wait, go away. Wait, B, wait. Walk up. Walk up, go away. B, go away. Go away. B. Walk up. Here, 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 here. See here. See, come on. Right here, come here. Okay. Right there. So she brought them out, and they they come out, but they see Gwenny's laying here, uh, kind of still, and they say, well, that's about as far as we want to come. So a lot of this works, you know, I, I talk about the predatory stare, and it's about pressure, too. The dogs are putting pressure on the sheep, and, and, and conversely, the the sheep are exerting some energy back to the dogs too, about making them uh, to come into a balance. So just for fun uh, and something to try, I've got four stakes set up over here. Let's see if we can make all of the sheep stand in those four stakes. Now they don't have any reason to do that. Uh, the grass isn't any better there than in any other part of the, the field here. And, the, and, and conversely, the dogs don't have any reason to want to put them in there. They don't see the end game. They don't, you know, they, these dogs are thinking dogs, and they say, what are we trying to accomplish? Well, to them, that's really, doesn't make any sense. So they're just going to do it because I'm asking them to do it. So they're kind of following my, my lead, and, and hopefully they're going to try to do what I'm asking them to do. Because this is a... It's really a, a team sport, and they have to have a lot of trust in me, and I have trust in them too. And they're going to trust me that I'm not going to put them in a compromising position, ask them to do something where that's, they're going to get hurt or you know, be sorry that they're in that situation. So they, they trust me a lot, uh, and conversely, I get to trust them too. So let's... Uh, see what we can do about putting them uh, into the square and having them stand there for a, a little bit. So we'll use our old girl to get things started here. B, come by. Come by. Come by. Right there. B, go away. Be here. Be walk up. Be walk up. Be go away. Right there. Win. Win here. Be here. Be go away. Right there. Walk up. Be go away. Be go away. Here. Here. Be coming. Come. Walk up. Let's go. Walk up. Walk up. Walk up. Come on. Let's go. Come on, baby. Let's go. Come on. Easy. Lay down. Big, come here. Where do you go away? Where? No, wait. Right there. Speak away. Speak away. When he come by. Wait. Right there. Lay down. Speak calm here. Lay down. So you see that all works because of the amount of pressure. There's no fence around those holes. And there's only, you know, there's only, there's four sides, but there's only two dogs. But the sheep just get the idea that if they stand right there, we'll, that the dogs will, will take the pressure off the dogs, the dogs will take the pressure off of the sheep, and they can stand there and not feel like they're, they're being stalked. So, you know, too much pressure, they're going to keep on going through. Not enough pressure, 
they're not going to want to stay there. So it has to be a it has to be the right amount. Too much doesn't work, and too little isn't enough. So in the same vein, let's uh, let's try to do something else. I'll take a couple of those stakes down, and we'll just have two stakes, and see if we can move the sheep in a figure eight around the stakes. And again, the sheep have no reason to want to walk in a figure eight. It's not like they're going to get to some better pasture if they do that. We're just kind of like making them do it, and they're kind of just going to do it because that's going to be the the least pass of, of resistance for them. Hopefully, let's see how it happens. See if we can bring them in this direction, up through here, out and back, come around again, and complete the aid. See how that goes. See, come on. All right, easy. Walk up easy. Walk up. Walk up. starting to feel the pressure from her and she's feeling the pressure from them. She knows if she gets too close, they're just going to scatter. So she's kind of trying to go slow and deliberate, which is what I'm kind of asking her to do. Come back. Walk up.
Be here. Speak. Go away. Right there. Walk up, walk up. Wait, 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 right there, lay down. So that gives you an idea of, you know, making those sheep walk in a figure of eight. You can't train a sheep to do that. So they're just doing it because that's what the dogs are kind of strongly requesting them to do. Um, and they kind of dogs give an offer they can't refuse there. So that gives you a little bit of uh, uh, appreciation of the pressure that goes into the, what the, the pressure that the dogs have to exert to get those sheep to move. It's nice to be able to move them in a controlled, slow fashion. You don't want sheep just running around the field, jumping over the, the fences and trying to get away from the dogs. That's, that's uh, counterproductive to about anything. So, and you can see now the dogs are laying down. They're sort of, they're active, but they're not actively, you know, putting pressure on the sheep. So the sheep feel more comfortable than just going to walk around and, and kind of do what they want. So another useful thing that we can do with the dogs is we might want to put them in a trailer or, or put them in a pen or catch them or, or do something like that. So again, these sheep don't have any reason to go in the pen. Generally, when they go in a pen, it's not because you're going to give them an award. So we're going to just see if we can get the dogs to make them go in there and uh, see how that goes. Come on. Here, here, here. Wait, come on. Here, here. Come on. Wait. Come on, wait. Go away. Go away. Be, walk up. Be, walk up. Be here. Be, come here. Be here. No, here. Walk up. Be, come on. Be, be, come on. Be, walk up. Be, walk up. Be here. Be, come here. Be, come here. Here. Right there. Here. See here. Stubborn. Wind, go away. Walk up. Ready. Come on, Wind. Come on, Bring. Bring here. Wind. Be go back away. Be. Wind. Be go away. Be away. Walk up away. Walk up away. Walk up away. Be go away. 
Walk up. Walk up. Mommy. Gwen. Shows you a little bit of frustration. That that uh, big white you is an older one, and she says, "I'm just not going to put up with this nonsense." So she de decided to bolt, and of course, B's a little frustrated because they're not getting the job done exactly how it went to how she thought it was going to work. So she thought, "Well, I'll just uh, go up and talk to him a little, uh, a little closer." What she's doing is not really uh, encouraged. Uh, you know, dogs are allowed to bite, or we what we call grip, but only under command. Uh, they can't just do it because they're getting frustrated like that. So it, that's a no-no to to the dogs, and they understand that um, they're allowed to grip if, if it's a self-defense thing, uh, or at, at times there are, you know, rarely occasions that you have to use it as a command to, to, to make things happen. If it doesn't happen every once in a while, uh, then the dog becomes, you know, a paper tiger. And the, and the sheep says, well, I don't really have to do what he says because he's never going to do anything to me anyway. The sheep are hot and they're just say, I'm not playing this game and we're just not going to do this. So that's fine. And that's the way it goes sometimes. You know, we didn't get the sheep in the pen, but I, I can tell you right off the bat, these dogs are not perfect, and I can tell you that I'm nothing special, and my wife can vouch for that statement. But one reason we do this is to tell you, to show you what you can do, because we're not, these dogs are not, are not professional trial dogs that do the same thing over and over again. These are farm dogs. They work here every day. They help me immensely. Uh, and, you know, things are not always perfect in real life. We do this because you can do this too. It just takes some determination, a little bit of time, and a willingness to want to do it. And you can have a good working dog uh, on your farm also. So one of the most important commands that we have is that your work is done. Because if, if you don't tell them that they're done, they're going to want to keep working. You can... Uh, go to the store and come home, they're going to still be in the field. They might have the sheep next in the corner and they haven't had anything to eat for a while. So, most important command is that you're done working. And you'll see how they change when we tell them that. That right, girls, that'll do. So just like that, they know they're done. We're going to go do something else. Maybe go for a swim, maybe have some fun, play some ball. All the other kind of things that these dogs love to do. So one of the things we use to with the dogs on a pretty much daily basis is when we're working with animals, we don't like to get knocked over and crowded and have, you know, have them take our knees out and things like that. So I'm going to give these these lambs some minerals, and I purposely didn't give them some for a so they're really going to want it. And you'll see that it's hard to even work in there when they know that I'm in there to, to give them something that they want. But when I invite B in, it's going to be a totally different view. Stay there, B. Let's 
history changes the whole uh, picture a little bit. It's easy to put the minerals in. They're not trying to knock you over. They're not fighting each other. Makes it easy. All right, that'll do. So one of the other things we do here is weigh animals. Uh, on this farm, we raise lamb for meat. And so we go to the slaughterhouse every two weeks with a uh, load of lambs. And I, I want to know what they're going to weigh because my customers want a particular, you know, weight of animal for the most part. And I really don't like surprises unless it's my birthday. So we're frequently weighing animals, marking them, sorting them, knowing what we're going to have. So this. It's another job that, yeah, I could do it myself, but certainly a lot easier and more fun with a couple of helpers. So, come on, girls, let's go. So, we're going to take a pen of animals to keep it interesting. We're going to put this, we're going to take the middle pen and run them through the way. So, just like that, these girls up this, this kind of Boy is outside, out of the way. That was real easy with the dogs. Come inside by yourself and try to chase them out. It doesn't work that way, I can guarantee you. Now we're bringing them out here. We just have to get them through the chute, through the scale, and know what we have.
So one of the things that's useful with uh, having dogs around is helping them in a pen. You put a dog in the pen, it automatically shrinks the size of the pen. You can, you can get your sheep, do what you need to do. Now in this case, I have a ram in the pen. Well, rams, this, this ram has to be re reasonably friendly, but he's still a ram and he can still hurt you. But if we go in with the dogs, come on, girl. Let's go. In general, the ram's going to be less thinking less about hurting me and thinking more about are those dogs going to hurt the ram? So you can see he's just he's watching him. He's just keeping an eye on him. And if I wanted to catch him, do something with him. Because the dog's got him there. And again, this guy is a little friendlier than most. Um, you can still you can still do what you need to do in a pen, and you can crowd them into a corner. You can catch them. You can do what you need to do. But I, I can tell you, you know, have you been on the ground at the receiving end of an old cranky ram more than once? I never go in a pen uh, without the dogs there to kind of keep an eye on business for me. So feeding the dog is a, a chore time thing that's handy with the dog. I've got a pen of ewes here uh, being bred. They don't like this grain. Uh, I need some help. Or they're just going to like knock the bucket down and pretty soon it'll be everywhere. Come on, girls. Here. B, B Gwenny, let's go. Gwenny, come on. Gwenny, here. Walk up. B, come. So that dog weighs 40 pounds. She's, she's uh, got those sheep pretty much under control. They know that they're not going to come in until she's safe. All right, B, that'll do. So here's a pen of lambs that, that need to be fed. Uh, you know, lambs are a little bit different. They don't really, they're like the children. They don't play by the rules all the time. Uh, they're not going to knock me down because they're not so big, but yet, but they're still a nuisance to work around. So, again, we use the dog to try to put a little bit more order into such things. Come on, Gwenny. Gwenny, go away. Gwenny, B, go back. No. B, go away. Gwenny, walk up. Be here. Come here. No, over here. Right here. Be come. Now they don't really want to be down there waiting. They'd rather eat. But they know that it's kind of that's just that's just the way it's going to be. So it's one more thing. You can do it yourself, but it's easier with some help. All right, girls, let's do it. Well, thanks again for coming out to the farm and, and uh, watching the video. 
I hope it gives you a little insight into the life of a working dog and, and how it changes our lives too. We work hard together, we play hard together. I can tell you these dogs are, are with us 24 seven. If we're out on the boat, if we're at the lake, if we're hiking, if we're working, and at the end of the day, we're on the bed and we're all, we all pass out and then get up tomorrow and do it all over again. So they change your life, they change your chores, they change your, your work um, and they're great animals and, and thanks for watching. And I can tell you with that, with a high degree of certainty, if I didn't have dogs to use, I wouldn't have sheep. Well, thank you for those wonderful videos of the dogs working. I'm Anna Olivia. I'm the Community Education Director here at Mothka. And John, thanks for joining us. Thanks for working to put together that beautiful content for us. Who do you have with you here today? Well, we're happy to be here. I got my two favorite girls with me. Uh, the one on my lap is Gwen. She's the older one. She's 12 years old and she's... Uh, a quiet power dog. She's very uh, the thinker of the two. Uh, she's slow and steady. She's reliable. She gets things done. She's calm. I can put her in a trailer and I know the sheep will come out. Now my other one is, is B. She's seven. Mm -hmm. uh, her, her nickname is uh, the Buster, the, the Bee Buster, or the Bee Bomb, but particularly with this year's Common Ground. But uh, she's sort of the rock and roll girl, and she likes to get things done, and she likes to, to get things moving, and her she has a total different kind of energy. It's not a quiet power like like uh, Gwen's. Her energy is kind of in your face sometimes, and and when she goes in the trailer, the sheep will come out, but they they might just jump out through the window because they just, they just it's it's kind of you know they really are doing the same thing, but just the amount of energy that they emit is done very differently. Is that partly due to their age difference, John, or just their personalities and who they are as, as dogs? Yeah, no, it's really not their age. It, it's totally their personality. It's how they're wired. Uh, and it's just who they are. And you can't really, I mean, you can change it to a degree, but you, you can't really change the kind of energy a dog has and how it emits it. Well, thank you for bringing them along. It's so nice to see their familiar faces here zoomed into the fairgrounds. We have a couple questions from folks watching along at home. And one of them is, how do you know when a puppy is ready to move up to a larger species if you're training it? Well, that's going to be different for different people. Um, some people don't start a puppy training until they're 12 year or, or until they're 12 months old or about a year. Um, on the other hand, you can start. Uh, David had his 15 month old or 15 week old puppy at Common Ground a couple of years ago, and and showed him uh, what the instincts do in a pup and and how things really can work and how you can start them training. Really, you have to be able to read the dog. So if if you if you go out into the field with this with your livestock your sheep and the dog got her tail high in the air and she's wagging it and barking it and looking like she's having a lot of fun that's all she's really having is fun you need, you, they need to be able to settle down stay here they need to settle and work uh and be able to take correction uh, and that's different at different ages and of, of course you can um you know, your, your training is going to be different for a, a very young dog than it's going to be for a, a, a dog that has more maturity. So you really have to read your dog. Uh, it's It's got to be fun, but it's not just a game. It, it, it is work, too, and they have to understand that. That makes complete sense along the, as they get older. And we have a question that came in about sort of the other end of the spectrum, is there a point where a dog kind of ages out and isn't able to do work anymore on your farm? Well, yes and no. Um, you know, the dogs don't really have retirement in their vocabulary. They love to work. 
of course, when a dog gets to be elderly and, you know, by the time they get to be 12, 13, 14, they're kind of getting up there. Uh, so they want, they think they can still do what they did when they were young, but they can't. So you don't want to ask them to do things that they physically really can't do anymore. Um, you got to give them tasks that are age appropriate. They want to be involved. They want to please you. They want to, you know, coach, put me in the game. They don't want to sit on the sidelines. They want to, they want to do what they were born to do. And they really, they'll try to do it up until their last breath. They're such great dogs. We, growing up, had a small flock of sheep, and there was a farm who had a big flock of sheep and border collies who herded them. And sometimes one would be not able to carry work with that big flock anymore, and it would come do some, some smaller work around our farm as a nice task for them to do as they got older. Yeah, you want to give them things that make them feel useful and wanted, needed. I mean, really, they're no different than us in that regard. Everybody wants to feel like there's a per they have a purpose and, a and be useful. Exactly. A question came in from Sarah on Facebook, and she's wondering if you're in the field working with the dogs and you can't see them, they're far out in the distance, can the dogs tell which whistle is meant for which dog? Um, maybe, but it's, it's kind of going to depend. If you've given a dog commands and a dog knows that that's the yeah. command, uh, she's going to follow that whistle. Uh, it's going to be difficult to change dogs if they can't hear you. Because generally, we'll give a command that's preceded by the dog's name. So they know that that command is for them. So there's no name in a whistle for the dogs. Uh, so it's going to partly be, I mean, partly when they're that far away that, th that you can't see them anymore, part of it is going to be uh, their training and that they know what they're there to do. And you're kind of giving them the, the whistles to kind of get things going. But if you can't see them, you can't give them an appropriate whistle anyway. So you can't give a command to do something when you don't know what's going on. So you have to depend on their uh, training and natural abilities to go out and get the job done. And even if you're not with them, and that's gonna largely be their, their basic instinct, which is to go behind the sheep and bring them to you. Uh, that's called a gathering dog. Thanks for that, John. And speaking of the, the basic sort of instincts and abilities that your beautiful border collies there have, we have a question that came in on YouTube. Do you know if anyone has used corgis for herding sheep? Well, corgis uh, historically have been a working dog um, and they're a driving dog. So their instinct is to push the, the livestock away from you as opposed to a, a gathering dog which brings it to you so yes there are the corgis do have work in their in their pedigree you know now in more recent times there's been more breeding for corgis as pets uh than for working but they some some of them certainly still have the instincts uh, in them that makes total sense a, a working corgi if you want a corgi to actually work the best thing to do would be to try to find working corgi parents and, and get puppies from that, which, you know, is probably not possible, but it's, they're, not, they're not on every street corner either. You have to do a little research there to find the, the right fit for your homestead. John, it's a beautiful afternoon here on the grounds, and I am remembering one time when I saw the demonstration here at the fair, and it was the part of the demonstration where you invite some of the audience members to come out and give a try to herding and working through a course, which I've seen happen a few times, and usually it doesn't go particularly well for the people <laughs> giving it a try. The one time I'm remembering it was a group of um, young middle school aged kids and they did a great job. They were so coordinated and got 
the sheep and chickens right through the course. And I'm wondering if you have any particular memories of a group that did very well at the fair or maybe not so well um, herding through that demonstration. Probably the group that I remember that was maybe the best was the senior citizens. And of course, you know, uh, I'm approaching that age, so I'll always have to root for the old people. But uh, yeah, the senior citizens went out there and they're calm, they didn't run around, you know, probably they couldn't. So they moved slowly, methodically, and they didn't want to waste their energy and they were efficient and they, they did a good job. They got the job done. I think they beat us on that day. It happens sometimes then, different groups you can beat that time. We have a question that came in from James on Facebook, and he's wondering about another dog breed that maybe you're familiar with called uh, McNabs. Have you ever heard of or worked with that breed at all? Uh, I really have no knowledge of that. So unless you want me to just make something up, I think we should just move on. Lots of lots of breeding herding dogs that work and. You know, we're partial to the border collies, but by they're, they're by no means the only ones. There are other working dogs that can sort of get the job done. When you started out working with dogs, John, did you start with some border collies or did you think about other breeds as well? No, I, I started with border collies. I tell you, I got my start through Mopka back at Windsor Fair because we had an old hunting dog at the time and she was she passed on and so we're looking for a new dog and we had sheep and getting more sheep and I thought well geez it'd be nice to have a dog that could actually help me do something around the farm so we used to go to Mafka anyway or go to the common ground fair when it was at Windsor and we watched David Kennard do the demos and I sort of became a groupie I would go to every demo of the day, just sit there and watch it and try to figure out why it works and how it works. And then I'd pester him with information and try to pick his brain. And, it, and that's kind of where I got my interest. Uh, and so it's grown from there. But yeah, we've always had border collars and I you know, got mine through David and he kind of helped me along the way. And we've developed a good friendship over the years uh, through border collars. I love that fair, fair connection going out into the world and making a difference on your own farm. We have a couple questions that have come in. Um, one is with more and more people keeping herding breeds like those beautiful border collies as pets, do you have any advice for how to keep them occupied if they aren't working on a farm? Well, that's a good question because these are working dogs. Uh, and we do not recommend them to be in non-farm non situations. Uh, they've got to be busy and they've got to be busy physically and mentally. And if you don't give them something to do, they'll frequently find it. And it's not going to be what you had in mind. And it's, it's oftentimes destructive. So these are not the kind of dogs that you can have in your backyard and they're going to be happy to see you when you get home. Um, we only recommend these for working farms. Because, uh, you know, people see them at the fair, they pretty well behave, they ask, seem to do what you ask them to do, and they say, well, I'd like a dog like that. But if you take it home and put them in your backyard, you're not going to have a dog like that. You're going to have a dog that's developing a lot of bad habits, and it's going to be a lot of friction, and they frequently wind up in rescue situations, which is unfortunate. Good advice. Thank you, John. A question came in from YouTube from Ruth. She's wondering what you feed the border collies and if there are any health problems that are common in that breed that folks should watch out for. Uh, you know, you have to feed them a quality food. I mean, there's lots of different dog foods. Uh, different people are different, are partial to different brands. I, I would just say there's a lot it has to be a quality food because they they really use a lot of energy. So it, you can't give them a food with just a lot of fillers. Uh, they need some protein, they need some calories. They need to be able to, to have that fuel to burn, so to do the kind of work that they do. So, yeah, I mean, there's, there's no, to me, there's no right or wrong answer there. Um, but you, you have to give them food that's appropriate for the amount of energy that they're burning. 
they have a lot of work to do to to use all that food, all those nutrients up. And are there any health problems that are common in the breed that folks should know about? Um, I mean, I don't, I'm not real familiar with breed problems, I guess because I really not haven't had them. Uh, I think the thing to do is to have, if you're going to work with you know, getting a puppy, you have them from a reputable breeder who's because there can be some eye issues, there can be some hip, excuse me, hip issues. And of course, you know, you don't want that in your line of, of dogs. Um, I would say in general, there's not as many health issues as in some other dogs because it's, these dogs are bred for their intelligence and not so much for single traits like their confirmation for a, a show ring and that kind of thing. So with their bred from working parents to make working dogs uh, and that way it, it keeps a broader gene pool. Wonderful, thanks John. And I'm wondering, you said you got your, your first dogs from Dave after you met him here at the fair. Did you start with um, a puppy on your own farm that you trained up or did you work with some of Dave's other dogs first? No, I, I did start with a puppy, um, and that was a challenge. I had a puppy, a handful of sheep, and a book, and the sheep didn't like the dog, and, and off we went. Uh, but you got to be persistent, and you read, and you reread the books, and look at the videos, and you talk to everybody you can do, and, and you can figure it out, and you can do it. And so, you know, I'm not a professional guy, so I mean, I, one of the reasons that I do this is I can, you know, people need to know they can do this. They can have, you know, dogs that work and mind and, and are, are fun to be with. Uh, you know, it, it's, not with, it's not out of anybody's reach to be able to do and what I've done and reach the, the levels that we've reached. Well, thank you for that inspiring note, John, and thank you for your beautiful presentation. And thank you to your dogs for joining us on this beautiful afternoon. It's been wonderful to talk to you, wonderful to see the dogs. And I know everyone watching on Facebook and YouTube appreciates it as well. Well, we appreciate being here. Uh, you know, a lot of people I've seen these dogs over the years and uh, we look forward to being there next year. Well, we'll see you and the dogs then. Look forward to that. And I'm gonna turn it over to Eli Berry who is going to introduce our next speaker. Thanks again, John. Thank you. Hello everyone. Welcome back to Mofka's online Common Ground Country Fair here in our pop-up TV studio in the exhibition hall here in Unity. Uh, I'm really happy to be here with you all. Uh, my name is Eli Berry, as Anna said. I'm on the board of directors of MOFCA and I'm on the chair of the Fair Steering Committee. And I've had the honor for the last decade of working with the group that puts on our fair. Um, and despite all the challenges this year, we're persevering with a completely new format for us and uh, I hope you're all enjoying the offerings. It's a little different than usual, but, um, but we're all here in our same capacities to help. And uh, unlike some fairs where we offer a real feast, I think this year we're more canning up the goods to be distributed the, the rest of the year at your pleasure and at your pace. So I'll take this opportunity to encourage you all to join if you've not been a member before, this is a great time to join. If you have been, this is a great time to renew. And we really look to all of you to help widen the circle of, of members and to grow our community. Um, we also have a tremendous offering from the Common Ground Country Store, which I am standing next to some of and modeling some of the fine products that we have. There's a back catalog from our inventory in the past and um, lots of offerings from this year's uh, Bee Bomb inspired uh, design. And one of the real perks of being involved on the Fair Steering Committee and the board is we have the opportunity to help pick the designs, all of which are, are volunteered and offered from our 
wonderful membership base and we get a tremendous offering of art every year and uh, this year's no exception. So I encourage you all to look at the offerings on the online country store. And um, I'd also like to thank our sponsor, which is Whole Foods, for their uh, generous support of our efforts this year. And I uh, encourage all of you to support them and all of our sponsors this year. Uh, we have uh, a whole lot of different offerings this year for um, your pleasure and unlike most years where we're all cramming it into the day that we have with this year's format one of the advantages is we can pick and choose and uh, take it at our own speed and pace there's an awful lot out there i encourage you to get into the fair.mafka.org website and uh, check it out so next i have the opportunity to introduce a a dear friend of mine who will be taking us through the uh, not that difficult, but sometimes challenging um, aspect of water bath canning. Her name is Amy LeBlanc. She is from Whitehall Farm over in the Farmington region, and she's someone I trust greatly with her uh, as, a, as a grower, as a teacher, um, and as a fellow member of my fair steering committee that I'm so happy to work with. So Amy will be taking you through the ins and outs of water bath canning and um, she is going to be able to answer some questions after a short film, and we will be going to that shortly. Hello, and thanks for coming to my talk about basic water bath canning. I'll talk about the whole process, including safety information, and most importantly, developing routines so that every canning excursion is successful. I've been a gardener, master gardener, small farmer, and now market gardener for more than 40 years. And over the years, we've learned to love the simplicity and wonderful variety of the foods that can be created with simple ingredients and then preserved with water bath canning. There's a mystique about canning that is really exaggerated. After all, we are all here literally because our ancestors used food preservation methods, including water bath and open kettle canning, to get through many a winter in good health. In the spirit of those pioneers, it is indeed a pleasure to look upon rows of jars of tomatoes, condiments, fruits, jams and jellies, and pickled foods that are literally the fruits of our own labor, and we know where our food is coming from. 95% percent of home canning is common sense. The other 125 percent, well yeah I know that sounds silly, but it's about knowing the basics, understanding safety measures, choosing versatile recipes, using good ripe ingredients and developing a routine and oh my sticking to it. There are hundreds of books about gourmet cooking and only a few about good basic home canning. And to tell the truth, the ones I trust the most are from the 50s, 60s, and 70s. I'm sure that's partly because that's when I began canning and we have some really favorite recipes. But I also feel that currently there is confusing and conflicting information that breeds unfounded fear and preoccupation with safety and cleanliness, rather than focusing on healthy food sources, good canning practices, and the resulting healthy bodies. There's also unnecessary hype about food safety and sell-by dates and use-before dates, which frequently encourage families to automatically throw away food products rather than to evaluate them using common sense first. In reality, your well-canned foods will last a long time. Here's the important stuff. Some foods are great for water bath canning and others are not. And a basic understanding of food pathogens will make it possible to make good decisions and to forge ahead with water bath canning, knowing that the results will be both safe and tasty. And to top it all off, there's that satisfaction in heaven of having done it yourself. Choosing the right foods for water bath canning is important. 
foods that have a naturally high level of acid and those that have had enough acid added to decrease the pH value to 4.6 or lower may be preserved using the water bath method. Naturally high acid foods include most fruits, like these little plums, including all those that can be made into jams and jellies with the addition of sugar. But even contemporary tomatoes should have an acid like citric acid or lemon juice added to ensure safe canning. Foods that must be acidified include pickles, relishes, salsas, etc. All acidified food recipes that call for vinegar are calibrated on 5% acidity in your vinegar. This means a lot of veggies are not suitable for water bath canning, like corn, beans, and beets. Unless they are acidified, they must be canned using a pressure canner. So let's talk about the pathogens. The pathogens that cause food poisoning are real. However, home, food, home canning can be done very safely, and with some basics, you can close the door on pathogens. The main pathogens are those that cause botulism, salmonella, and very rarely E. coli. Since these organisms are ubiquitous, it is important to follow routines that will always render them ineffective, as in dead. Here's the actual process. Water bath canning involves heating the jar and the contents to a high enough temperature and holding the temperature there long enough to kill pathogens. It's instructive to read newer canning instructions like in the annual Ball Blue Book and use the recommended processing times for similar recipes that you might find in older cookbooks. The water bath process heats the air in the jar, making it expand. When the jar cools after processing, the remaining air shrinks and therefore creates a vacuum seal sealing out air. And the resulting lack of oxygen in the jar then prevents any growth of pathogens. The function of the headspace recommended in most recipes is to create the right amount of air at the top of each type of product so that there's a much better chance of creating a good airtight seal. The liquids and recipes vary, and the headspace needed depends on the composition of the liquid. For example, jams and jellies with sugar typically need a quarter inch headspace. Most pickles need a half inch headspace. It's also necessary to have all the food in the jar covered with the canning liquid, no skimping. And now on to good equipment, tried and true recipes, and good ingredients. Good simple equipment is all that is required. It is necessary to have a good one to two inches of boiling water above the tops of the jars, so a deep enough kettle is needed. A lid for the kettle will speed the process. Stainless steel ladles, spoons, bowls, heat resistant spatulas, a good wide canning funnel, a jar lifter, and enough stainless steel kettles to cook the product are all you need. Use real canning jars as they are designed to take the heat and abuse in the water bath. And always use new lids to ensure a good seal. Rusty rings? No matter. They should be removed for storage anyway. New rings should be saved for gifts or sales. Old ones will do just fine for home canning, actually, over and over again. Good knives, cutting boards, and some simple tools will help with prep. We use a squeezo strainer from Homestead Helpers. For seedless fruit and tomato prep, a good food processor is also a good idea, if only for the time saved. I think the first time I made bread and butter pickles with my first Cuisinart, the machine paid for itself in one batch of pickles. 
Good colanders and plenty of stainless steel bowls are great. We've also fallen in love with our manual mincer chopper. It's out almost daily for dinner prep and has been invaluable for garlic, onion, and pepper prep for many canning recipes. We use a very old jar lifter originally sold by the Kerr Company. It works with one hand and you cannot put a jar down unless you do it on purpose. And since I have very small hands, that old one works better for me than the newfangled ones. I actually have to use two hands to make these work. Choosing recipes can be a lot of fun. My rule is to read recipes wherever or whenever I find them. And when I salivate by simply reading the recipe, that recipe will get a try. Try some of the favorites from your older relatives and don't be afraid to ask for the recipe when you taste something wonderful, no matter where you are. Always use ripe and wholesome ingredients. The fresher the better and with no spoilage. And remember that the vinegar called for in recipes must be 5% or higher acetic acid for safety. All recipes, even older ones, are formulated with 5% vinegar in mind. Gather every last bit of equipment if you even dream you'll need it. Have a few extra jars, count your lids, and really figure out the sequence of things for your recipe. There's a wonderful French term used by chefs. Uh, it's mise en place. It means to have everything in its place, everything at hand and right at the ready. A wonderful term for the canning process. This includes preparing and pre-measuring all your ingredients, including those little bits of spices. Now on to the routines and how to stick to it. It's very important. The routines will ensure that you don't skip a step and have consequences. The sequence for each canning product is affected by the recipe, by how many ingredients need to be prepped, and by the timing of all the steps. But the actual water bath canning process stays the same. Read the recipe, plan and prep, gather equipment, and sterilize the jars and lids. Cook carefully, following the recipe instructions. Fill your jars carefully, always respecting the headspace that is specified. And as a last example of good routines, always wipe the rim, the top of the jar before lidding. If you skip this important step, it's simple, but a seed or a bit of tomato or a cucumber could prevent the jar from sealing. And of course, last but not least, tighten the rings firmly. No need to get too enthusiastic, firm is just fine. And after the right amount of time in the boiling water, you should start your timing when the water begins to actually boil after you've put the jars in. You'll take your jars out and it's time to hear the satisfying ping as the jars seal. You can test the seal by seeing and feeling that the lid is depressed in the center. Well canned and well stored foods will keep for years. Be sure of every seal and remove all the rings. If something were to go wrong inside a jar, the lid will pop off and you will know right away that the contents should be discarded. Leaving the rings on can lead to broken and spilled jars as well as potential health problems. Find a cool, dark place that's not damp. I hope you've gotten a better understanding of the life and times of food pathogens and that will help demystify canning recipes and the process for safe canning and that this will give you a clear go-ahead to preserve foods for your family. Collect good simple equipment. Start with simple recipes like canned tomatoes, applesauce, or jam, or dill pickles. Then expand your repertoire and enjoy.
You can download my handout, which includes a brief bibliography of some of our favorite recipe sources. Then get on with creating wonderful preserved foods. And thank you very much. We're live. All righty, thanks everybody. Uh, we're gonna have a brief break before we get to the Q&A and we're gonna go to one of our sponsors. As a proud sponsor of the Maine Organic Farmers and Gardeners Association, we want to express our support. My name is Bill Whitmore, and I lead the Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare's team here in Maine. While we won't be able to gather and see each other at the fair this year, I want to take a moment and convey our unwavering support for the work that MOFCA has always done and continues to do around our state. At Harvard Pilgrim, we're committed to building healthier communities, and we know that partnerships with organizations like MOFCA will help all of us move toward achieving that goal. Thank you and enjoy the programming this year. What is Kashi Tibet? Look at my dear, what a Jerkisha guy, Hanu Faili. Gantam Shires, one more of a Marcum, Ganyan, what a Jerawal Kuguel. That no Madi, what a Jerkisha guy, one of the Sukhara. I think co-ops are uniquely, and employee-owned businesses are uniquely well adept to help businesses transition from generation to generation. And I think for Maine in particular, that's a huge, huge problem that we have to solve. I'm not afraid I can remove myself if I have to, that things will still run pretty smooth. And so there's that investment in the next generation and from them to show that they can have the ability to do it. A lot of pride with that. <laughs> Wihi asaga hai ning hai nina kuso dara o korko kada na kala ekoro kada isa wa barashida ekoro kada isa bas hisukian ka ekoro kada isa bas dahgal ko eswahan ka ekoro kada isa wa kasto ya lega hela we had the man tell there's just a huge amount of plant material here that's just amazing when you think about it there's practical aspects to it but the magic is still what's in these what's in the seed itself. More and more food cooperatives are, are looking at how can we get more local food into, on our shelves or how can we buy more from uh, immigrant owned farmers and get ethnic crops onto our shelves. And so it's, uh, cooperatives are really looking at not only how do we grow or how do we create new cooperatives, but how do we really, really live our values as businesses and really transform the economy in the state. Newer cooperative uh, buys seed from Fedco. And once they get to us, they might get distributed out to, say, the Blue Hill Co-op, the Portland Food Co-op, Rising Tide Co-op. So there is a world that exists where we can have cooperatives in every facet of the food system. It's a one-week ride, but it's 550 meals a time, three, day, three times a day, that we're able to access 50 to 75 percent of that food from local sources within 100 miles of the ride. So we just really want to set that bar and say, no, let's go do this instead of talking about it some more. We wanted to open a 4,000 square foot, $1.3 million business. And I was like, how can this small group of people actually make that happen? And just over the last eight years now that I've been involved, watching it happen and realizing when people join together, really amazing things can happen. of our supporting members who make this work possible year after year. Welcome back everyone. Uh, we're here for our Q&A with Amy LeBlanc. 
Hello, Amy. Great to see you. Hey, thanks. Nice to be here. And we've got a whole bunch of questions here. Uh oh. Just jump right in because I bet there's going to be a lot about okay. supporting members. Um, we have a question from Eric on Facebook asking Sometimes my jars leak or vent a little after removal and cooling. Why is this happening? Oh, that that does happen. Welcome so, back, everyone. Uh, we're here for our Q and A with Amy. Is, uh, Hello, Amy. Great to see you. Hey, thanks. Nice to be here. Um, and we've got a whole bunch we've of got questions double here. Going here. Uh, just I jump right why. in because I bet there's going to be a lot about supporting yeah. members. Uh, we have a question from Eric on Facebook asking. Eli, there's two things going. My jars I'm sorry. Leak. You're hearing a, a second after removal and cooling. Why is it audio? Oh, that that does happen. Welcome so, back, everyone. Uh, we're here for a Q and A with Amy. Is, uh, it's looping. Hello, Amy. Great to see you. Okay, thanks. Nice to be here. Um, and we've got a whole bunch of questions here. here. It's looping. Just here, jump right in. They're, they're working on it, Amy. I'm okay. I'll field you another question in a minute. On Facebook asking, hey, is my jars leak? We're hearing a, a second after removal and cooling. Why yeah. is it audio? Oh, that, that does happen. Welcome back, everyone. We're here for a QA with you. It's Lupin. Hello, Amy. Great to see you. Thanks. Nice to be here. And we've got a whole bunch of questions here. It's Lupin. It's Lupin. So we're going to have a, a little moment before we get back with Amy. And uh, I just want to take this moment to thank you guys all for being here and encourage you all to look at all the offerings that we have at fair.mofka.org. And those of you that have found your way in, there's much to navigate and um, a whole year's worth of things to look at. Uh, take your time with it. You've got no rush. There's no time limit. And... Um, while you're in there, do, do look at our offerings in the country store. We've got wonderful products available and think about joining. We're always counting on membership during the fair and this year is no different. Um, we're gonna switch over to Anna in the country store. Hi everybody. Thank you, Amy, for that great presentation about canning and thank you, Eli. I know so many people started new gardens this year after COVID and we hope they are growing beautifully and that you have plenty of produce to can up, hopefully with some tips from Amy. And we also have tons of great recipes in our MOFNG archives on the Mofka website. So go there as well and look up some great new things to try in the kitchen this fall. We coming up soon have a presentation on backyard chickens from Crystal Sands of Sand and Farm. And I know other than gardens, lots of folks got new flocks of chickens this spring. So hopefully you'll get some great tips from her as well and continue to grow your homesteads, grow great food for yourselves and your communities and your families. And we're glad to be able to support you in that effort through this weekend and all year round. We have great educational programming throughout the season and we hope you'll become a member and join us for that as well. And we'll head over to Crystal now. Got chickens? Now what? Basic chicken care for beginning chicken keepers with Crystal Sands from Sands Inn Farm and Farmerish Journal. Hi, my name is Crystal Sands. Thank you so much for being here for this presentation. My hope is that it will at least get you started in your thinking about your new chickens and hopefully will stimulate some questions. I've been keeping chickens with my husband for six going on seven years. And then before that, I was researching chickens for years because I just knew I wanted to keep chickens. I've learned so much. I'm a former academic, so I kind of apply all my nerdy research skills now to farming and chickens and I just, I love them. They're fascinating. And we have on our little homestead slash farmerish place, 
we have learned how to use our chickens and, and be friends with our chickens in a way that we have a relationship where we work together towards self-sufficiency. And um, I hope you enjoyed this presentation. I look forward to chatting with you afterwards in the Q&A. So there's really so much to cover when it comes to basic chicken care, but this is a very short presentation. So this is my goal. I am going to just go through very basically the things that you need to consider when it comes to basic chicken care. I'll highlight the key things that I think will help trigger either some further research on your part or some questions for the Q&A section. So when it comes to basic chicken care in the short and sweet, these are the things you need to think about. What are my housing options? And what can I do to make sure that my flock has a safe, clean, dry place to live that is secure from predators? And you do have a lot of options for that. For us, we have an old shed that we converted into a coop and it works wonderfully, um, but there are many options for housing. You also have many options when it comes to runs and fencing. You do also want to make sure that things are secure and that um, you have enough space for your, for your flock. This leads to questions of free ranging and this is such a great question. If your chickens can free range, they're going to be able to eat bugs, scratch around, and live this like healthier chicken life in many ways. However, there are risks to free ranging. One of them, and I would say maybe just one of them being predators. I can't tell you how many stories I've read on the internet about the neighbor's dog getting to a flock and just taking everyone out. Um, so there are definitely pros and cons to free ranging neighbor disputes come in. What we do is we have a very large fenced area. So it's about three quarters to a, to a full acre. And this is a kind of like the best of both worlds for us. So it's fenced to the chickens. I think for the most part, it feels like they're free ranging. They get to go into some woods. They get to scratch around. They get to eat lots of bugs. We get great eggs out of it, um, but they're all in a fenced area. If you can do something like that, it is fantastic. Not everyone can though. So I would just make the argument for always use fencing of some kind. If you are going to free range your flock, only do it when you're sitting there watching them. Other things you need to consider are nest boxes, food, water, nest boxes. A good rule of thumb is to have one nest box for every four to six hens um, that you have. You have options on food. You can buy the layer pellet. You can get organic. You can make your own food. The biggest thing I would say is make sure it's always clean. Water, same thing. Change their water every day. That's just a part of our like religious process of, of caring for the hens every day. Every morning when we get up, the water is cleaned and it's changed. And this really helps prevent a wide variety of health issues. Treats, you can do treats. Be careful that you're not giving them too many. You don't want your hen to get too many fatty treats because there are some health problems that can come from that. Some people say never do treats. I feel like life's too short for a hen to never get treats. I also use treats to help build a relationship and trust with my flock. They know me. They know I'm the one who gives them the treats. I'm not a bad person. So that whenever I'm having to do health inspections or do something that they do not want me to do, like check their vent or check their feet, um, they're a little more okay with me, I think. Um, just make sure, of course, that the treats are safe. Um, our chickens eat a lot out of the garden. They also eat, we make a lot of bread. They eat our leftover bread. Chickens are great with table scraps. They love it. Um, just make sure you avoid things like garlic, onions. Um, also, um, we feed our chickens a lot of tomatoes. You may hear that 
tomatoes are not good for chickens and that's actually not true. It's actually the leaves of the tomato plant that are dangerous for chickens. Be aware that there's a pecking order. It is the pecking order that keeps the structure and organization in your flock. Sometimes it can be tough to see when you have some girls who are at the bottom of the pecking order and it just seems like life is tough for them. I do my best to make sure that the underdogs always get like a little extra treats. Um, roosters. I'm a huge fan of having a rooster. You do want to make sure, of course, number one, that roosters are allowed in your area. <laughs> they are not allowed in all areas. They will crow. And it's not like they're just going to crow in the morning. They're going to crow all day whenever they feel like it. And so you do want to be aware of the, the laws and ordinances related to roosters. Also, if you are going to keep a rooster, make sure that you have at least 10 to 12 hens per rooster. It is dangerous to a hen's health to constantly be mated and mated and mated. They lose their feathers. It starts to weigh on them. Um, and I've seen people tell stories of, of hens who eventually die from overmating. Now you will, I'm sure, inevitably know someone who has two roosters and two hens and they all lived happily ever after. I would say they're very lucky. <laughs> you really do need 10 to 12 hens per rooster. And then last but not least on my hopefully short and sweet list is make sure that you're doing health inspections regularly of your with your flock. Chickens are very good at hiding their illnesses and even with health inspections you're going to miss stuff but do your best to keep an eye on them. Now, I wanted to spend a bit of my time for this presentation talking about preparing for the winter because that's coming up for all of us. So you wanna make sure, of course, that your coop and run are prepared for the winter. People who use runs will wrap their runs in um, tarp or plastic to keep the wind out. You do wanna make sure that you are making good decisions about ventilation of course um, in your coop and so what this means is you don't want drafts so you want really good secure walls and doors and things like that but you need ventilation in the top and the amount of ventilation you need will vary depending on the size of your coop and the size of your flock and so you will get lots of different advice about what you need to do my best advice is to watch and pay close attention if you start to see that things are like a little wet and damp from the moisture of the hen's breath or if you keep water in the coop and it's just too moist in there, you know you need more ventilation. That moisture in the winter is very bad. It will cause um, respiratory issues in your flock. So you wanna make sure you have really good ventilation. You also have options when it comes to bedding and litter and insulation. And when I'm talking about insulation, I'm not talking about insulating the walls of your coop, though some people do do that. We do have that in our coop, but it's not really necessary. But they do need some way to keep warm and snuggled. Now they have their own natural insulation with their feathers, um, but we use straw, which doubles for us as bedding, litter, and insulation in the winter. It works wonderful for us. However, some people have pointed out that straw is not the greatest litter. You have to clean it more often. And I wouldn't argue with that. It's just that for us, we compost the chicken poop. It's gold to us. It's how we um, fertilize our garden the next year. So we don't mind on that. Um, sand is a really good litter from what I've read, but in cold places it's not adding any warmth and so you know these are things to think about you got to think about water and food frozen water of course is the biggest issue in the winter people use heated bowls or heated waterers and i would say if you're going to be away from home then you have to do something like that because of course you have to make sure that your chickens have access um, to, to fresh clean water. 
For us, we work at home and so we are able to check the water several times a day and change the water if necessary several times a day. So what we do, and I'll show a video, we use rubber bowls, we bust the ice, and then we put warm water from the house um, into, the, um, into the bowls, into the waterers, and because we're using warmer water, it takes a lot longer for it to freeze. And so most of the time in the coop, we do keep water in the coop. We have a large coop. Some of our chickens don't leave the coop. Um, in the winter so we have to keep water and food in our coop not everyone does if you don't or if you have a small coop and you just can't keep water and food in the coop then of course it goes in the run but the same basic rules will apply you can use warm winter treats to help add to warmth we use at night cracked corn right in the evening right before they're about to roost up and go to bed we give them some cracked corn they love it don't give them too much, <laughs> but give them some and it'll help them keep warm. And then of course that leads to the heat or no heat question. Again, you're going to get so many bits of advice when it comes to this. I would say for the most part, you do not need heat, even in a really cold place like Maine. And it's because the chickens come with their own insulation. And if you have a nice, dry, safe coop for them. They're going to huddle together and they're going to be okay. The few exceptions I would say is like if there are like really sudden temperature drops, like sudden. Um, and then for us, we do when things get pretty far into the negatives, we will add heat in our coop then. I don't know if it's necessary, um, but our chickens have never had frostbite anywhere. So there's that <laughs> but if you add heat never use a heat lamp we use an oil-based ceramic heater so that it's not hot to the touch just to be safe we cover it with a crate so that there's no way a chicken or straw can touch that thing um, never use a heat lamp they are really dangerous when it comes to fires and again, I'm sure you will hear someone tell a story of using the heat lamp every year for 20 years and, and never having any problems, and that's certainly possible. But they are a known fire hazard, and so it's, you know, it's something to think about. Last but not least, do you add light or not? There are pros and cons. When the chickens go into the winter, with, when the light goes away, it puts them into a rest in terms of laying eggs because light is how the hens make the eggs. And so if the number of hours of daylight that they have drops, then of course egg production will drop. You can add a little bit of light. Some people add a lot of light. The, the thing is if you do add light, um, I would recommend just a little um, because the rest does help extend the life of the hens like it really does kind of you know add to their overall health when they have that rest and I'm sorry my dog is growling <laughs> but if you are dependent upon eggs to feed your family um, then you know you might want to add a little bit if you do add light make sure that you add it in the morning and you add it 15 minutes at a time we used to add light to our coop the last couple years we have not and just to give you a, a kind of a guide we keep between 25 and like maybe 27 or 28 laying hens Gus, hush i'm recording um that's my great pyrenees <laughs> so we have between 25 and 28 laying hens and in the like darkest of it uh, between like thanksgiving and the winter holidays we would get like maybe two to three eggs a day so those are things to think about we have a really um, large coop it is an old shed that has been converted to a coop and it's over there um, but the key thing is is that every day they need access to fresh, good, clean water. So in the winter, this becomes more of a challenge. 
If you have a small coop, you'll have to keep your water in the run and at night it will likely freeze. And so what we do is we use a rubber bowl and this is one of them. Um, and it's nice because it bends and what I do every morning in the winter is flip it over and bust ice. Um, there was actually a little bit of ice this morning already and it's September so I'm like oh it's coming. Um, so this is the rubber bowl. We use a big tractor supply bucket food grade and then you just drill holes and then we flip it over and I'll show in a minute what it looks like. Here it is all set up ready to go for another day of chicken drinking. I wanted to quickly touch on the topic of eggs because that's one of the most exciting things about keeping chickens is you get these wonderful little gifts that feed you and your family and they're they're wonderful. Um, but a lot of people start worrying, when is my hen going to start laying? And it really depends. Some breeds will lay as early as 16, 17, 18 weeks. Other breeds won't lay until much later, 22, 23, 24, 25 weeks. So don't panic if your hen is late to lay. It doesn't mean that something's wrong. It can also be dependent upon the light. If you have a hen who isn't old enough to really start laying before the light starts to fade in the fall, sometimes when that hen starts to lay will be a lot later. So it's light dependent and somewhat temperature dependent like extreme temperatures will impact laying if it's really hot or really cold. Um, but for the most part, as long as there's light, hens will lay. There are some annual cycles, so don't panic if your hen stops laying for a bit. There are many reasons that they rest in the fall when it's time for the molt. They will not lay. In the winter, if it's dark they're and cold, they're gonna take that rest. The spring is the busy time. That's when, of course, you know, they want to make babies. So the eggs will really kick in. Summer is usually pretty good unless it's really hot. Um, especially if you are like me and in Maine, I keep breeds that are really winter hardy. Um, but that means that summer takes a toll. So when it's really hot, they will take a break. Very quickly, I just want to run through the 10 tips I have. This is the best advice I could think of to give to someone who's just getting started. Number one, never let up on clean food and water. Just be relentless with that. Number two, take advantage of all the ways a chicken can help you and your family. We compost a chicken poop. It fertilizes our garden. The chickens feed us in this way too. They're tick patrol. We use them to prepare our garden in the spring. We use them to glean the garden in the fall. There are so many benefits of keeping chickens that, well, I could talk a long time on just that. Um, <laughs> number three, do regular health inspections. Number four, I learned this the hard way last year, always quarantine new chickens. I knew the rules, I broke the rules, I paid. <laughs> always quarantine new chickens. Um, number five, practice biosecurity. Wash your hands, clean yourself up after you've been um, hanging out with the chickens um, and have separate shoes for the chickens. Don't wear your chicken shoes in the house. Six, know that they're very smart, really smart, sometimes shockingly smart. Um, number seven, understand that they're very resilient, almost too much so. You gotta watch them. They will hide their health problems. Number eight, find really good resources and be careful what you read on the internet. There's so much misinformation out there, it's exhausting. And that leads me to number nine, which is find a mentor if you can. Someone you know, someone whose flock you can see. You can see that this is working for them and they have a healthy flock, find out what they're doing. And number 10, just let yourself enjoy them and be changed by them because Maybe you will. I know I have been. Thank you so much for being here. There's so much more I could say. Hopefully we can cover more in the Q&A. I just want to encourage you to please visit my journal. It's www.farmerish.net. There we talk chickens and a wide variety of other topics such as making, cooking, farm animals, and other farmering topics. Thank you.
Well, hello, everyone, and thanks, Crystal, for that great presentation, and apologies to those listening for our little Zoom challenge earlier, but we'll talk to Crystal about chickens for a few minutes, and then we'll circle back to Amy to answer those canning questions you had. So thanks all for your patience, and thanks to Crystal and Amy for being here on this beautiful afternoon to help folks gain some new skills and learn some new techniques for their gardens and homesteads and backyards. So Crystal, thank you again for talking to us about chickens. I know a lot of people got new backyard flocks this right. spring. Right. Have you been talking to lots of folks who have new chickens this year? Yes, yes. I There's a lot of, of new people and I think it's exciting that so many people are, are getting interested and getting started. And I think, of course, it's important. There's a lot of information out there to try to process. And so it's important to do, I think, your best to try to keep things straight and try to make a plan. Um, and, and there is a lot of information. <laughs> well, that is a great point. And actually, reminds me of a question we wanted to ask you, which is if you have favorite resources for folks who are starting out and might want to have something going on, they want to look up in a book or online, any trusted people you learn from? I would say um, when I was first starting out, I used a lot of Lisa Steele's um, work from Fresh Eggs Daily. Um, and that kind of was a lot to, to get me started, to get me going. Um, there's also um, some great guides, like the Stories Guide to Chicken Keeping is also a really good one. And then um, there's some online resources as well. There's the, uh, on Facebook, there are a couple of groups where you can get a lot of really good help and advice. One is the Maine Poultry Connection, um, and another one is the Maine Chicken Enthusiasts, and, and both of those, are, I like that they're so focused on Maine because a lot of questions I have found are really relevant to where you live in in the world and you know how preparing for winter for example varies so much here in Maine compared to some friends I have who are keeping chickens and farming in Alabama. Yes we have our own own cold winters and uh, own predators lots of things to think about. Right. right. We're getting a couple questions, Crystal, about um, washing and cleaning your eggs. I know fair weekend is often when my pullets will start laying their very first eggs of the season. Maybe that's true for some other folks too. So how do you clean those eggs and store them after you? Okay, so first of all, it's important to note that you actually don't have to wash them. Um, they come freshly laid with the bloom on them. Um, and that is a protectant that keeps bacteria out. Um, if you don't wash them, they're fine to be kept on the counter um, for even up to a few weeks. Now, we sell some of our eggs and our customers do want the eggs washed. Um, and then sometimes too, you just, you know, you have a poopy egg and, and you've got to wash it. Um, and so what we do is just very, very minimal um, washing, uh, but just keep it clean. We use a very, very mild soap. A lot of people say do not use soap. We use a very mild um, or organic kind of soap that's not too bubbly. And we, we do store ours in the refrigerator. If you do wash them, they need to be refrigerated immediately because they've lost that protective bloom. But you don't have to wash them. They, if, unless, you know, someone you're selling to wants them washed, they are, or you want them washed. Wonderful. Thank you for those tips. Hopefully helpful as folks start getting some eggs in there yes. on their counters. I wonder if you have any recommendations. This is a question from Andrea who's listening for a breed for a first time chicken keeper. Oh, this is so great. I would say to, oh, there's so much to weigh, but I would say if you are in Maine, make sure that you choose a winter hardy breed. Um, one of the things that you will find is that, you know, silkies are wonderful, adorable chickens, but they don't have the same kind of featherage that, uh, or plumage, <laughs> feathers and plumage that, um, a, so like a breed like a Rhode Island Red will have. I am very partial to Rhode Island Reds, Barred Rocks, 
um, buff Orpington tins, um, kind of like the thicker, sturdy birds. Um, Rhode Island reds are also really great, fantastic layers. Um, so that, you know, it is something, of course, there are pros and cons to fantastic laying breeds, of course, but some, uh, like a sturdy breed uh, is, is a good one to start with here in Maine, I think, one that's going to be able to handle the winters better. That makes total sense. We have cold weather for those chickens to deal with coming right up. We have a question that came through on Facebook about um, making your own chicken feed. We have not made our own chicken feed yet. This is something that we are looking into. Um, I, I think especially in probably March and April when we were seeing like a little bit of concern about shortages um, with some of the, the feed at it was never too bad in our area, but there were some shortages. Um, so I think that there are a lot of different recipes out there. Um, it's one of those things where I think for us, a factor is access to those grains that you use. So like what we're looking at is the, like the multi-grain where there's, you know, dried peas, dried corn, but also um, some wheat and barley and those kinds of things. And I, I, for us, one of the challenges is getting access to those grains without having to have them shipped in um, from far away. Um, but that's something that we haven't tried yet. We've been sticking to layer feed, uh, but it, it is something I think a lot of people are thinking about. Thank you for that, Crystal. And you'll have to let us know if you give it a try. <laughs> yes. We have a question from Hannah on YouTube, and Hannah's wondering if you can keep layers and meat birds together or if you need to separate them. All right, I would say it depends on the kind of meat bird that you get. Um, there's the Cornish cross, um, and those as meat birds are going to grow up a little differently than like we have always used the Freedom Rangers or some you'll see them called like the Red Rangers. Um, we have done some mixes when we've had the the Freedom Rangers, um, and and things are fine. Um, is I guess the rule would apply just as any rule would apply. And that is, it depends on the ages of the chickens that you're keeping together. If they are the same age and are gonna grow up together um, to a certain point, then that is just fine. Um, if, when you're mixing flock ages, then things get more complicated. Like, will they be able to access food? Will they get picked on? Those kinds of things. So in a way, theoretically you can, but then of course there are other factors to consider. And I would say probably most important is age because obviously if you're raising meat birds, you want them to have access to food all the time and you don't want them getting pecked away from the food dish because, um, you know, then you'll have birds that grow slow, more slowly. That makes perfect sense. Thanks, Crystal. And we do have one last question here. And someone is wondering um, what you do on your farm to help prevent predators. Well, for us, it's really about fencing. Um, I am uh, a big believer in fencing as much as you can. I am very regular in the chicken forums and there are so many incidences of, of predator attacks and even it, like sometimes it's just the neighbor's dog um, that will just come in and take out a flock. Um, so fencing is very important and then just making sure that your coop is sturdy, um, making sure that there are no holes in the floor where things can come in. Um, you know, I think that to a certain extent there's you know only so much you can do i i've found some people who've done everything you're supposed to do and they still you know have a predator we had actually had a bear um in our coop one year it it got in but thankfully it just ate the chicken food um so it, it wasn't interested in the chickens it just ate the food um but i fencing sturdiness um and then you know trying to think like a predator as much as you can. We have had hawk attacks. We have a very large fenced area. And so just trying to make sure that there's lots of coverage places for your, your chickens to duck and cover um, as much as possible is important. 
Well, thank you for that, Crystal. And thank you for sharing your tips and wisdom with everyone today. I'm sure everyone learned a lot to help take care of their flocks going into the cold weather here. So thank, thank you. you again. And we're going to switch over to Amy um, and answer some questions you all have about canning. So thank you, Amy, for being with us this afternoon. Good to see you. And thanks for your presentation earlier. We did have a bunch of questions um, come in that maybe you can help answer. We have our first one, similar to our first question for Crystal. Do you have some favorite canning books and resources you would recommend? Um, my most used book is the uh, Leonard Lewis Levinson book, the complete book of pickles and relishes, because it basically covers the, the bases. The only problem is that it's out of print. And we have a lot of favorite recipes and I recommend the book all the time. And it usually is available if you go to Amazon or other used book sites on, uh, on the internet. Wonderful. So a little research, you can find that one. And another question about some books and resources is the Ball Blue Book, a, a long time classic. Would you say the 1994 one is still accurate for safety standards? That's a good question because safety standards have been changing and I think they're a little bit over the top in some ways, but also things like tomato products, uh, contemporary tomato plants, uh, the fruit of contemporary tomatoes is sometimes lower acid. And I think as a safety, it's good to follow the more, con the, the more contemporary ball blue book timings for water bath canning especially if you're using old books and there's nothing for water bath canning. Good tip. So take a look, see what your book says, maybe compare it to a book your friend has from a more recent year and, and go from there. So Eric on Facebook is wondering about um, a challenge he has sometimes when canning. Sometimes his jars vent or leak after they are removed from the water bath and are cooling. You have any idea what might be going on there? Well, sometimes I think it's, yeah, you had a little too much liquid in the jar. Uh, that happens to me sometimes and I really do need to move on and say, okay, is it always dilly beans or is it always dill pickles? And start to take some notes because um, I, I, really do think that if the jar actually seals, that it's going to be just fine. Good tip. And good tip to just be taking notes so you have an idea for next year if you need to. Oh, exactly. Thing. So we have a question here from someone who has some old family recipes um, that don't call for processing in a water bath. Do you have any ideas about how that Lisa should can those recipes up? Absolutely. Uh, one of the most common instructions is to just simply turn your jars upside down uh, after, the uh, after a water bath or just turn them upside down with no water bath. Um, I would suggest taking a good look at the ingredients and try to find a similar recipe in a contemporary book and use one of those um, water bath recommendations. Now, I do have a, another suggestion, which is once in a while, there's one that just, you know, it goes ping, 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 and all but one sealed. Uh, if that happens when I'm working on canning, I take that one jar and I do flip it over, but I surround it with other hot jars. And frequently, that one will actually seal if you give it enough time to cool. And then if it doesn't, I put a big X on the top, put it in the refrigerator and eat it first. 
<laughs> That's a great technique too. Might as well enjoy some of the fruits of your labor right away. Absolutely. Yep. <laughs> Um, let's see, Quinn uh, is wondering if there are concerns with using non-organic produce in canning, maybe things you buy from the grocery store. Absolutely not. But you know, ripeness is paramount. If it's ready and it's beautiful and you can make sure that you can, like I would wash a lot of things, like I would wash zucchini seriously before making zucchini relish. Uh, but I would suggest that most things from the grocery store are fine. Well, thank you for that, Amy. And thank you for sharing your tips. I'm hoping everyone is filling up their pantries with lots of delicious canned goods from their gardens or from farms nearby. Thank you for sharing your wisdom with us this afternoon. And we're going to go over to Eli to introduce our next speaker. Thanks, Amy. All righty. Bye-bye. Hello, everybody, and welcome back. Thank you, Anna, and uh, thank you, Amy, for the information there. We're going to transition now over to Daniel Mays, who's a farmer that's doing a lot of no-till food production. And it's something very exciting in the world of agriculture. No-till is a great way to protect our climate. It's one of the critical ways to do so. And Daniel has been doing this for a long time, has had a lot of, done a lot of experiments and is doing some great work. Um, I have a personal interest because I do a lot of no-till in the tree nursery operation that I have at home. So I'm really excited to hear from Daniel. And I thank you all for joining us here today. Um, Daniel will be coming up shortly and we can go right to them now. Thank you. Hi, I'm Daniel Mays from Frith Farm in Scarborough, Maine. Excited to be presenting at the virtual Common Ground Fair. Um, this presentation is on no-till vegetable production. Um, so I'll just jump right in. Uh, first, an acknowledgement that I'm farming on Abenaki land. Uh, there's a long sordid history of, of farming on this continent that, that relies on stolen land and, and stolen labor. And I think acknowledging that um, is a kind of crucial first step toward making amends. So um, you can find out whose land you are on with the link in the slideshow there. And I'll carry on. I started Frith Farm here in Scarborough 10 years ago. Um, I, with the help of Maine Farmland Trust and the Scarborough Land Trust, I um, purchased uh, 14 acres um, on, on Ash Swamp Road here in Scarborough. And uh, it was about five open acres of hayfield and a uh, sort of condemnable house. Um, and I had very little experience at the time. I had uh, less than a full season of farming experience, but I had lots of energy and enthusiasm. Um, and it's been a, a great process of learning by doing. Um, and now 10 years later, the farm uh, is, is doing well. Um, we are three acres of no-till vegetables, herbs, and flowers. Um, we do pretty much all work by hand a little, little bit with a walking tractor, but uh, we're pretty much farming at a human scale um, on three acres with nine full-time seasonal folks, including me. Um, and we sell through uh, natural food stores, um, a 200 member CSA, uh, our local farmer's market and a small on-farm store. Uh, so the farm's come a long way in, in 10 years and I've you know, learned a thing or two about trying to grow without tillage and uh, going to try and share that with you here. Um, and first, I want to talk a little bit about the values of the farm, um, what sort of guides our practices, and then we'll jump into the nitty gritty of, of how we do things. Um, so, of, of, you know, in looking of, at uh, how to farm well, I think there's really only one proven model, and that is of uh, nature, if you will, of, of wild spaces, of, of places that humans haven't intervened in, in significant ways. Um, and 
um, and yeah, those those wild spaces can can show us, you know, how sort of natural principles of caring for the for the land. Um, so looking at you know trying to extract some of those principles, I, I come up with with four basic ones. Um, one would be uh, to minimize soil disturbance, and and that's why we're a no till farm. That's you know tillage is a really intense disturbance of the soil. Um, in nature, you really only see soil disturbed. Um, you know, in that kind of way during a natural disaster, you know, hurricanes, tornadoes, landslides. Um, so that's not really something uh, we might want to mimic every year on our farm. Um, so by minimizing soil disturbance, we allow, you know, that ecosystem to remain intact and, and thriving. Um, the second principle would be uh, keeping the soil covered, um, so protected from the elements um, protected from the sun drying out, protected from the rain erosion and wind erosion, um, and just keeping that nice uh, habitat there for the soil food web. Um, so that's covered with plant material, whether whether living, dead, or or both. Um, and the third principle would be uh, just prolific diversity. Um, when we look to wild spaces, we see a huge number of species uh, sort of living in harmony um, and providing all sorts of functions to each other and to the ecosystem as a whole. Um, and then the, the, the last or maybe main principle um, would be to maximize photosynthesis. Um, photosynthesis is the engine that drives the soil food web. Um, that solar energy getting pumped down into the soil is, is the only way to create soil. Um, it's how we have all the soil we do on this planet. Um, so, so by maximizing that, we, we maximize the, the life and vitality of our, of our farm. So looking at those principles, how do we fit those into uh, vegetable production, which is kind of inherently unnatural in, in terms of, uh, you don't really see fields of vegetables growing in, in wild spaces. Um, but we can look to those principles of, um, you know, minimize soil disturbance so try to avoid tillage wherever possible um, keeping the soil covered that's sort of a, a basic uh, minimum of never seeing the soil so we, here we have uh, you know complete soil coverage whether with leaves in the paths or compost on the beds um, and then the goal is to get as much diversity and photosynthesis in there as possible um, so again here you never see the soil there's there's just complete soil coverage, and if the soil ever starts to show through, we add more mulch. Um, and yeah, and then maximizing, you know, photosynthesis and diversity. Uh, this photo, you know, shows an interplanting of basil and tomatoes. And believe it or not, there's a path in the middle there that you can kind of squeeze through, but, uh, but really trying to just cover that soil with as much photosynthesizing diversity as possible. That's kind of what what drives us um, to, to farm well here. Um, and then, uh, yeah, another example of, you know, cover crop of sorghum Sudan grass um, next to a perennial planting of, of flowering um, bee balm and, and goldenrod. Um, so just, yeah, that diversity and photosynthesis, uh, lack of soil disturbance and complete soil coverage, that's really what, what drives soil health. Um, so yeah, getting into the nitty gritty of, of how do we go about this, you know, growing vegetables in this way. Um, here's how we establish new beds from sod. Um, you know, starting with a hayfield or pasture. Um, these are the steps. These are, you know, I've tried it in various different ways, but these are kind of the steps that if you have the time to do this, um, this way, I've found it works pretty well um, for jump-starting soil health and, and getting a yield relatively quickly. Um, so I should say we're a no-till farm except for when we form the beds initially, going from sod to beds. Um, I've tried it in a number of ways without tillage, but I, I am an advocate for, you know, tilling that one last time to form those beds, I think is a worthwhile trade-off um, to get those beds producing sooner. So here, here, this is uh, very much tillage. Uh, this is the rotary plow on a BCS walking tractor. Um, so we, we do primary tillage with this. This was pasture. Um, you know, till it up and then 
that since that rotary plow ejects the soil to the side, you can make a pass up and down each path and you have sort of nice raised beds. Um, not shown is uh, that we spread a, a lot of compost and soil amendments um, before tilling um, to kind of, you know, build up the, the soil minerals and balance the pH um, and get some, some organic matter mixed in there. Um, so, you know, since it's one time tillage, it's kind of that one time opportunity to mechanically mix in those amendments to, to jumpstart soil health. Then we, uh, once those beds are formed, we tarp it. So we, we drag on um, silage tarps. Um, they're like six mil polyethylene tarps, black tarps, and we leave that on for um, long enough to smother the sod. So that will depend on the time of year and how hot it is. But, um, you know, if you tarp during the summer, that might just be three weeks or, or you know, three to six weeks, somewhere in there, um, depending on the species you have in, in that field. Um, when the tarps come off then, we spread a layer of um, compost on the beds. Again, trying to keep that soil covered at all times, um, you know, pulling that tarp off, that's, that's exposed soil, that's, you know, fragile, you know, exposed to the elements, so we want to get that covered as soon as possible. So we do a layer of compost on the beds and wood chips in the path. Um, and you can use whatever mulch material you have um, on hand, whether it's leaves, straw, wood chips, um, what have you. So, but the compost on the beds is pretty nice, is pretty key to be able to then plant directly into it. Um, Cause we then seed a cover crop mix that will, uh, that will winter kill. Um, that means it'll die back in the cold of winter. So that, that mix could be any number of species of cover crop as long as they all die reliably with the winter temperatures. Um, and since these are direct seeded right into a layer of weed-free compost, there's very little weed pressure. Um, and especially since, uh, since these beds were tarped before the compost went on, a lot of the weed seed, you know, was, was maybe it started to germinate before the tarps went on, or maybe the tarps just got hot enough to actually kill the, that top fraction of an inch layer of, of weed seed. Um, but when we pull those tarps off and then spread a layer of compost without disturbing the soil again, we really get super low weed pressure so that you can seed this diverse mix of cover crops. And maybe, I think we walked through it one time just to look for any errant weeds, but basically it was completely weed free. So that's the cover crop coming up. And then this is in the late fall, um, you know, it's waist high diversity of, of, of species there and it's ready for grazing. So if you have any livestock, you can run them through there and really, um, you know, amplify the, the biological effects of that cover crop, um, you know, with the animal's manure and just that symbiotic relationship between grazing animals and, and grasses and legumes. Um, and then this cover crop will winter kill, it'll die in the winter and these beds will be ready to plant the next spring. Um, you know, early. So, so that's kind of my preferred method for starting establishing these beds um, from pasture. Uh, it does involve tilling one time, but it also really jump starts the soil health. And, you know, that next year when you're ready to plant your first cash crop, um, those beds should really be high performing. So once the beds are established, um, how do we go from there uh, without, you know, tillage? It can be as simple as just pulling, you know, harvesting a crop and putting in the next crop. It doesn't have to, you don't have to do anything um, depending on what that first crop was. So lettuce heads, for example, the, these two beds on the right were lettuce heads. They got harvested um, and then we just gave it a light rake to smooth out any sort of unevenness. And then we direct seeded carrots right between the stumps of the lettuce heads. Um, so that, you know, it can be as simple as that. Um, if there's soil starting to show through the compost, then we would add just a little bit more compost so that that's always that seamless soil coverage. Um, so, so yeah, no-till can literally be just, uh, you know, just remove that whole step of, you know, bed prep um, from, from your task list. Um, it does require that you keep the bed relatively weed-free, um, you know, the, for the previous crop, so you're not dealing with a lot of overgrown weeds and weed seed um, 
that often is why farmers turn to tillage. Um, another example, if it is overgrown with, with you know, things like kale, um, or yeah, mostly it's brassicas, but, or things like summer squash that leave a lot of residues, um, we will flail mow first. So this is the flail mower uh, attached to that same walking tractor, the BCS uh, 853. And so we'll flail mow, which just chops up really finely and leaves everything on the surface. And then um, we might tarp for a little bit um, to make sure those stumps don't regrow. And um, that could be anywhere from two days if it's really hot and sunny to 10 days if it's on, you know, in the shoulder seasons and, and not as hot. Um, and then we pull those tarps off and just plant right through whatever residues are there. If the residues are super thick, so that the cedar wouldn't even push through, we might rake a little bit of them into the pathway just to get down to the compost layer so that we can get good germination when we seed. Um, and if you notice the picture, this was, uh, the previous crop, crop was arugula. We flail mowed and tarped it and then we pulled it off and then we direct seeded spinach kind of staggering between the stubble of the arugula. Um, you know, some farmers might look at that stubble and be like, oh, we need to till to get clean that up and create a nice, seed bed, but really we can just stagger the cedar over and get good germination um, without that soil disturbance. Um, and like I keep saying, anytime the soil starts to show through, that's when we'll add some more compost. Um, and we do that with wheelbarrows. We have a little tr tractor loader that never drives in the field, but does load the wheelbarrows at the head of the bed. And then, you know, the crew pushes them down and applies them right where needed. Um, and yeah, remember this is complete soil coverage at all times, which not only is good for soil health, but makes working in it a dream. Uh, you know, the soil is just always very soft, friable, um, dark, rich, easy to transplant. Um, and maybe the biggest benefit is that it's very low weed pressure because there's that constant mulch layer um, preventing weed growth. At the end of the season, um, we will try to prep the beds for the next season, you know, adding whatever amendments we want to add and then spread a layer of mulch. Um, we've done a lot of leaf mulch. Um, we're gonna be switching to more straw um, just cause the leaves are starting to get more and more trash in them. Um, but leaves work great otherwise. And, and so we'll mulch right over those beds with leaves. Um, these are any beds that it's too late to plant a cover crop, a fall cover crop. Ideally, remember the principles of soil care, uh, we would be maximizing photosynthesis, not just covering the soil with dead plant matter, but covering it with living plant growth. Um, but if it's too late in the season, like after your fall crops, uh, root crops come out in you know late October, November, um, that's too late to plant a cover crop, so then we'll just mulch those beds. Then in the spring, those beds, we just rake off that mulch into the paths to expose the compost underneath and we'll plant right into that uh, with no further prep. Um, if it feels really compacted from, you know, the weight of the snow or what have you, we might broad fork to loosen it up a little bit, but that's the extent of our, of our soil disturbance. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the sort of gist of the permanent raised bed no-till system. Um, and then um, it becomes about how much photosynthesis we can incorporate, how much diversity we can incorporate into that system. Um, so cover crops are a, a really great way to do that. Um, we get much more photosynthesis in general from, from cover cropping than we do from cash crops just because of the you know, the, the types of plants they are and, and the spacing needs um, for harvesting and stuff. So, so yeah, and cover crops can grow at times a year where, where most cash crops can't. So, so cover cropping is, yeah, really foundational to soil health in the context of vegetable production. Um, so, so, yeah, I'm a big advocate of, of treating cover crops like a crop, not like an afterthought once your crops are done. Um, we, uh, I try to plan for cover cropping as part of the crop plan. Um, you know, it, it gets all the same attention that any other crop would get. Um, we, you know, bed prep the same way. We seed it the same way with the earthway seeder. We irrigate it, we weed it, we treat it just like a cash crop. Um, and we're able to get 
you know, very healthy stands because of that. Um, so here are, you know, so much to say about cover cropping, but to keep it really simple, here are two scenarios, um, very basic, um, one being peas and oats, which are great to go in the fall where next year's early spring crop, crops are going because peas and oats reliably winter kill here in the Northeast. Um, so anywhere you're going to plant first thing in the spring, you know, things like carrots, salad greens, onions, what have you, peas and oats the fall before work really well. Second uh, scenario would be rye and crimson clover. Um, rye is a great uh, winter annual. It's super cold hardy, so over winters, I think down to minus 40 um, degrees Fahrenheit. And crimson clover just goes really well with it because they flower at about the same time the following spring. For us, it's the end of May. Um, crimson clover isn't typically cold hardy here in Maine, but I find that when seeded with the rye, the rye kind of insulates it a bit through the winter and, and some of that clover will survive um, and flower with the rye in May. Um, so yeah, and that works really well in beds that, will, that won't be planted until the following summer since that, you know, most of the growth of the rye <clears throat> and clover come in the spring. Um, we want to really wait and let them grow, photos, you know, do their photosynthesizing and wait and terminate them uh, once they get kind of dry and stockier in uh, late May, early June, which, you know, you'll see the process, then you have to tarp them for a little bit. So it's not until mid, mid June really that we're ready to plant those beds. So we only plant rye in beds that won't get planted again until mid June the following year. So here's our uh, peas and oats. And uh, that's what they look like when they're ready to sort of terminate, you know, they've, they've kind of maxed out their, their growing potential there and they'll start to die back pretty soon after that or they'll start, to, they'll start to set viable seed, which we don't want because that could then become a weed issue for the next crop. Um, so this is when we'll, we'll knock it down. We used to um, flail mow it with the BCS flail mower here. Um, which just chops it up really finely and leaves it right on the surface, which is great. But um, I actually don't like how finely it chops it up because then those residues break down really quickly. When in fact, I want a more sustained, you know, mulch material on the soil surface. So <clears throat> now we have uh, various methods to knock them down. Here's one. Uh, Here's one from the, that the crew developed all on their own a few years ago. Uh, I'm not sure this video will play. Let's see. Yeah, so we call that rolling, uh, rolling the peas and oats at a human scale. Um, that's, uh, you know, maybe you can't scale that up too, too far, but we, we've also come up with an alternate method of um, sort of stomping it down with a T-post, and I have more pictures of that later. Um, but yeah, I, I encourage you to try that rolling method. It's a, it's a lot of fun. There we go. And then we, uh, then we pull tarps over it. Um, since the, that rolling method and even our stomping method doesn't fully crimp the cover crop, it's, uh, it's good to pull a tarp over it just for a little bit of time to make sure it's fully dead because planting our next crop into a cover crop that's still alive um, is not going to give good results. So we tarp it um, usually for just a week. Um, if it's cloudy and um, cooler, then maybe up to two weeks. Um, and then when we pull those tarps off, we have this nice dried out uh, sort of, you know, pea and oat straw that rakes right off into the paths. Um, and that's that same P and note stand is the first picture. So when it's raked into the paths, you have these nicely mulched paths and you expose that sort of, you know, brownie batter <laughs> bed um, to plant into without any kind of soil work. Um, and these, I think we were seeding uh, storage radishes and turnips. Um, so there they are coming up and there they are in the fall um, and and yeah, we pulled maybe a few weeds from that whole area um, just because without disturbing the soil and because we have that layer of compost initially anyway, there's just very low weed pressure. Um, 
And this, granted, this is because we've kept up with this over time. If, uh, if you're starting with really weedy fields, this is not a silver bullet to cure that. Um, I think it can help, especially with tarping. Um, tarping and then putting, you know, compost as mulch um, is, a, is a way to get out of that, but it's still going to require, um, you know, a lot of weed removal as you get work your way out of that weed seed bank. Um, so yeah, that's the peas and oats uh, cover crop method. Um, I guess that was that was a spring pea and oat method, but it, same idea in the fall, except you wouldn't have to knock it down. The winter would kill it for you, and then you could just rake it off in the spring to plant your crop. So the next scenario, uh, rye and clover. Uh, this is, yeah, rye and crimson clover. This picture was taken, I think, around June 1st. Um, this, this stand was about seven feet tall, uh, and you can see the crimson clover flowering. The rye, you know, those seed, no, no viable seed is close to forming, but the, you know, it's in full bloom. Um, that's the, the base of the stalks start to get brown and dry out. That's, that's when it's ready to be knocked down. Um, I really haven't tried to push it any earlier because I want that full uh, organic matter production, um, that sort of lignified carbon mulch um, that Demi will, will plant through. So, so yeah, let's look at the steps we took to, to get to that. Um, this is after the onions came out the fall before. Uh, onions come out and then we direct seed with the earthway. One person has oats, one person has uh, rye, and they just stagger back and forth. Uh, you know, it's about, for this 6,000 square foot plot, I think we walk about three miles. Um, so, you know, it's good, good exercise as well. Um, but <laughs> that works so much better than um, broadcasting because we get a really thick uniform stand. So this is that same rye uh, maybe a month later um, and then again if you have livestock um, we have uh, we had turkeys so we ran the turkeys over that to add some fertility and give them a tasty treat um, and then but you don't want to graze you don't want to overgraze it because you want to make sure that rye you know grows back in the spring so so you know just run them through there quickly move them off and then in the spring we have uh you know, it grows up again to, you know, about six feet tall. And, and uh, this is end of May, right around June 1st. Uh, we knock it down. Um, this is, you can't really see it in the photo there, but there's a T-post, um, a five-foot T-post that we're, these two folks are stepping on in unison. And we just have a, a piece of string to hold the T-post on our foot. And they just step in unison and kind of, you know, crunch it down with the edge of that T-post. So it's getting a little bit of a crimp, but then to make sure that it, the rye dies, which is important, we um, drag a tarp over that, um, the rye, just for, again, for about a week, maybe two, up to two weeks if it's cooler. Um, we weigh them down well. Um, you know, we use concrete blocks. Uh, you could use sandbags, whatever, but make sure they're adequately weighed down it's a lot easier to move a few extra weights than it is to go chasing around a uh, you know 24 by 100 foot sail across the farm. Um, so yeah, use adequate weights, and uh, and then yeah, when that oh yeah, also note how far behind the peas and oats are here. I I wanted to stress that that often people it's tempting to just stick with peas and oats because they're so easy, so easy to kill. Um, they winter kill. But notice how far behind they are here. They're only, you know, calf high when the rye and clover was, was six or seven feet tall. And, and, you know, the amount of biomass that, that created in the spring is just so much more than these peas and oats have created at this point. So there's a real advantage to overwintered cover crops. Um, they're a little bit harder to manage in the spring, but their potential to, to generate soil health is, is much greater than the winter killed alternatives. Um, but yeah, back to the rye here. We we pull off the tarp and there's this nice uh, golden rye straw mulch uh, grown in place, still connected to the earth. And and then we just plant right through that, our transplants, um, whatever's going in, whether it's storage cabbage, Brussels sprouts. Um, we do our second succession of summer squash and zucchinis this way. We do winter squash this way. Um, you could do a, a slightly late planting of, um, you know, cucumbers or tomatoes 
this way. Um, the timing doesn't quite work out for you know that first early planting that might go in late May um, because this these beds aren't ready again until you know mid June. That's when that's the earliest we can really plant them with this method. Um, but it works for the you know those great the summer crops plant summer planted crops that then you harvest in the fall. So here's the storage carriage storage cabbage. Um, you know, later in the fall. Um, again, we pulled just a handful of weeds out of that whole plot and had really good yields. Um, no, no row cover, no, no pesticides, no, you know, I think we put a little bit of fertilizer in the holes as we transplanted through the, through the straw mulch, um, but, but very low input. Um, you know, this whole system, you know, doesn't rely on any machine, machinery, uh, very low input, um, since the straw mulch is being grown in place. Um, and then, yeah, just to stress integrating livestock where you can, especially on those fall, that fall cover crop time, um, since that will generally fulfill the waiting period over the winter uh, for organic production, you know, applying raw manure in the fall, then those, those beds are plantable in the spring. It's 120 days later um, by the time you harvest. Uh, and, and yeah, just the, the amount of, um, just thinking back to, you know, the principles of, of soil care that we see in nature, like this is, you know, complete soil coverage, no disturbance, um, you know, prolific photosynthesis and diversity, you know, we can put as, you know, as many species as we want in these cover crop mixes and then integrating the livestock adds just that whole other dimension of diversity, um, that can really generate soil health. Um, also wanted to, to note that humans are also animals. Um, so integrating humans into the landscape, I think adds a huge amount, even if we're not adding our manure to the land, I think we add so much just with our presence, um, that that's a key part of, of biodiversity on, on a farm. Um, so another way to, to get more diversity and, uh, soil coverage and photosynthesis into vegetable vegetable production is to um, to interplant or companion plants or multi crop and all these different terms for combining multiple crops together um, instead of just growing blocks of one species at a time. Um, so this is this is pretty challenging for vegetable production because there are all sorts of other considerations of you know efficiency and simplicity and management that that um, you know, interplanting can really make harder. Um, but I think, I think doing some degree of interplanting really increases the, the net yield potential of, of a vegetable farm, uh, let alone the soil health. Um, so here's one example of uh, kale uh, undersown to parsley. And we do that because uh, kale is a brassica and anything in the brassica or beet um, families um, does not support mycorrhizal fungus growth. Mycorrhizal fungi are, you know, fungus of the root, beneficial fungus um, that forms a relationship with plant roots and extends its reach into the soil and is a really amazing, wonderful thing. I'd encourage you all to read, um, read about it. Uh, Michael Phillips has a book called Mycorrhizal Planet. Um, there's Teeming with Fungi, which is also great. Um, there's all sorts of books coming out now. Our understanding of mycorrhizal fungus is really, we're just scratching the surface. Uh, it's a relatively recent uh, bloom of, of understanding. Um, but really, there's, uh, this is a real argument for no-till because tillage really destroys um, that mycorrhizal network pretty, pretty effectively. Um, whereas if we leave it in place, there's all sorts of benefits to the plants um, in terms of access to more nutrients, to more water, uh, to natural pest and disease resistance. Um, you know, mycorrhizal fungus is has been called sort of a natural communication network, uh, nature's internet of the way plants communicate with each other underground. Um, so yeah, there's there's a lot of magic happening under there where if we just grow a plot of nothing but brassicas or nothing but, um, you know, beet, things in the beet family, beet spinach, chard, uh, we can starve out the, the mycorrhizal network. Um, so we under sow our kale to parsley, which does form mycorrhizal connections. And uh, 
as as just an undersown cover crop. I mean, we can harvest it too, um, but it's it's really there to cover this so cover and feed the soil. Um, so another interplanting um, along those same lines, you know, Brussels sprouts we transplant right into the grown in place rye that you see there. Um, but they take a while to, to get big. So in the meantime, we plant a, a row of lettuce heads down the middle um, to, again, to offer the mycorrhizal fungus some, some, photosynth some photosynthesis, um, but also to get another crop out of there. Um, another example uh, in the high tunnels, planting the shoulders of the tomatoes to celery. Um, the shoulders of the cucumbers to uh, salad turnips or bok choy that, that don't need as much sun and heat, so they're a little bit shaded out there, um, but they do all right. And um, one of my favorite combinations is uh, carrots and ginger. We plant them at the same time, um, and the ginger kind of pokes up through the carrots. It takes a while to come up, and in the meantime, the carrots are growing, and then when it does come up, it pokes up, you know, through the canopy and, and um, then the carrots can pull out and give more space to the ginger when it needs it. Um, also, uh, yeah, onions and radishes. Um, the, uh, the combinations are, are endless and we've done some experimenting. Um, once you have this sort of weed-free system, um, it can get more creative with interplanting. It's a lot harder to do these kind of things if you have a lot of weed pressure on bare soil. Uh, here are uh, carrots on the shoulders of tomato beds outdoors, uh, spinach along the shoulders of the sugar snap peas. Uh, we just broadcast sweet alisum into the onions. Um, that sweet alisum is a great undersown flowering crop for beneficial insects. Um, has a very uh, shallow root system, so it doesn't tend to compete much, but provides but flowers all season long and, and feeds the, the little insects that love its flowers. Um, and yeah, we do sweet alisum between tomato plants, and then those are some beets on the shoulders of the beds. Um, there and uh, yeah, I mean the interplantings, the combinations are are endless. Um, again, it's it's creates management challenges, but I think it's worth experimenting with. To um, you know, in the past we would grow tomatoes and just leave the beds shoulders mulched, which was great for soil coverage, but it wasn't photosynthesizing. It wasn't producing more crop, you know, revenue. Um, so by uh, by branching out and doing these companion plantings, we can feed the soil better and you know, feed ourselves better too. Um, another way to get diversity into the farm is to incorporate uh, perennial plantings. Um, you know, most vegetables are annuals, um, but that doesn't mean we can't plant uh, perennials in amongst them um, to integrate that diversity. Um, so that's great for beneficial insect habitat. Uh, it provides a diversity of living roots in the ground year round, which you know is very hard to do with vegetable production. Um, it provides economic diversity. Um, you know, a lot of these perennial plantings may produce fruit or medicinals or flowers that you can sell, culinary herbs. Um, so it's a great way to diversify not just the life on the farm, but the, the economic revenue streams. Um, and they're just beautiful and, and that's pretty hard to calculate the value of that, but when when you have a crew of nine people or, or however many people and they're working around in a beautiful location, you know, how much more happy and productive will they be and, and you know, what's the value of that? Um, so we do a beneficials bed, I call them, uh, perennial planting between each of our plots. Um, we have sort of a plot system of every plot is 12 beds um, and then between each one of those plots we do a beneficial bed of perennial uh, flowering shrubs and, and uh, herbaceous perennials. Um, so they're in spring. And there's another one in the in the fall. Um, you notice we put birdhouses in there um, with holes sized for the eastern bluebird. We get those nesting each, each spring and summer. Uh, we get field swallows. Um, and the goal is to have uh, a continuous supply of nectar for the beneficial insects throughout the, the season, so from early spring through late fall. Um, so choosing a diversity of species to achieve that is, is the goal. Um, 
and it also means that there's just always flowering beauty on the farm uh, for us to enjoy. And, and these strips of flowers, you know, flowering beneficial beds um, help orient us on the farm too. They show where one plot ends and the next plot begins. Otherwise, it would just be sort of an endless stretch of beds. So they, yeah, they help us navigate the farm and they just create a, um, a nice place to, to live and work. Um, so yeah, looking at some of the shrubs, you might choose, um, I'm not gonna read these all cause you can read them off the slides, but uh, depending on how big you want your hedgerow to be, um, there's tall shrubs that are you know eight to 15 feet tall. Generally shrubs are about as wide as they are tall. Um, so, you know, plan ahead on that. You don't want to try to squeeze a 10 foot shrub into a five foot wide bed because you'll just have, you know, it'll start to overtake your crop beds on either side or you'll have to prune it aggressively. Um, short shrubs in the four to six foot range. Um, a lot of these are natives. A lot of these are great, you know, flowering, feeders of, of beneficial insects um, and uh, and a lot of them provide a, a cash crop um, you know harvestable cash crop whether it's fruit or, or medicinal use plant material um, and then there's this whole list of uh, the herbaceous perennials the ones that die back to the ground each year so um, listed here in in order of bloom approximately um, again you can read these yourself and and really finding what you know, what makes you happy and what, what is native to your region of the country and, and um, with the goal of just, you know, prolific diversity, abundance, and a continuous supply of nectar for the, for the insects, um, overlapping bloom periods throughout the season. And then the native grasses are great for overwintering habitat um, for, for insects. Um, often organic farmers try to reduce the overwintering habitat for insects since we think of insects as pests but um, I actually think that's a sort of a self-fulfilling uh, downward spiral of um, trying to reduce the life on the farm instead of increasing it um, because once you have enough life and diversity on the farm I believe pests become much less of a problem. Um, so yeah, fitting flowering gardens into nooks and crannies on the farm makes the farm a pretty place and then just, you know, adds that much more diversity um, to the landscape. Um, and then leaving areas unmowed or unmanaged for nature to decide what kind of diversity to, to insert there um, can go a long way. Um, and yeah, soil health, I believe is, a, you know, there's, there's no real way you know, we can define it in all these ways but really it's something intuitive that that you know when you feel healthy soil you know you know it's it's vital it's it's healthy it's ready to grow good food and you can taste it too in the quality of the food um so that's that's it for this slideshow um i uh also uh, i need to start plugging my book i i wrote a book this uh that's coming out this fall in november um so that's the cover there and some endorsements by other growers and you know I've put a lot of time over the last couple years into this project so um, you know a lot of what's in the slideshow and more is in there and appreciate uh, any support you want to offer or check it out if you want. Um, I look forward to the question and answer session um, during live during the Common Ground Fair. Thanks y'all. And welcome back. Thank you all for being here. And thank you, Daniel, for, for all of that wonderful uh, topic there, no-till gardening. This is Daniel Mays from Frith Farm, and he is here to answer any questions we have. And we've got a lot of questions, so I'm just going to jump right in. Uh, Daniel, we have someone from uh, Facebook asking about silage tarps. Cynthia would like to know, how long does a silage tarp last? Yeah, good question. I've had some for as much as uh, four or five years now, and they're still holding strong. Um, so that's all I can say is at least four to five years. Um, I imagine, I'm hoping I could get another four year, five years out of them. Great. And it's, it's UV that breaks them down, I would assume. Yeah, I think it's UV, but they are treated for, for UV, I think. Um, yeah. 
Great. Uh, we've got another question here from YouTube, and it's a little off topic, but um, specific to cabbage moth worms. Um, I guess storage cabbage, cabbage for storage sometimes can look great, but uh, cabbage moth worms, I don't know, that is a little off topic, but you probably dealt with it. Yeah, yeah, we get some cabbage moths. Um, I mean, yeah, I guess it, the broader question of what do we do with pests, um, and if, if there's a real pest pressure that I, that develops, we'll use uh, row cover um, to it, just physically exclude pests, but for the most part, I, um, I don't mind feeding a, a few bugs uh, as long as everything's kind of in balance and we're not losing, you know, a significant portion of the crop. So, so yeah, like that cabbage in the, in the slideshow didn't have any row cover on it ever. And, um, you know, we probably had a few cabbage loopers in there um, in the storage. And then we sort of, you know, cull those cabbages, cut off the bad parts, eat them ourselves. Um, but yeah, there was not much loss at all. Was this maybe a part of a concern that by not tilling, there's a issue with pests maintaining in the soil and we can't get around? Yeah, I think that's that's a great topic because I think that is a, a, a frequent concern um, with tillage sort of breaking up life cycle of pests. Um, but I would argue that it's also and maybe even more so breaking up life cycles of the good, the beneficial insects. Um, and the amphibians and everything else in that soil food web that can keep those pests in check in the long term. So I think breaking out of that cycle of, of you know, killing life in order to keep pests at bay can actually let the ecosystem start to develop and, and uh, you know, checks and balances build up so that pests aren't a huge problem. You know, they're not gonna go away entirely, but at least there'll be a balance of, of predation and, and um, population control. Great. Um, so you you said earlier, and we can tell by the by the video that you you use every inch of your uh, few acres that you're cultivating there and, and growing. Um, I, this is probably a common problem for folks. Uh, beds and paths kind of migrate sometimes of their own accord. <laughs> do, you, do you you have some way to keep it all straight? A grid? I don't know. Uh, lasers? <laughs> <laughs> no, nothing nothing fancy. I mean, we do raise the beds. Um, you know, when we form them. Um, so, and then we mulch the pads with, with either leaves or wood chips. Um, so that, that will last, I find, for three or four years. Um, and then as that, as that path mulch and, you know, the beds slump a little bit, the mulch starts to break down and then it starts to get hard to tell where the beds are, where the paths are. And, and then we actually do reform just a single pass up and down each path with the Berta plow just to kick up that composted mulch from the path back up onto the beds. Um, so it, it's not tilling the beds themselves, but it is kicking up that kind of reforming the paths. Um, and for that, we will lay out a measuring tape and put, you know, flags every five feet. So, so the beds, you know, stay evenly um, made. So the tape measure and the roll of string is a is a plenty of a tool plenty to have in the toolbox. Yeah, so that's a good one. Uh, when you are forming beds, since you know we only do it every four years or so, uh, it's yeah nice to get them right so that the tarps and the row cover and everything's you know fits on them uniformly. And you said you raise up the beds, and I think there is some confusion about what exactly a raised bed is. Uh, a lot of folks seem to think it's a you know belt high construction, um, which some certainly are, but I use the term about raising beds up just to def define them from paths and, uh, and, and create a, a, the soil that I want to be working in. And I think that's often what people mean and others might receive that as, I need to make a huge thing. I need to make- Yeah, yeah, I think, I think there's what the term means in sort of a, a backyard garden context versus in a, you know, farming commercially context, um, you know, I'm a commercial farmer. So for me, it just means the beds are raised, you know, a couple inches above the, the, the land as a whole. Um, and we do that just by mounting the soil. There's no, you know, borders to them. Um, but in the backyard, sure, some people, you know, build a whole, you know, wooden box and fill it with soil. Um, those are also raised beds, but I'm not familiar with those. Yeah. So uh, this is a common question, uh, I think, to a lot of us that, that use that use organic compost. Can you talk about your sources? I think we're all looking for more all the time. Yeah, this year was a weird one for sourcing uh, a lot of different things because um, with the pandemic, everybody, 
you know, there was a run on, on compost, on seeds, on canning jars. Um, and so a lot of those things have been hard to source. Um, but normally there are, you know, organic, uh, Mofka I think has a list of organic compost producers in Maine. There's maybe a, a dozen or so um, options. Um, I've bought a lot from Benson Farm in Gorham. Um, there's a newer company, uh, MB Bark, that, that supplies commercial compost. Um, we make some of our own compost too. It's a, you know, we don't have a commercial sifter um, or, you know, all the equipment to make, you know, perfectly weed-free compost. So ours is a, you know, a lower grade, but if you want that real finely sifted weed-free compost, you know, there are sources out there um, throughout the state. And for the other other sources like uh, wood chips and and leaves and stuff, a lot of that, are you getting that on your own? Property yeah, yeah. So wood chips and leaves, some we get from our own property, but we get a lot from our just sort of local community here. We're, we're in a somewhat suburban area. Um, so lots of competition between humans and trees. Um, so there's a lot of byproducts of, of uh, clearing and um, just maintaining power lines. So we get a lot of wood chips from landscapers, from the utility crew. Uh, we get leaves from our, our local town uh, transfer station. Um, and yeah, and you, and you know, I've bought some straw in too from farmers up north. Yeah. Uh, here's a question about intercropping plants. Cynthia on YouTube is asking, do you have any good resources for intercropping plants? Like um, resources of different combinations? Yeah, I think that it's more about the information about uh, which plants with other plants pairing and such, not sourcing as much. Yeah, I think there's there's a there's a lot of information out there, but a lot of it is sort of anecdotal or or um, you know, sort of legends of things that have done well. And um, I think I would just really encourage experimentation because what works for one person might not work for the other. The the logistics of timing and spacing yeah. are you know tricky. So figuring out what works what works with your crop plan and your personality and your soil, um, you know, try combining you know things that grow slower and take more space, combine those with things that are, are you know, faster and, and uh, can harvest before those slower, bigger things fill That's out. That's a great point. So in other words, with limited space, you, you can use the calendar year a little bit to open. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's all about orchestrating that, you know, time and space to, okay. to the maximum. Well, on, a sim on that note, uh, Matthew from YouTube is asking, do no-till farming techniques scale easily? And how can we move towards making this a feasible method on larger scale than just your small community farm? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Um, and yeah, it brings up a lot. So, so there are, it, some aspects of it do scale. Um, you know, Rodale Institute developed the roller crimper. Um, and then there's also the no-till seed drill. So you can sort of, you know, crimp down huge acreages uh, with the roller crimper and, and with, you know, the roller crimpers on the front of the tractor, the seed drills on the back and you can, you know, seed it, crimp it and seed it in a single pass. Um, there's a real potential for that in grain growing and in sort of more commodity vegetable cropping, um, you know, large scales. Um, but in terms of, um, you know, I, I'm a believer in, in vegetable, you know, the market garden sort of small scale community based um, vegetable production. Vegetables don't store and ship well, they're better consumed, you know, fresh and, and, and I just love the you know, community aspect. So that's very much my perspective, right. um, but certain practices do scale up. And I would assume that in that, that smaller end of the spectrum, like maybe going from uh, uh, several two foot beds to maybe like doing a half acre that again, your experimentation, trial and error on your part, what fits your schedule, your lifestyle. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it certainly scales up. We grow on three acres, um, you know, pretty packed. So it certainly scales up that far and, and I've, you know, farther. Um, but if once you start to get to tens and, you know, hundreds of acres, that's, that's sort of a whole different kind of farming. All right. Um, yeah, we have, you know, nine full-time people on three acres. So that's, that's kind of the, my magic ratio is three people per acre. Wow. So de depending on how much help you have, that's, you yeah. know, how much acreage you can grow. Well, with, it, with these styles, about community engagement, you need a community. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. 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 That's what I was talking about. Sort of integrating humans into the landscape too, is, right. is part of that biodiversity. Right. That's great. Um, 
Wendy has a question about gardening on a south facing slope and doing no till. Does aspect and slope make a big difference? I guess is the root of that question. Yeah, I mean, I'm sort of guessing here because my land is pretty flat. Um, but yeah, south facing slope, I think it's great. It'll warm up faster in the spring. Um, depending on your soil type, you can decide whether you orient beds, you know, on contour or slightly pitched so that they, the soil drains, you know, down the paths. Um, you know, clay soils on contour can just be dams and then your paths just, you know, fill up with water all season. Um, so, so yeah, but I, I see no, no reason not to grow on a south facing slope. That sounds good. Uh, out of curiosity, have you noticed um, different responses in no-till growing in this year with this such a, such a drought year? Are there are you, are you finding advantages to the no-till system with water? Absolutely, yeah. That's one of the real selling points of no-till in my mind is um, you're not breaking up that soil structure, that that capillary action that can actually wick moisture up from deep down in the soil. Those deep reserves, um, you know, when we till that up and turn it to powder, that that you know we break that capillary action. So it, then we rely on overhead rain or irrigation instead of the earth itself. Um, you know soaking up water to the plants. Yeah. Um, this is a good one. Penny from Facebook asks, where can we buy your book? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, anywhere, anywhere you buy books. Um, so I would encourage you to find your local book, uh, bookshop and order through them. You can pre-order through most bookshops. Um, or there's, uh, I think bookshop.com is an alternative to Amazon. Uh, Amazon has it as well. Um, but yeah, thanks for that support. <laughs> we don't want to give you all hard questions. <laughs> uh, so uh, another question, a question from Wendy about, um, this will be our last question, Daniel, about, um, oh no, this is from David about irrigation. Do, are you doing any irrigation? And if you do, do you, are you dealing with any increased salt or mineral concentrations from the water? Yeah, we do overhead irrigate um, sprinklers from a drilled well. Um, and it's, you know, the, our well water certainly has some minerals in it, but I haven't noticed any, any buildup in the soil. This year was certainly the most we've ever irrigated. Um, often in a good year, we, we irrigate very little um, because without tillage, you know, that soil really holds what water does come through precipitation. So. So no, I haven't noticed any uh, any mineral concerns with soil testing and, and overhead irrigation. Great. Well, I, Daniel, I think that's our last question. And uh, we really thank you for taking the time out of a beautiful Sunday when you probably should have been doing something. <laughs> yeah. No, it's a pleasure. Yeah, yeah, thanks for having me. Well, thanks for being there. Uh, Daniel Mays from Frith Farm. And if you have more questions about no-till, please uh, don't hesitate to um, Re look at the look at the video if you miss it again and and uh, track us down for more more answers to more questions thank you daniel yeah thanks you we're gonna go over to anna now hi everyone thank you eli thank you daniel for that presentation and being here with us on this beautiful sunday afternoon at the common ground country fair Eli and I are wrapping up our time with all of you, but it's been so wonderful to spend some time with you from this far distance. Some of my favorite moments at the fair of the Sunday afternoon, just soaking up the sights and smells and tastes, taking that home with us for the next year. We have a little family tradition on Sunday afternoon where my mom leaves through the North Farmer's Market and buys all the ingredients for a potato leek soup that she makes the next week to um, enjoy over the coming days. And we'll continue that tradition this year. Can't buy from our farmers here at the fair in person, but I'll dig some potatoes from the garden and pick up some leeks and milk from our local farm stands. And I hope you're all supporting your local organic farms this weekend and all year round. One way you can do that, if you haven't yet, is to go to fair.mafka.org, and there's a farmer's market section there, along with many other great vendors. You can support them 
with your dollars this weekend and through till January 8th, so plenty of time. And we also have a great map on the MOFCO website if you would like to learn of a new farm to support or look up a particular farm product that you're searching for, you can look for it right there and support your local agriculture systems here in Maine. If we all spent just $10 a week on local organic food, that would put $676 million into our local agricultural economy. So that's a great way to make a difference. And we hope you do that. And that would support lots of great new farms here in Maine and convert a lot of acres to organic agriculture. So we hope you support your farms in that way. While you're at the fair website, you can also go to our little country store, pick up some great t-shirts like you've seen folks wearing throughout the weekend. And there's lots of other great gear there from past fairs. We hope you support us in that way as well. Next, we'll have Ryan and Sarah as your MCs. I'm lucky enough to work with Ryan here at Mafka, and you might recognize Sarah from her music on Friday at the fair. Before that, we'll have a presentation from Tim Libby, who volunteers with us here on our Low Impact Forestry Committee, one of many great volunteers we have working on the fair weekend and all year long here at Mafka. So we thank him. We thank all of our other volunteers. When Tim's not with us here at Mafka, he works for the Midcoast Conservancy, and you might have seen him at the Hidden Valley Nature Center. If you ever go for a walk or hike over there, he tends to the forest and cares for those many acres, so you might see a familiar face. This afternoon, he'll be demonstrating with his chainsaw how to fell a tree, so you'll learn some great information from him. Take that home to your own woodlot to Grow, cut some trees this fall and winter, and he'll be here to answer your questions afterwards as well. So thank you to Tim and Ryan and Sarah. Thank you to all of you. If you haven't yet, the fair.mofka.org website will be up for many months, so go to the store and check out all the great educational content that's there for you as well. Thanks, and we'll go to Tim now. I'm Tim Libby. I am involved with Mosca's Low Impact Forestry Project, and this is the open face directional felling demo. Everything that you see here will be part of a larger chainsaw safety course. We offer two a year through Mosca's Low Impact Forestry. If you are interested, check out Mosca's website. Okay. So the first thing we talk about is our safety gear whenever using a chainsaw. Start with my Sawyer's helmet. It's completed with head protection, intact face shield, and hearing protection mounted right on it. It's very convenient. I have my cut resistant chaps on, and I am wearing steel toe boots today, okay? With good heavy tread for traction, okay? The chainsaw itself. All right, this is a modern, smaller style, professional size saw, but there are many models around like it. But there are a few very important safety uh, features that you should keep in mind. Number one, I think, is probably a working chain break. Okay, the chain break's designed to be engaged with two hands on the saw. Anytime you take a hand off the saw, the chain break goes on, okay? Anytime I take more than two steps, I put the chain brake on, okay? Underneath, a chain catcher to shorten the distance of the chain in case it comes off the bar, all right? Throttle lock right here that, that works, working throttle lock. The only way you can engage the throttle is if you have your hand fully engaged around the rear hand hold. Forward hand hold is connected to the saw, okay? So those are a few important safety features of the saw, all right? So, when coming out into the woods to do our job out here, we want to take in all kinds of information all the time. Um, so one of the first things I like to do is 
assess what kind of hazards are in the area. And there is all kinds of hazards, and uh, they can depend on the season. So a lot of a lot of forest work is done in the winter time. So there's often ice and snow. All right, limbs on the ground. If you're working in the same area for a while, you might be piling slash up. So footing is often a problem. I always like to take a rugged stance, embrace myself when I'm walking around. Okay. Wind is a considerable hazard, all right? If uh, you see treetops swinging back and forth, you might decide that's not a good day to go work in the woods, all right? Uh, other trees, uh, trees in the way of your tree that you want to fell, those can be hazards. Dead standing trees or snags can also be hazards. If there was a snag or a dead tree leaning up against this one, I would have to take care of that first. Any tree in the radius of your, fell, of your working area that is dead is also considered a hazard, okay? Large glacial erratics, uneven ground, logs in your direction of fall, those can all be hazards too, okay? Looking up at the tree itself, I don't see any considerable dead trees in the way. There is a poppels next to us here that, has, that is partially dead but I don't identify that to be a concern now. This is a pine. They often have dead, spindly, dry branches that can fall when the tree is moving. Those are a hazard, but when the tree actually does move, I will be away from it, okay? The workstation itself, I'm gonna to wanna to clean this up, but that can be part of the plan for later. So now, this is the tree here that we're gonna to remove today, okay? And I want to know first, which way is this tree gonna go under its own power? Which way will it go with gravity? And I like to assess it from two vantage points as a quick, quick way. So if I stand here and look up, I can see that there is a slight lean in this direction, okay? And there is a slightly more branch load oriented in this direction. If I come over here about 90 degrees, I can see a small crook in it, but it evens itself out and is more or less straight here. And I see, still see a little bit of a branch load on that side of the tree. So maybe this tree would fall this way under its own power. It can be really hard to tell with pine, especially when it grows in close quarters with other pines around it, they tend to grow very straight. But I have a very cheap insurance here, okay? So if for whatever reason I misjudged which this way this tree will fall, I'm gonna put this in the tree and I'll show you how to ensure that this tree will go the way I want it to fall and I will not lose my saw in it, all right? So now I need to know which way I want this tree to go because it's not always gonna go the way it wants to go because other trees can be in the way, might not be good access if you want to get a log out, or you might not want to drop it in the road or whatever and clean it up. So I want this tree to go this way, and it does happen that it is going to go on our road here, and I will have to clean it up, but that's the way it goes. So I'm going to get it to shoot between the canopies of these trees around it, all right? And I can aim, and I will. And I'm going to aim right through this canopy at a point out in the distance. I see a tree out there that I'm going to actually aim at, okay? And I can aim with my saw. Many saws have witness marks on them that are either relieved or raised in it. I actually painted one on here, okay? This is 90 degrees to my bar. So if my bar is cutting into the tree and my open face cuts, all right, I'm aiming, looking right down my avenue of fall right at that thing than the distance that I've aimed at. And I can be pretty accurate, all right? So now that I know that this is my direction of fall here, as soon as I release this tree, I need to escape. So 45 degrees away from the direction of fall, okay? That way, it's gonna be about right here. I'm not gonna fuss too much with the angle, but I wanna not get away from the tree directly behind it. 45 degrees away from this direction of fall. Three, four good steps. I'm behind a couple of large trees here. I will be safe when that tree begins to fall, okay? I will not be standing next to it watching. 
Okay. Now that I know all that, I can think about the cuts themselves. And this is a good thing to go over in your head before you make the cuts so that you know what they're going to look like you can try to shoot for that. And it's a good way to teach yourself. So there's a handful of cuts. The first cut is going to be a top cut. I'm going to cut this tree low because if it's a good tree, I'll get a log out of it and I want it maximized. So like I said before, I'm aiming. So I'm going to start this tree this cut at an angle like this, because I don't want to go deep into the tree right now. And while I'm beginning my cut, I'm watching my aim until the bar gets deep enough into that cut that it's stable. And I'll stop at about 10% of the diameter of the tree. So if this tree is about 10 inches, which it might be, I'm going to go in about an inch deep, all right? I don't need to go that much further. Then I'm going to take the saw out I'm going to hold it at an extreme angle, okay? Holding the saw level so that when I cut in, I'll make those two cuts neat, all right? About the same distance, and I will remove the open face notch, okay? That notch should be 90 degrees or greater so that the tree does not, so that the open face is not closed before the tree hits the ground, okay? So now I have that open face notch removed. I'm going to take my saw at this kind of an angle so that it does not kick out of the tree. This is the kickback corner of the bar right here because of the direction that the chain spins. If I touch that to the tree, it's going to kick it right out. That's dangerous. But this side of the bar can be used for work and can draw the saw into the tree. So I'm going to come back here way away from my open face. I'm going to push into the tree. And once it's in there stable, I'm going to come around here and so that the bar is parallel to my open face notch. And I'm going to bore right into the tree. Stop. I'm going to come forward. I'm going to set up my hinge. My hinge thickness, at least when looking at it from the side, is going to be about 10% again, the diameter of the tree. So about an inch. Okay. Then I'm going to come back to about here. And I like to stop at an angle. All right. And then pull my saw out leaving these fibers intact. I've severed all the fibers in the middle of the tree, except for in the hinge and this back strap here. Take the saw out, the tree's still stable and standing. I put in a wedge from back here at this angle, right? Because I'm gonna be working from here. If I need to drive this tree over the with the wedge, and I can if I need to, I'll have my ax right here. I'll drive it right in, okay? So that was a lot, and it's going to be hard to see, but I'm going to cut the tree down quick, and then we can take a look at the stump, okay? All right, so I'm going to start my cut. So first thing I'm going to do, too, I didn't mention, clean up my workstation. If my footing is not good, I will work my way through. I'll remove small trees. I'll remove debris. This is in the way. I'll cut that down. All right, if it's a nice tree, I might actually do this kind of thing. But we've got plenty of little pines out here, so I'm going to cut that and make my working area safe. All right, here we go. Start the saw with two hands on it. Two points of contact, I put it under my leg like this, so it, no throw starts, okay? <laughs> Back up. 
Now's a good time. Make sure everybody is in a safe place. Your friends, your dog, whoever. My last cut's going to be to remove this, either a little above or a little below my wedge, okay? And there it goes. Now you see how I'm not running back. You may notice, maybe you can see up in the canopy here when you do this at home, there are still limbs that are moving up there. Those dead spindly pine branches I told you about, they can continue swinging for a few moments and fall so we don't rush right back. Okay, so here's the stump. So the first two cuts, okay, top cut, bottom cut to meet it. You saw, you see this tab here, that's a little bit of bypass and I, you saw me clean that up a little bit so I had a nice clean open face. This is right about 90 degrees, maybe slightly more, so that's good. Okay, I can set this here perpendicular to that open face and my aim was pretty good. Okay, I went right down the road where I wanted it to go. Okay, so my first two cuts, I scored a little bit of a line here on the side of the tree, okay? And you can see my, fall, my path of the saw path right here. I bored in about that deep so it wouldn't kick out. And once it was in there and stable, I came around here, all right? And I bored right through the center of the tree like this, parallel to my open face, or my hinge or the open face, right? Came forward to about there, I stopped. My hinge might be a little bit thick, okay? Maybe I could have gone a little bit smaller on this tree. And then I came back, and I stopped right about there, okay? Pulled the saw out, brake went on. I left this piece attached. This was all still attached here. I set the wedge in, okay? Then I made this cut right here to release the tree. And over it went. Now I gotta clean it up. All right, thanks a lot. I'm set. <laughs> Hello everybody, this is Sarah Trenzo coming to you from Mafka's campus. Um, thanks for sticking with us through that uh, great video about safely felling trees, which featured Tim Libby, who's here with us in the exhibition hall. Um, if you've got any questions following that video, um, either looking for more details or looking for a little bit more on that topic, you can go ahead and punch them in in the Facebook comments and we'll be able to answer them in real time with Tim right now. But for now, I just want to say, Tim, that was awesome. Great. This is a really, I think, a really helpful video um, for getting folks the lay of the land of how they can manage some of their woodlot issues on their own and safely. That's the idea, yeah. So part of what you do with Mafka, uh, I know you wear many hats in this community, but part of what you do is um, working with Low Impact Forestry mm -hmm. Group. So can you talk a little bit about what the goals of that program are and what you guys are up to as the year progresses? Yeah, well, uh, we are approaching our traditional um, November uh, forestry workshops. Um, and. We usually offer chainsaw safety uh, course, a mechanical logging course, a draft logging component, and uh, a introduction to forestry. So we, usually that's November. We, we spend a lot of time getting ready for the fair um, and do felling demos for the fair as well. Cool. So those are programs to help people who are like beginner, advanced. Who are those programs for um, as they run? Anybody that wants, that wants to get cool. involved. Um, but we get a lot of uh, uh, landowners, new landowners, mm -hmm. folks that want to learn. What, I like to use the word responsible for stewardship. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So for somebody that's um, totally new to using a chainsaw, to managing their woodlot, are, do you have some tips that you would share? I mean, I'm thinking in particular around things like safety or equipment needs that might um, 
keep somebody too intimidated to get into it on their own. Yeah. What are some of those first steps that people could take? Well, I, I think a great first step is the Chainsaw Safety course. Mm -hmm. um, and my, the felling demo I do is only a small component of it. But a major component of Chainsaw Safety is the personal protective equipment. Mm -hmm. And so that ranges from steel toe boots or Kevlar line boots to Kevlar line cutting pants, cut resistant pants and a Sawyer helmet system. Yeah. All of it is stuff that we saw in the video. Yes. Um, and was that, de was that demo being done right here on Mafka's Woodlot? Yep, we have uh, Woodlot, yep. And uh, that's where the, the uh, felling demo was done. We have a, uh, yep. We have a woodlot that's being managed with uh, low impact forest principles. I was just going to ask about that because um, for those of you who have been to Mofka's campus, and I assume that a lot of you have when you're coming to the fair on a normal year, um, you can see like agricultural methods in demonstration on the campus and also some forestry methods in demonstration. And so like for next year, when people hopefully are back here, what can they look for in the forest that demonstrates that it's a space that's being responsibly managed? Yeah, well, um, it has trees in it. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> the, uh, one of the gates into the fair is called the Pine Gate, and it goes through the Pine Lot. And um, it's a old pasture regenerated forest that we have thinned. And uh, one of the things that excites me about low impact forestry or the the methodology around it is uh, a continuously closed canopy as one of the forestry practices. So if you do go into the woodlot, you will notice that it is stocked with nice pine. Mm -hmm. uh, the pine lot does have a lot of pine in it, so that is like the featured tree. But yeah. through our principles of, um, or through our practices of thinning to encourage the growth, growth of the nicer trees or better pine, um, we are also encouraging uh, other species to grow as well. Where it had been only pine growing there before, now there's a regeneration of oak and maple and some fir. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so we're, we're trying to uh, shoot toward diversity. So why would, and it's a little bit of a redundant question, but I'm gonna give you an opportunity to answer it. Why would a woodlot owner want that diversity of trees, either for environmental or economic reasons? Both, <laughs> absolutely. A healthy forest is, is better off all around, in my opinion, yeah. And so, wildlife is one, um, so cool. having, having more than just one species, and there are many benefits more than I can really go into now for having yeah. diversity in the woodlot. One thing that occurs to me, though, is like having a, if you have that diversity of trees, then you have the possibility of harvesting it for timber or, or um, for firewood, yeah. um, and so potentially like income streams, mm -hmm. as well as meeting your homestead's needs. Yes, all of those. Different, <laughs> and so are different species of trees kind of like, and keep in mind that we have like all different kinds of people in the audience. Um, so some people who may be really familiar and some people who are total newbies to this world. Are there certain species of trees that you'd be directing at different types of uses? Oh boy, uh, yes, Briefly. For, diff <laughs> for different types of uses. And I, I should yeah. plug the forestry component here, and I am not a forester, um, but there, there, forestry is a science, it's a discipline all on its own, yeah. and a lot of that you uh, can get into very much in depth. But um, yeah, it really depends on what you want to do with a woodlot. You can manage a forest for anything to just leaving it alone and let nature do its thing. You, you can have a, a priority toward timber, saw timber yeah. someday, firewood, wildlife, recreation. Cool, so kind of the sky's the limit and like to a certain extent it's up to the stewards goals. Um, mm -hmm. And then of course working with what they've already got in that natural ecosystem. Yes. So some of you may know, I mean Tim today as I said is wearing his low impact forestry hat um, and safety hat um, but literally and figuratively his safety hat. Um, but Tim's also a very, very skilled uh, vegetable farmer. Um, and we farmed together for seven years running veggies for all. Um, is, are there some principles from soil management, um, crop management, that world, ag world, that you bring into your um, woodlot management and forestry world? Yeah, 
Yeah. Um, what are they? That's, well, <laughs> I, that's why they I use the term stewardship. Yeah. Um, uh, it's easy to apply um, the organic concept in, uh, uh, to uh, the arable land stewardship, if you will. Yeah. Um, so if you consider yourself a steward of the land in that sense, um, you can also be a responsible steward, I think, in the forest as well, all of the landscape. And it's like a holistic thing. Like you're thinking about the, the critters and what's going on with the soil and yeah. maybe even what income streams are coming yeah. in. It's mm -hmm. holistic. There are some questions coming in. Um, did you suggest, Tim, that it's possible to fell a tree against its natural lean? Yes, yes, to a certain extent, but you can. And that, that is what the wedges are for, so that you don't pinch your saw. Cool, and there's probably a, entirety of <laughs> that, more that could be talked about that but it is possible to do one yes. other question that's coming in is do you have recommendations about uh, for somebody that's buying their first chainsaw and then a follow-up that's related is um, additional steps um, if you're using older manual tools so kind of additional tools. steps if you're using older manual tools well, first of all, to the chainsaw question, um, go talk to a reputable dealer. Um, mm -hmm. Steel and Husqvarna right now are, are, are common dealers, and uh, those folks should know exactly. You should be able to talk to them and tell them what you're planning to do, and they should be able to help you out with what size saw you, you should, should need. Awesome. I'm going to cut you off there because we do need to make a transition, um, but clearly there, this is the, the tip of the iceberg um, in terms of low impact forestry work and safety work. Um, you all can learn more about this and the low impact forestry area of MOFCA's website, workshops, um, and all different types of resources are available there. It's just about time for me to um, send folks over to the country store with Ryan Dennett, who's um, co-hosting with me this evening. Thanks for joining us. Take it from here, Ryan. Hi, everyone. I'm Ryan Dennett. I'm the Farmer Programs Director here at MAFCA, and I'm also a graduate of MAFCA's Journey Person Program, one of 245 graduates now. Um, there's 92% of us still farming and 87% of us still farm in Maine. This program is such a model of success that it's been replicated by organizations around the country. Um, if you'd like to support that kind of programming, you can become a member by visiting mafka.org. You can also visit fair.mafka.org to support us by purchasing some of our fantastic um, swag here. We've got t-shirts, bags, aprons, um, and water bottles. We'd also like to thank our sponsors for making this virtual programming possible, specifically Taproot Magazine. They focus on content that includes food, farming, crafts, and family. We have a subscription here in the office. It's wonderful to read, there's no ads, and I often get to see articles written by some of our farmers. Um, so thank you to Taproot Magazine. Um, we have some amazing programming. Thank you for sticking with us on such a beautiful weekend um, and enjoying the online programming that we're able to offer this year. Um, we're going to be hearing from Billy Barker. She has Firefly Farm and Enchanted Kitchen, and we're so lucky to have her. She often caters a lot of our programs, including um, we often have her cater the Low Impact Forestry Program. Um, and we'll have staff come down and enjoy all of the amazing food that she um, provides for us. And uh, she's going to be showing us how to grow and cultivate and um, create Sweet Annie crowns. And of course, one thing we all miss about the, the in-person fair is that signature scent of Sweet Annie. Um, and uh, she's going to show us how she grows it on her cultivated uh, organic farm, and she'll go through the process of assembling a crown. Um, I know when I started coming back to the fair in my college years, I always had to have one of those, um, those Sweet Annie crowns, and it's really like another one of those visual uh, signatures of the fair. And um, I can't wait to, uh, 
to get to talk to her about that after her video. Um, and I just want to remind everyone that you can become a member to support programs like the fair, like our Journey Person program. Um, we have a Farmer to Farmer conference that will be online this year as well. And so we really need your support. You can find all sorts of types of membership. Um, we have a plan that's $5 a month and you can sign up for membership by going to fair.mafka.org or mafka.org. Thank you so much. Hi, I'm Billy Barker, and this is Enchanted Kitchen at Firefly Farm, Firefly Farm. I'm going to be making sweet Annie head crowns for you today. And I grow all of this here at my farm, or it's certified by Mofka, Organic Certified Gardens. And I get most of my seeds through Johnny Selected Seeds and Fedco. So we'll take a little walk. All you need to do this are scissors and floral wire. I like to use 26 gauge because it's, um, it's easier to cut with just regular scissors and very durable. So let's come into bed. The forest of tomatilla and torch flowers and flowers and ground cherries. <laughs> So we'll start with the Sweet Annie, and Sweet Annie grows anywhere you want it to. It doesn't need really wonderful soil. It can grow in gravel. It likes good soil, but it will really grow anywhere. And you can start with it earlier in the year, or now it's kind of a yellow hue because it is starting to go to seed and you probably won't ever need to plant it again. <laughs> it definitely, it's an annual, but it likes to self seed. So this is a more than enough amount for one crown. And I love to grow all kinds of everlastings. My favorites for the crown are status. I don't have a lot of status this year and I don't always grow these. These are everlasting um i'll pick a few of these these whites these are called everlasting wings i have to double check that i didn't haven't grown these for a few years and then celosia it's such a i love the vibrant colors all of these everlastings hold their color it's just so exciting that you can make a wreath now all these magentas and these oranges and, and yellows, it's just amazing. And when we harvest these flowers for Common Ground Fair, we do it all on Thursday before the fair. So the fair being Friday, Saturday, Sunday, we do all the harvesting on Thursday so everything's as fresh as can be. And these could use a few more weeks at the Celosia. So in a few more weeks, they'll all be prime. And then this is all the globe amaranth. I love all the colors, the, the plums and the carmen. The oranges and oh, this is perfect right now so I tend to cut them I like to keep the stems long and when we cut for the fair we go ahead and groom everything in the field we don't you know just throw them in the basket we do it this way so that it's easier for us to just make the wreath and picking some of this This is the one I grow the most of because I just love these colors. They, they just pop. And the backdrop, oh, actually, one more thing. The Nigella, or Love in a Mist. These are amazing. They almost look like a larkspur flower when they're in bloom. And then this is their seed pod, like an alien bug. I just love them. And then the backdrop is the Hopi Amaranth. I just love this plant. And go for a small piece or if you want to be really bold go for a larger and again I tend to just kind of clip all the leaves off while I'm in the field and this is also another plant that tends to enjoy coming back year after year in your garden <laughs> Yeah. 
And you can use any flowers. I tend to use Everlastings all the time for the fair because then people can enjoy the wreaths all year. But when I'm making them for family or weddings or events, I use any of the flowers. The sunflowers, the, the torch sunflowers are just brilliant. Maybe I'll cut one just to put, put in there. These of course don't last very long, but if you're wearing it just for the day, it's just the colors are amazing. So I tend, I will make my wreath first. And you can use anything for this too. I've made them out of cedar. We usually always take some cedar to the fair because a few people are a little allergic. And this is the part where <laughs> I wish you could smell this. It's like, oh, it's so beautiful. It's considered the signature scent of the fair. It's, you can smell it everywhere. It's just amazing. I, I just love working with it. And as you can see, it's so resiny and durable. You really, I mean, you don't need any other wire base. You can just use this. It's very flexible. So if you're using cedar, it's a little less flexible, but still in the spring I use daisies. You know, you can make, make wreaths out of anything. And different people like their wreaths differently. Some like them full and bushy. Some like them wrapped a little tighter and thinner. I tend to like a full frondy bushy. So I don't use a lot of wire. I just kind of spin it out instead of um, doing it really tightly, just kind of loosely wire it. And then I'm going to take mine off for a second. What you want to do is size your head before you stop. You can keep making this as long as you want. You can make a, start making a wall wreath, but I tend to just go ahead. Again, it's super flexible. Just size myself, kind of get a feel where I want it. And you want to go ahead and make it a little tighter than you think you want it because your body heat will make this stretch out a little bit but you can also just make it tighter by um, cutting it overlapping it and, and using some more wire it's it's actually these are so easy to work with mine back on <laughs> and and then you would try this on again make sure it's the size you like and then it's, I mean, it's beautiful just the way it is. It really is beautiful. Like the colors and the tones. And as it dries, actually the one I have on now, I, um, some of the Sweet Annie had gotten separated when I did some weeding. So it's already a week old. So as you can see, it turns a deeper green, but it still lasts and holds its color wonderfully. So I love to use the, the Hopi Amaranth as kind of a backdrop. And I, I picked some some um, yarrow and high bush cranberry a little earlier because it's on the other side of the farm. So I tend to think of this as the backdrop and I just make a little arrangement against the brilliant magenta. So you kind of just tuck these flowers in. Some cranberry in there. We're just gonna make a nice big one here. <laughs> and because we picked this one, we'll go ahead and pop that in there, maybe on top. So I kind of make this arrangement in my hands. Put this in here. And then I take the Sweet Annie Crown, just place it over the top, hold it in place nice and tightly, get a nice long piece of wire, go ahead and cut it so so it's, you know, a nice long piece, really long piece. I'll probably cut that again. And you don't have to strap each flower in. I just kind of tuck it in here towards the end and just wrap a couple times, kind of just kind of squiggling it around the flowers. The word squiggle. <laughs> and then put a couple wraps around where the stem is. Stems all come together cut the wire and I kind of cut it on top towards the top so you can wrap it forward you don't want this to be sticking into your forehead that's a little uncomfortable and then I just take the scissors and kind of trim these stems off so they're a little more subtle I do it on an angle so it's again a little more subtle just like that and if you don't, if you, you know, you can, again, adjust this as much as you'd like. If you don't like this, you can either use a little wire. I had a little wire left over here. 
You can either trim it with your scissors or why waste your sweet annie though? So I'll go ahead and fasten that a little bit. Take this one off, this one on, and this is gonna be a little small. I could feel that when I put it on. So I stretch it and seriously, you feel like, oh, it's a little tight, but it's not. It's gonna feel like that for 15 minutes and then it's gonna be perfect and comfortable and you might even wanna tighten it again. So that's it. <laughs> Super fun, easy, smells amazing. You might not be able to wear them indoors all the time. <laughs> Some people, the smell is um, makes their allergies, their nose twitchy, but outside, I just, I love these. And, and we get people coming to the fair year after year to tell us how long they've lasted. A lot of people put them in their, their dash of their car. That's really nice because of the smell, but I hang mine on my wall. And I've been making these at the fair for over 20 years and I just I'm really gonna miss it this year but we're gonna be on the marketplace so check it out if you want to order your wreath or at the question and answer if you have any questions about how to make yours at home I'd love to to answer any questions hi Billy thank you so much for joining us today your crown is beautiful and I'm so glad that <laughs> the sweet Annie crowns are still part of the fair this year so thanks for including them for us Oh, my pleasure. It wouldn't be an, a fall festival, fall time without them. <laughs> That's true. Can you tell me a little bit about what inspired you to start making Sweet Annie crowns? Well, the first time I did the fair 25 years ago, um, I worked with Jay Robinson. I was working at his farm and we did the fair selling his vegetables, me and um, two other women that worked on his farm that summer. And we didn't have a tent or anything. It was rainy. <laughs> and we just had our rain gear and we were getting pretty wet and feeling pretty, you know, soggy. So I just spun up these Sweet Annie wreaths to wear <laughs> and to brighten our mood. And people wanted to buy them. And we were like, well, we, you know, we just made them for ourselves. And But then a little light went off and I thought, this is this is what I need to do. <laughs> so that's how, that's how it started. <laughs> Oh, that's great. Well, we're getting a lot of love on um, some of our social media channels for your crowns. Um, <laughs> Yay. I feel like it's such a timeless design that we see every year at the fair. I do see that you have some other additions of dried flowers in there. Um, are there any new things that you've tried or, or what else do you do to add to your, your Sweet Annie crown? I mostly use Everlastings, that way they last. I made this one to, for the video, I recorded it a few weeks ago and, and they, they hold out really well, the colors and all. I um, just walk around and, and I have a high bush cranberry. I've been using those. Um, Tansy has taken over one of a, a kind of a, a wildflower garden. So we've been using a lot of that. I had said yarrow in the, in the video. I always get those two mixed up, but it's Tansy. <laughs> and, um, I do use cedar sometimes, and, and if, if the milkweed's gone to seed, I, I, for, we always do some hot peppers and milkweed and different kind of woodsy things and bark for, for the larger wreaths for hats and also for men. You know, we make it a more like a woodsy theme <laughs> or whatever they want. Oh, They're great. made to order at the fair, which is really nice. People can choose what they, what they want for colors and items. We have a question. Do you have any tips for drying the crowns and Sweet Annie in general? Well, um, what I, I like to dry it as the crown. It tends to sh be shattery. I would, if you had a bundle of it, I would just hang it upside down, but it tends to, to, to be really crumbly and shattery. So the crowns hold together nice. They're wired. You could play Frisbee with them. They really won't fall apart. I just hang mine up. I have a just a hook in my um, living room that I tend to hang it up. And these were, this was hung up on that hook for two weeks. And then I just put it on this morning to make sure it would look okay. Um, or your wall. A lot of people tell us that's what they do with them through the years. And um, uh, some of the women that work with me, they just put them on their dashboard too, which is nice. Cause then it, when you turn your heat on in the car, it kind of smells nice if it, if it doesn't bother you to have it in close quarters like that um, allergy wise. But um, yeah. Yeah, just they're very durable. I mean, really. And and if you wanted to crumble a little piece and just throw on your wood stove or just, you know, that's that's nice too. <laughs> that's great that they have sort of a, a life after the crown mm. day of wearing them around the fair. Yeah, very durable. 
Um, we have a question, is Sweet Annie easy to grow? Yes and no. I find that if you, it doesn't, it doesn't take a lot of pampering or good soil. It will grow anywhere. It will grow in your gravel driveway <laughs> and live through the cracks. Um, but it seems like when you want to grow it, <laughs> it's a, sometimes it's a, it's a little fussy to germinate. It likes to do its own. Um, so if you can let some go to seed in a section of your garden that you wouldn't mind it coming back again and again, that's the best way, really. It likes to go through that cold season. So do you it is annual. It is an, it's all, the only annual in a large family of Artemisia. It's the only annual. Well, all the others are perennial, like wormwood and silver king, silver queen. Um, so you do need to seed it, but it's prolific. So you're just letting it self seed in that area where you want to grow that patch. You're not going out and collecting and saving the seed. I do save the seed um, because I rotate a bunch, and I I also like it in a more manageable way because I find that um, I let some go to seed and self seed, but I do have ma a majority of what I grow is, is um, seeded in the greenhouse. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And transplanted. Yeah. Then I can manage where it is and rows and weeding and stuff. It tends to seed in a carpet, which, um, which won't grow as tall as I'd like it. So, but, but then you just need to thin it. So you just um, would work with it. But I, I, it depends on the season. Sometimes when we harvest for common ground fair, it's not to seed yet. It's still really frondy and beautifully green still. But this year with the dry season, I will definitely be um, having some self seeded sweet annie. It's got, it, it went to seed um, early, which it's still beautiful. It just has the, um, it's more deep green and, um, and the, you know, the little yellow, yellow t um, tinge, I guess, or hue to the, the flowers. How much do you harvest for a typical three-day fair? I grow a plot of probably, oh, I'm trying to think. Um, I didn't grow as much this year, but typically it's a, it's a whole length of my field, which is probably uh, close to, probably a hundred feet by um, six, yeah, hundred by six foot bed and just as much in, in, um, in the, the flowers, the um, everlasting flowers. And I have favorites. I, I stopped growing um, star, uh, straw flowers. I just couldn't, they, they just, they're hard to work with. They shatter. They don't hold, they just don't hold themselves very well. So, so I've given up on those. <laughs> <laughs> What are some good sort of entry level everlasting cultivated plants that you would suggest people try out? The globe amaranth um, and also the Hopi amaranthus burgundy. This is beautiful. And I often, that self seeds wonderfully too. And I, I don't often have to plant that because it grows so nicely on its own. And the birds love it. Like they're just all over it right now. It's, it's, they just love the seed. And so it seems a nice addition to the garden. <laughs> but the globe amaranth and and um and the Hopi is very prolific. You you don't need very many plants either. They 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 give you a lot for what what you plant. Um, another favorite is I love the Nigella. Love and Mist. I love those. They're just they're so much fun. They they look almost like they're a flower, like a lar almost like a larkspur during the season and then they grow into I think I have some on this one. Oh, let me see. I'm on my phone, so I can't see as well, but um, like an alien bug with a little green wrap around it, <laughs> like a beetle. But, um, and those also, you can save those for seed too. All these things, you can save your own seed, which is great. You know, once you purchase the seeds, you'll have them forever. Mm. And are they pretty easy seeds to keep if someone's new to seed saving? Yes, absolutely. I, I just leave them, uh, you know, one plan of everything out in the field until probably another in mid-October when I'm cleaning everything up and just shatter the flowers. The, the nigella, you just open up and the seeds are inside and then um, of course crumble the, the sweet annie and then the globe aberrant, which is these like strawberry-like things right here mm -hmm. that you just, just tear them apart too for the seeds. Mm -hmm. Have you seen any trends come and go at the fair as to what people are really liking 
um, for their spanning wreaths. Yeah, the really deep gem colors seem to be great because it's fall and that's what we're seeing in the leaves and how everything's turning so that the crimsons and the um, yellows is, are really popular with the status. Um, I think bold, bold colors, you know, you want bold on your head <laughs> to dance around. <laughs> <laughs> we had a question come in. Where would I purchase Sweet Annie if I wanted to try making a crown? Do you know of suppliers or farms? Mm -hmm. I get my seed from Fedco um, and also Johnny's Selected Seeds. Both of them are always have it. Really reliable grower seed seed um, companies and, and you can order online and you'll get it. If you're in Maine, you'll get it in three days and um Anywhere else too, I'm sure they, they, they usually get about within 24 hours to you. It's really nice, quick turnaround. That's great. Um, do you, pri you primarily, I assume, grow the Everlastings for the crowns at the fair? Are there any other sort of products that you use your Everlasting flowers for? Pretty much always the crowns. And um, I will get some wedding parties that will ask me to make crowns for them. Um, besides the fair and some baby blessings and little you know, crowns for newborns. Um, but that's pretty, pretty much it. I, some people want wreaths and I love making wreaths also. It, I, it's pretty much the same except a more bushy um, base with the, with the sweet Annie. And then of course you're, you're putting the, the flowers on them on the side instead of just the front. But yeah, yeah, the fair, <laughs> the fair is the priority for them for sure. And, but it's nice to always have some around. Um, some people like to get the scraps of sweet Annie from me afterwards. They put some, they stuff them in their dog beds um, for, yeah, you know, make satchels and different things with just the pieces. You can make little satchels. When growing sweet Annie, when is it typically ready to harvest and how long can you harvest it? You can harvest it right up for the frost. I did cover, we, you know, we had a couple nights there of frost, so I covered it and it's resilient. It, it did well under, under just the remake cover. Um, I love to harvest it when it's still really green and resiny. It's very resiny. That's why it holds its scent so long. And um, I just love it when it's that ferny, frondy, like now it's, it is in its post state. Um, but it's still great to work with. It's just a little drier and, but again, it's, it's so bendy. You don't, I don't use a frame for them when I make a wreath, even a wall wreath. It just, it's, it, you can just bend it the way you want it and just wire it and it holds its shape that way, which is great. Um, but yeah, all stages. I think probably the latest I would do it, if you didn't cover it, I would want to get it in before a hard freeze. Because if it does get a hard freeze, it just turns really dark, like almost a black color, and it does lose its scent. Now, it sounds like in addition to cultivating some of these everlasting flowers, you do use some wild plants in your crowns. Do you have any tips for selecting um, or harvesting those plants for your crown? Um, the time of year, you or, or the... Uh, what kinds of plants are you using? Where are you finding them? Are there certain mm -hmm. parts that you're harvesting? Mm -hmm. I like to use, I like to harvest them. When we do the fair, we harvest everything on Thursday um, before the fair. I really like to work with the stems where they're still green. Uh, they're flexible, they hold well. And once they're wired in place, then they stay. I find that if you, you have to harvest the status though all summer long, you I harvest them when they're when they're ready, <laughs> which is just looking at them and going, yeah, that's ready, and and um, and dry them. But then, but when you work with everlastings, once they're dry, they're kind of prickery. <laughs> so it's it's so much nicer to to work with them fresh. And like I said, they hold they they dry so well in the wreaths. I mean, you don't have to work with work with worry about it after that. The um, milkweed I would be harvesting now, and. Um, the high bush cranberry, beautiful. Now I, I, I harvested some early for making this and they were half like yellow and half um, red, but now they, in the wreaths, they turned full red. And yeah, the, everything's, yeah, pretty, like I said, the only thing I really harvest before Thursday of the fair is the status. I just walk around the farm and collect things that look pretty. <laughs> hmm. 
Do you have any advice for making winter crowns? Have you ever used pine bows? Mm -hmm. Pine bows and cedar. Cedar works really nice too. I love, actually, I love working with cedar and, and I'll put pine in there um, because they're really, it, the stems are also really bendy. And what I tend to do is um, bunch them up smaller. So you're starting with a bunch, maybe no, no taller than, I'm sorry, I'm holding my phone in my other hand. So as tall as your hand, so like not five, six foot and, and you just overlap. So you take a bundle and then overlap your next bundle and just be wiring it as you go. So it's almost like you're making um, a, just a, a cord and till you get the, the length that you need, it's beautiful. And, and then in the winter, I've done some winter wreaths. I'll use milkweed and some, you know, the berry, the different berries. Um, and I, in my field, I have some red osier. So in the winter, if it's young red osier dogwood, the tips are nice and red and beautiful. Once the leaves drop, those are beautiful in the wreath too. Just kind of stick them in little places. It's just beautiful. <laughs> and are those something that you typically make for sale? Mm. I do on request. I, I tend to make a them mostly for gifts and friends, but yeah, any special orders. I'm just wondering if you can tell us um, where people could find Sweet Annie crowns this year or some of the winter crowns that you make. Yep. I have, I'm on the marketplace, um, the Moffa marketplace, and if you just search Sweet Annie, I'll come up in there. I, we did a couple test runs and I pop up and so, yeah, find me there. You can also just message me on Facebook, Billy Barker. And we will be making wreaths. Definitely, I would, I would probably encourage people to order them in the next two weeks, just because um, I didn't grow as much sweet in as I typically do for the fair. So, yeah, yeah, or or tell me to save some <laughs> if you want them a little later. <laughs> But um, yes, so. in the winter too, I will, yeah, I guess just message me. Um, my, I can put my email to um, fireflymain, M-A-I-N-E at yahoo.com. Um, if you are interested in winter wreaths or anything um, further into the season, just message me and we can work something out. Well, thank you so much, Billy. It was really great to talk with you. Thank you. <laughs> I'm going there now. Awesome. Hey everybody, this is Sarah Trenzo again, coming to you from the Mafka Country Store. Um, thanks so much, Ryan, for um, hosting Billy Barker, a Common Ground Fair staple, um, both her crowns and her food. Um, just great to see her face and, and kind of a little bit breaks your heart too, because it makes you think of all the other people and food and products that we're gonna have to uh, miss out on seeing this year. But as Billy just mentioned um, in her presentation, she's got products in the marketplace. Tons of other vendors have products in the marketplace. So that's something that if you're feeling a little bit itchy for Common Ground Fair celebration feeling, um, you can check things out there. Uh, not only you know is it a way for you to bring home some of those items, but obviously this is a year that's gonna be tough for every small business owner and farmer that you know. Um, so it's a really good time, I think, for us to be kind of putting our, our money where our mouth is <laughs> and investing in our neighbors, businesses, folks like Billy, folks like Herbal Revolution, um, and all the other variety of farmers that you know and love, that you, and craftspeople that you know and love that come and do business at Common Ground Fair and, and build community here. The other thing I'll say is that just like the real um, live fair, there's all kinds of sweet merch <laughs> hanging around. There's a mountain of it here. There are mountains of it all around the exhibition hall that you can't see. Um, this, there's a gorgeous graphic on this year's teas and posters and tote bags and all of that jazz, these sweet bee balm flowers. Um, but there's also a lot of past year's um, editions of the t-shirt and other products available. So um, I noticed before, before Tim got his new shirt, he was walking around wearing whatever year the goat was. Um, so you can kind of like flip through and see if there's past years that you love the graphic. There might still be some of that product floating around that you can get your hands on. Also, while you're over on Mafka's website, um, 
I know you know this one's coming. If you're not a member or if it's time to renew your membership, it'd be really great to do so. Um, this is such a funny year for everybody and organizations like MAFCA that are adjusting to the new needs of farmers and gardeners and eaters and citizens and just needing to like design new programs on the fly and support people in new and different ways. Like this is the moment to be reinvesting in those organizations. So go ahead and re-up on your membership or make a gift or check out, you know, if you're in the situation where it's like you're thinking about making a bequest to the organization, you can do all of that at mafka.org. Um, anyway, that was, <laughs> now we have some more fun, exciting stuff that's not about bequests. Um, we have got Mary Thompson of Montville coming up in our next segment. Um, she has been coming to the Common Ground Fair for the past 10 years to educate um, fairgoers of all different skill levels on raising heritage breed pigs um, for culinary purposes. And we were just chatting off set a little bit. Um, she said she would give two pig presentations a day, every day of the fair. <laughs> so this is a little bit of a different format. We've got a sweet video that was produced with, um, by the folks at Omain, and then we're gonna have a Q&A session right after that. Um, so um, keep it right where it is. Um, check out Mary's video and think up some good questions. Um, and I'll be available with Mary live here in the studio to answer those questions um, just as soon as the video has wrapped. See you on the other side. Hi, I am Mary Thompson, uh, Beans Corner Farm over in Montville. If you guys have been coming to the fair over the last few years to see the pigs, then you have seen me and my girls. Um, and just so you know, usually if you come to see us at the fair, right next to us is Sue Frank from Dog Patch Farm, and she brings her mule foot hogs. So if you are interested in mule foot at all, make sure you look her up. She has both um, Facebook and a webpage. I have neither, but she has both. So definitely take a look um, and see her animals. And she also does some crossbreeding with the different breeds. So check her out, definitely. And next year, come see us. So anyway, um, so raising heritage pigs for meat. Um, by the way, this is Adriana. And if you come to the fair, you have met Adriana and Nancy. So raising pigs for meat, uh, especially the heritage breeds, the older breeds are meant to be outdoors, which is one of the biggest reasons for using them. The meat is better, it's redder, has more flavor. The animals just do better. And the whole saying of um, you have to uh, eat them to save them. And a lot of the breeds are back on the critical list that I had thought were moved down from critical and I noticed the other day they're all back on critical. So depending on what you want to do um, is going to make a difference on what pig you want to choose. If you want to tear the ground up, you want a rooting pig. Um, so you would not be happy with a large black because a large black roots a little bit but they're a grazing pig so if you have a piece of land you want to raise pigs but you don't want them to tear up the land well consider a large black or a guinea hog um, the different pigs depending on what you want are you in a hurry do you want to just take your time and enjoy the experience um, the smaller pigs say the guinea hog they're a large pig they're a much smaller stature um, the mule foot is a smaller pig, they take more time. Um, those are usually gonna take at least a year, maybe more. Where the other ones, you can go, um, depending on how you feed them and the breeding, you can go seven to nine months from start to finish. Now, keeping in mind that the pigs are two months old when you get them. So keep that calculation in mind. And this one, I don't know if you can see her real quick. This is Nancy. She is a red wattle. You can see the wattles, and these are just part of the breed, and they're, they don't seem to do anything. They just seem to be decoration, but that is part of the breed. So depending on what you want, is gonna make a difference on your breed. Look online, uh, see what, um, you can read a lot about them on livestock, the Livestock Conservancy page. It'll give you a good background. 
So, um, once you figure out what you want for a pig, um, you need to find your farmer. So once you find your farmer and definitely check around, see what other people have. This is a great time of year for that. Um, see what people have, see where they got them, how are they growing. Um, go find your farmer, preferably take a tour, uh, preferably see the breeding stock, see what they're coming from, um, how they're handled, and, and then make your decisions. And I'll just warn you that saying, telling a farmer you want pigs, that's Erica, um, telling a farmer you want pigs and want to be on the list is not the same as paying your deposit. Your deposit actually gives you a solid place on the list. So just keep that in mind. What should people budget for purchasing pigs? Mine are still currently 115, I believe. Um, they've gone up to 120 locally. Um, so far I've still held that price, but figure $120 a pig, unless you're going for a pure blood pig. Um, the pure blooded Berkshires, um, right now, just for a meat pig, those are 150. Um, and then of course, if you were buying breeding stock, it's more, more than that. So keep that in mind. Um, never one pig. Pigs are social animals even if they are snarky sometimes. They're social animals, they're not meant to be alone. They like to be together. Even on a hot, sunny day, you'll see them, you know, laying down and touching each other. They just like to be together. Um, so once you have your pigs figured out, really good idea if, because um, the other thing is you need to figure out your, your timing. Nancy, stop. Figure out your timing. Um, are you doing, just a really fast, you want them in the spring, you want them out in the fall. Fall is the busiest time processing wise, so make your appointment, figure out your processor, and make your appointment as soon as possible. Um, some places are over a year out in processing. And then depending on what you're doing with the meat, if you are gonna sell retail, um, you're gonna need to, one, have your state license, you need to have your label figured out and you need to go to a processor who is inspected, either USDA or state inspected. Um, I use Herring Brothers for all my custom work and they do a great job and they handle the animals beautifully. Um, Cause that is one really important thing when you figure out a processor, again, go check it out um, and make sure it's not a place that puts the pigs all in one air. air. <laughs> Make sure they don't put all the pigs in one, um, one corral. You absolutely don't want that. There's always going to be, Nancy, be nice. There's always going to be a pig who's dominant. First of all, you just don't want to mix pigs like that. And there's going to be a pig who's dominant who beats on the others. And all the work you've done to have a nice, happy, healthy, stress-free pig is undone at that point. So that's really important. Nancy, stop. <laughs> stop it. Okay, so once you figure out your pigs and figure out your processing dates, <laughs> um, you're gonna wanna figure out your fencing and your housing. Fencing can be as simple as hog panels. I've seen people using pallets. Um, for me personally, the more space, the better. Um, I have acres for the pigs to run around and play in. Um, if you're going to use a small space, you need to keep it clean. If, if you can move it, that's best. Um, but if you can't move it, you've got to keep it clean. You've got to clean the manure out of it. Um, if you're feeding um, slop or anything like that, make sure you're feeding it in a dish because it makes everything really rancid and stinky, draws bees. Um, the manure is going to draw flies. You just, it's not good for you. It's not good for the pig. Um, the smaller the space, the more bored the pig is. A bored pig has lots of time to devise ways to get out. So, you know, try to give them as much space as you can. The other thing is they're going to compact the soil. Um, if you get rainy weather, it's going to mud up really bad and then when it dries each time it goes through that cycle it's going to get harder and harder so if you're planning on turning that into a vegetable garden might get a little 
a little harder than you were planning on. So if you can move them and when you have a small space, that's better. Uh, fencing options is, um, I started out with a uh, net fence, an electric net fence. And that's really handy if you're not in a spot with a lot of things to get caught on. When you're ready to move it, just feed the pigs up at the edge where you want to go. You feed them, you run around behind them, you move it, and they're just, what? They have no idea. They're, you're all set. You can do it by yourself as long as there aren't obstacles to get caught in and on. Keep in mind the net fencing meant for pigs. The holes are kind of big for your, uh, when you first bring your pigs home. The holes are meant for, you know, as they're growing and get a little bigger. So the other fencing, your hog panels, um, make a really nice fence and I can drag them around. When they're younger, um, you don't have to get too crazy with uh, fence posts, but um, as they get bigger, you're gonna want the posts to keep them from just pushing through the fencing. Um, there's also, if you wanna come over here, quick option. Okay, this is your electrified rope. This stuff is really good. This is um, the Premier IntelliRope. Um, if you buy it, you wanna invest in this. These pieces come separate, you, you need the stand. You're gonna really regret it if you don't have it. This is a really simple system. Um, when you're done with it, you can just flip it in and you're solid. Uh, the poly wire, um, fiberglass rods is all you need for this. Um, but you can also definitely use it with the T posts. Uh, if you're gonna do the fiberglass rods, you have options. I don't know if you can see this but you have the different insulators. See, this one has a hole in it. If you can get it, you want this style rather than this style. This style allows you to lock the rope into it and it gives you more rigidity where this just slides and it's really hard to control it. But you can just flip it up and pull it and now it's locked in place and you can have a much sturdier fence line. It gives you a way to tighten it and it's, sometimes that's really important. Um, other thing is this time of year my ground is really really hard i can't get this in the ground on its own so just grab a spike or a big screwdriver pound them in and there's your hole and you're all set and it really is helpful also with your fencing um when the ground's starting to freeze up on you you can still get your posts in the other posts to use are the t posts the metal t posts um I'm moving that way, I'm getting rid of wood. And you've got your pounder and you've got your puller. If you have those in your T-posts, you can do anything. Okay, so housing wise, those I mean, those are just basic, basic, but housing wise, um, over here, I can show you. This is just a, and if you wanna just show it, this is just be, right now, that is a cattle panel and it's for shade because I have another structure. But if I wanna turn that into a house, all I have to do is add another panel to it and I can close in the, the ends with lumber or whatever you have handy and obviously tarp it farther and now you've got a structure. And if you wanna move it, you just pop the uh, posts out with your handy dandy post puller, set it in another place and you're all set. I will warn you, just keep it on a higher spot. Um, otherwise, if you have a lot of rain, the water will go in and of course the pigs have dug a nice hole so they're gonna be wet. Um, in the spring, it's really important. You need the pigs, your young pigs need dry and out of the wind. They're still susceptible to pneumonia at that age. And of course it's usually spring. And if we have a wet, cold spring, you're gonna have the potential for more problems. So just make sure that they can be dry and out of the wind and you'll be much happier. The structure, um, I built this, there are four stalls um, and then 
what I'm attempting on the different buildings is there's eventually going to be extensions coming off so that the pigs also have an outdoor area during the winter months. And it's really helpful when you have piglets and stuff to be able to keep them controlled, let them outside, but have some control. But the pad that he's standing on, that actually is a grant from NRCS. It's a heavy use pad to help um, keep the animals from destroying the ground in wet weather. Um, and it's, it's really helpful to have a, a place to feed and water when it's really, really muddy and really nasty and it, because the, the ground just gets churned up so fast. Uh, the solar panels are for my electric charger to run the fence lines. Um, and those panels are supposed to be, what do they call them, amorphous? So they're supposed to also charge in low light. So we'll see how that goes this winter. Because there's nothing better than coming out and finding out your charge is down. And the pigs are going, hey. <laughs> so once you have an idea of how and where, um, when you go to pick up your pigs, first you need a decent sized container. Um, not a small carrier, you need a carrier. Pigs are always bigger than you think they are. Um, the metal dog crates work really well. If you're going to put them in the back of a pickup truck, um, just make sure that if you have a cap on it, if there are screened windows, that those windows are more than just screen. Pigs can go through the window and have. Um, you need to make sure you have a cover. If you don't have a cap, whatever crate or something you're using needs a cover. Pigs jump. Mine are really good at jumping. Um, make sure any openings are not overly large. You want small. Pigs are like mice. They can stick themselves through openings you'd be surprised of. Um, the other part is have a plan so when you get home and you're unloading, first you don't want to just let your pigs loose. You want to keep them confined for the first few days. You need to make friends with them. And the other part is even if they know electric fencing, they're scared and they are gonna go through that fence. And you wanna avoid any of those problems. So just plan on having a way to confine them behind something solid for at least the first few days while they calm down, they get used to you. You're gonna bribe them with treats to make friends start handling them because you really want to socialize your pigs um, so that's really important the first week so now if you are coming say you've got them in the pickup truck how are you getting them from the pickup truck to their structure just think about all these things in advance so you don't end up say you open up that big old tailgate and there goes a pig so just think it all through and try to do everything you can to minimize um, the stress on the pigs because they're already stressed and so it's guaranteed that they are going to be having diarrhea for the first few days because as soon as you start grabbing them and hauling them around that's one of the things that happens should go away in a couple of days but also bear in mind that you're changing their food so there's going to be a little upset there they may be off their food for the first day a little freaked out uh if you need it um pumpkin is is helpful for uh, diarrhea but after a few days everything should be fine if it's not then you might want to um, provide some kind of electrolytes or something just to make sure that they're not having too much of an issue um, once you've made friends with your pigs now the other thing is okay my pigs know the electric but they also when you go to move them they are throwing themselves through things. So don't assume that the pigs you've picked up because they know electric, that you're not gonna have a problem. Say mine are behind high tensile. High tensile is not the same as net fencing. Net fencing gives and the pigs are gonna be going through it. Are they gonna get tangled? You need to make sure that they've learned, you've taught them your fence system before you let them loose. So something like that, um, Put something solid behind it so when the pigs go into it they can't get through they'll get zapped and they can't get through until they learn and then you take away that danger of them getting tangled in the fence and you're not there to deal with it 
So just try to think it all through. <clears throat> um, a really easy way is when you first start out just a hot wire in the bottom of whatever enclosure you're using. And that's a good teaching, teaching tool. <laughs> Feeding time. Piggers! Pick a pig! Hey. Come here. Now feeding, I use a, what they call a complete ration. I get the pig pellets, feed them in a line. Just make a nice straight line. Don't make piles. Cause again, one pig is going to take over that pile and stop the other pigs from eating. I like the pellets because I can feed it directly on the ground in dry weather. So if I am out trying to, um, clean up a, a piece of land, I'll just broadcast the pellets where I want them to clear it, and they'll just keep going back all day long looking for more food. Um, I don't like mash because I find mash very wasteful. Um, it's basically a dry powder. If you get it wet, you need, that's better for the pigs. You waste less, but you need food dishes. Um, you can't really broadcast it. If you feed it dry, if you ever watch the pigs try to eat it, they're just trying to eat powder. So make sure that there is fresh water right nearby because they're going to go back and forth and they're going to just muck that water up nasty. So you're going to want to give them another fresh water shortly thereafter. Um, pigs love treats. Absolutely. This time of year, all the leftover produce, all those different things are perfect. If you are feeding, say you're down on the coast, you're feeding fish byproducts, that's fabulous, but stop feeding at least 30 days before processing or you're gonna have some really funky tasting meat. So think those things through. Pasture, the more pasture you can give them, the more forage, great, but you still need to feed them. Protein and their minerals, um, and they're not meant, they're not ruminants. So they do need more than just pasture. And now, of course, the more space you have, then that gives them more things to eat. Okay, so water. They absolutely have to have fresh, clean water. Um, they go through multiple gallons a day per pig. I don't remember the amount. You can look that up. But water dishes. Um, there's a, an array of dishes you can make over here out of barrels. <laughs> Keep in mind that when you're when you first bring home your your pigs, they're going to be short and small. So something this tall and rigid, they're going to have a hard time getting to the water if it's not completely full. So a shorter one is easier. The rubber buckets are bendable. Um, they're also really really easy to tip over. So you're going to be wasting a lot more water with those. The barrel cut in half makes a great water container. Make sure you put wood around the sides because they will collapse as well. They will eventually break it, but that works really good. Um, best choice of all is over here. That is the 55 gallon Rubbermaid container. They're expensive, but they're worth every penny. How to get an estimate <clears throat> on the weight of your pig. So you're gonna you're gonna tape them and you can look this up online or it's in the like the stories guide to raising pigs and stuff. It is heart girth times heart girth times length divided by 400 and that gives you an estimate of your live weight. If you take that number and multiply it by 72% now you have an estimate of your hanging weight. Um, which is what you're charged for at the processor and bear in mind your hanging weight is not going to be your end weight as of what you're getting back in product so don't think that you know I have a 250 pound hanging weight I should have 250 pounds in meat just keep that in mind because that includes hanging weight includes <coughs> bone you know bone and fat and all of those things so um, get yourself a handy dandy tape, obviously, and um, usually I do this while they're eating or while they're hanging out. This is another reason to make friends with your pigs. 
because otherwise it's an absolute rodeo. So, let's see if I can get Nancy here. So, heart girth is right behind. Right behind the back of the legs, coming up. So, Nancy, that's 59 inches. Usually the length is from behind the ears to the top of the tail, but that's meant if the pig is standing straight, which obviously they're not. So come up, you know, I don't know, four inches or so. Hang on a second. Nancy, come here. <laughs> so come back a few inches to... to, to Nancy, seriously, come here. Okay, so, and sometimes you just have to be really quick. All right, so 57. So she is 59 times 59 times 57 divided by 400. So Nancy is approximately 496 pounds. So if I were taking her to be processed and I want to know what her hanging weight's going to be, and that's not it. <laughs> Whoops. 500 times 2%. Okay, so her hanging weight is going to be around 360. So if I were turning her into sausage, I would expect to get back half of that as finished product because now there is no bone or anything involved um, and bear in mind too on your smoking that say you have 20 pounds of meat being smoked your end product is going to weigh less you're still being charged on the 20 pounds but your end product weighs less so don't freak out and think you're being shorted on meat it's just that's the way it works out and again, you can look that up online. You can Google that and you'll find that information. Okay, so really, really important. Um, what are you transporting in? If you are going to use a utility trailer, an enclosed utility trailer that is not meant for livestock, does not have air openings, do not do that in the summer. Pigs have arrived at the processing plants dead or nearly dead because you just, you can't do that. There's no way for them to breathe. It's too hot. It's like locking your dog in your car with the windows up in the middle of a hot sunny day. So please don't do that. In the winter, you can get away with things like that. You know, it's cold, there's air, but pigs give off their own heat. And a situation like that, if you can't be in there and not be in danger, neither can they. So please don't do that. Um, the other thing is if you are using your truck, I've been at the processor and I've seen this where, especially trucks today are really tall. However you got your pig into the truck, you get to the processor, you need a plan to get the pig out of the truck. That's not the processor's responsibility. And if your truck is up here and the floor is down there, how are the pigs getting down? I mean, the processor's in a hurry. They're gonna grab that pig, pull it off the truck. You don't, that's not fair to the pig, so have a plan. You've gotta figure out how you're going to, once they're in, how are you gonna get them out? So keep these things in mind. If you're borrowing somebody's trailer, make sure there's no gaping holes. Make sure the gates actually latch. If, they, if you're not sure, tie them. You know, just really think about it and it's really important for the animal as much as anything make sure that they are not in danger and they're comfortable as much as possible so that's a really really big thing if you're going to process at home um, make sure whatever your kill method is like if you're going to have somebody do it for you see them in action first or talk to somebody they've done it for don't just take their word for it please learn from my mistakes i had someone i had a pig who was injured it need to be put down i trusted the person it was a nightmare the animal suffered it, please check first make sure they know first um 
there are different kill methods. I've had bad experiences with two of them. So again, right now I've got somebody who's fantastic. All, if I have an animal for whatever reason, like an old boar or something that needs to be put down, all I have to do is walk them where I want them to be, put some food on the ground. They're munching away, they're eating. The person shoots them behind the ear into the brain pan. They're down, it's over, no suffering. That's what you're looking for. So just please, if you're gonna process at home, very important. So just make sure you're looking in, into that. Um, the other part too is your processor, which you've already gone and you've checked it out. So you know that they're going to handle them really well. You don't want any stress. Most processors, they want the pigs there the day before. So they know that their system is clear of feed because you need 12 hours between last meal and processing. And you just need to make sure that everything is the handling will be quiet and calm. Adrenaline in the system at the end will ruin the meat. And of course, you don't want that anyway, just because you don't want to undo everything you've just done. All your hard work for raising that animal humanely and safely. So that's really important. Um, and that's your main, those are your main things, really. And I'm sure you have questions and we can go there. Wow, thanks for joining us in Montville um, at Mary Thompson's farm, Beans Corner Farm, through that great um, video. A lot of personalities uh, <laughs> captured on film. I'm yes. sure it's just a small sliver of what goes on day to day. Um, this is the portion of the presentation where you all can send in messages through Facebook, through YouTube, whatever platform you're watching in, and Mary's available to answer them live, just like the real fair, but kind of not as good because you're not here. But um, there are some questions in already, so let's just jump in. Does okay. that sound? Yeah. Okay. There's a question from Hannah, who's watching over on YouTube. Um, Hannah asks, how are red wattles for beginners as a breed? They're pretty good. Um, I started with large black and they are the most docile because of the ears. They're easier to keep fenced, huh. although there's an exception to every rule. Um, the red wattles, I haven't had any problems with them being too hard to keep in place. I've never raised Tamworth, but I've been told they're tough ones to keep fenced. Okay. So I stayed away from them. Yeah. But the red wattle are good. Are there any breeds in particular that you would say uh, maybe in addition to Tamworth that are not a great place for a beginner to get started with? Not that I have personal mm -hmm. knowledge with, because so far what I've raised is large black, red wattle. <clears throat> um, I've got some guinea crosses in there. I've had a um, Idaho pasture, and then now the, uh, the Berkshires. Okay. So, and I've, I've been happy with all of them. Cool. And so that, like, it sounds like you've got a diversity of different breeds and, and crosses um, mm -hmm. in your flock, herd? What do you call it? I guess herd. <laughs> your crew. <laughs> crew, definitely. <laughs> um, what, are the what are some different qualities that in those different breeds that might help someone make a decision? Like, that's a good breed for me, yeah. or that might be something I'm interested in growing. A big part is size. Okay. There's so much variation in size. Um, your lard pigs, well, size and composition. Your lard mm -hmm. pigs, like your um, guinea hogs, they're smaller, fatter, slower growing. Mm -hmm. um, so you're talking about a pig who's only going to be at full size a couple hundred pounds versus you know the large black and red wattles. Mm -hmm. They are a much bigger structurally pig. Yeah. Um, so they are, if you were gonna go say it, a year old, you can easily have a three to 400 pound pig, depending on how you're feeding. Yeah. Um, they're a lot taller, bigger. Yeah. So if you are less adventurous, you might want the smaller ones to mm -hmm. start, but it's gonna change what you get um, at the end. Because a lard pig, obviously, it's a lard pig. There's yeah. more fat on them. Yeah. Um, versus the bacon pigs, like the large black are very long, which is kind of nice though when you want lots of bacon. Yeah. So it's, there's just all sorts of things to think about. And I do some crossing because I do have a problem. The large black and red wattle are very lean. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. um, so you have to feed extra to get that little extra fat to them. Yeah. So I've actually crossed in some guinea hog because the guinea hog is too fat for me. Mm -hmm. Um, and the other problem is the large black and red wattle are so tall. You have these crazy long legs. So and they I, can escape. <laughs> is ooh. that what the question is with the length of the no, leg? No, it's okay. um, when you're processing, yeah. you're paying um, by hanging weight. Mm -hmm. So you've got all this bone structure you're paying all for, right. but there isn't necessarily any meat on that. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to shrink, shorten them, Yeah. but I want to keep the length. So, um, and I don't know that we had a good picture of Tina and she's usually at the fair with me. Um, she's shorter, looks more like a guinea hog, but not completely because yeah. she really shows the large black and red wattle that are in here. Mm -hmm. And the, the boar that he was showing pictures of, Mr. B, he is a Berkshire, a registered Berkshire out of mm. Iowa. And so he is, he's shorter than some of the other breeds. Yeah. But if, um, if anybody had a chance to go back and look at the pictures, his legs are so dense all the way down to the foot. So it changes versus the, um, the large black and red wattle are so much thinner and it's more bone. Yeah. Just, there's a lot of differences. And then Sue Frank usually brings the mule foots. Okay. Now her full grown mule foots are only a um, couple hundred pounds, 300 pounds which is always fun and for anybody who comes to the fair and sees Sue with her mom and babies and then me with my adults mm -hmm. and getting to see the variation in sizes yeah. by breed. Yeah. That's really fun to see. Yeah. It sounds like a lot of different factors are going into your breeding decisions. Can you talk, I know you give a whole presentation usually at the fair on the breeding process that you use, but can you give folks some insight into what they need to be thinking about um, if they're planning to breed uh, their animals? First thing is boar or no boar. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> Boars get big, boars have tusks. Um, so you have to think about that. Mm -hmm. uh, the breeding cycle, like right now, I'm already calculating to breed for spring piglets mm -hmm. because it's three months, three weeks, three days is your gestation. Um, and you have to plan everybody wants piglets at a very set time, like first of May to end of May so that they can get them and uh, so when they say they want their piglets, they want to take possession of their piglets in May. So yeah. they're already two months old. So that way they can have them out before the ground freezes. Mm -hmm. So we have to calculate all of those things in there or somebody else raising them. And if you're raising your own, then you have the, if you're raising them for yourself, not to sell, then you can always breed back so that you're not hitting the congested time for processing. Yeah. And it's easier to get a processing date, but there's, there's a lot to think about. Tons. Yes. There, there are some particular questions coming in just about breeds. And okay. one is from Ben, who's watching over on YouTube. Ben says, um, do you know anything about the traits and characteristics of American guinea hogs? Because it is a breed that they are interested in. I have um, a neighbor had the actual guinea hogs mm -hmm. that I borrowed the boar to breed into my pigs with. Um, they are slower growing, so figure a year and a half to get to your processing mm -hmm. time. Um, they're a pretty nice docile pig. They were, um, you'll find any of these pigs, uh, look at the Livestock Conservancy website and you'll find lots of detailed information. But they used to be raised around the homestead to clean up whatever's around. You don't have to feed them as much, well, yeah. you don't want to feed them as yeah. much grain or they're going to get really fat, yeah. too fat. Yeah. Um, but they're, they are a good pig. They're a nice, friendly, docile pig. And, and a lot of people, there are a lot in the area right now. So yeah. I think Unity College may have some. Okay. So that might be a good source to go you know, check out yeah. if, if they allow it. Yeah, check no, I, I, for sure. There are some interesting heritage breeds um, on that campus, yeah. at least for some time. And a couple more questions about yeah. breed specific coming in. Um, the question is, could you talk a little bit more about Berkshires? How did you get into that breed? What do you like about them? Maybe what are some of the challenges of growing yeah. those guys? Well, the Berkshire I brought in now, I brought in from Iowa. It's, they take their pigs very, very seriously. Mm. Um, the Berkshire I've had in the past just look like all the other pigs I have. Um, if you go on any of the websites, like I got my Berkshire from, it's Fly NK Berks out of Iowa. If you go and look at the pictures of his pigs, you will know exactly why I brought these guys in, because mm. they are denser, 
I mean, they are just, there's no waste on these animals. Mm. Just beautiful. Uh, Berkshire's a really good meat. Um, and the other thing is out there, they actually, they will take, they do progeny tests. So they'll take, say, a litter of um, piglets, young pigs. Yeah. They'll take them to one of the universities to be processed, and they're judged mm. on uh, tenderness, intermuscular, um, marbling, um, loin size, and it's a very coveted title to win this rating. Yeah. Um, and the farm that I bought from, I believe they hold both ratings on their stock. So it just, it's, there's different versions. I mean, right. you can buy a local Berkshire that just looks like all my other pigs, or you can buy, you can invest and buy in one. I just brought in a little girl, the little Berkshire who is running around outside the fence. She is, her bloodline comes out of Ohio. Mm -hmm. Same thing, mm -hmm. same type of pig, a yeah. really high-end pig. And mm -hmm. I think they're gonna go a long way mixing them with my large black and red wattle, which honestly I've given up on large black for a while because there's a lot of genetic problems and physical problems with them. Yeah. So until um, the Livestock Conservancy is bringing in some, they're working in to bring some new genetics in from, from okay. England, where the breed originated from, and are still in better shape. So they're working to help fix our genetics here in the States. Mm -hmm. So maybe once they get a little better, I'll start bringing them back in. Okay. Does that have to do with them being like too closely bred? Yes. Okay. Too closely bred and um, it may have changed, but when I was raising registered stock, there's no standards. Mm -hmm. Like the Berkshire has an incredibly strict standard through the association to register animals. Mm -hmm. Large black was just whatever you wanted to register and set out there. So there was a lot of animals who should never have been bred. Mm -hmm. And it just perpetuates over time. And it's a shame because they're mm. a great pig, mm. great personalities. I was just going to ask about the personality. Oh, what I kind of them. are some, what are some of their traits in terms of how they are? Very friendly, very docile. All of the pigs are very affectionate. If you give a pig a chance to be affectionate, <laughs> <laughs> they will be affectionate. And sometimes if you're, if you're rubbing them, you have to be careful because they will just take you down when they flop yeah. for belly rubs. Yeah. I actually had that question because some of those animals we saw in the video are enormous. So for folks that are starting out that are either smaller people or maybe elders <laughs> or that have, you know, little kids on the homestead, yep. are there... Do you have tips for folks about how to f stay physically safe when interacting with these critters? Biggest thing, especially if you're bringing home young pigs to raise yourself, is socialize them. Mm -hmm. That is the biggest thing. If you socialize them, you rub them, they get used to, they want to come up to you, yeah. and they're going to rub and love, it, it, they're pretty much going to stay that way. Mm -hmm. Now, not every pig is going to socialize. Some are just snarky, and you, you're not going to get over yeah. that. But most of the old breeds, they will socialize yeah. fine. And I mean, you couldn't really see a lot of the times when I was talking, I had pigs just leaning you could into hear me. <laughs> you could hear Nancy and they're, you know, anywhere, my pigs are anywhere, my adults are five to 600 pounds mm -hmm. and I have no problems. Mm -hmm. We can just love and rub and all that good yeah. stuff. And when I need them to come to me, I could just clap my hands and call them and, yeah. and they come. So the more you can socialize your pigs, the better their life is, the better your experience is. You know, it just, you know, treat them kind of like a puppy when, yeah. you're, when you're starting out. Don't let them nip. Stop them from nipping. <laughs> and if they get behind you when you're trying to feed, a lot of people have problems where they, they kind of, they get behind you and knock you over. Just, yeah. just swing a small stick. Just, you're swinging it just to keep them from getting under your legs, and then mm -hmm. they'll go around you. Mm -hmm. But you just, you have to train them. Because it's not fun to get knocked over. You know, right. I am small, so, you yeah. know, you have to be careful. And I farm alone, so I'm out there by myself. Yeah. You know, and if I fall down and get trampled by the pigs, nobody's going to know. <laughs> no, I think safety is a serious consideration, right? Cause, yeah. And then, like, if you yes. compound on, like, a wet day, an icy day. Icy, yes. Um, so Mud. it is something serious to yep. think about. So yeah. speaking of the ground conditions, um, you were talking about in the video about how they'll just kind of turn over yes. the, the ground in hours or minutes. Um, can you talk a little bit about impacts on the landscape, both positive and negative, um, and how someone might integrate um, some critters into the way that they're managing their property? Yeah. Um, I started out with the large black, and I had them in a field that has a wicked slope 
because I have very little flat land, mm -hmm. um, and they graze. Yeah. So it was never an issue. And then when I got the red wattles, I put three red wattles in the same, it's like a couple acre space, and within three days they had turned every inch of that soil over, every bit, which I didn't want because it's a wicked slope. Yeah. Um, so you have to think about it, about where you're doing, and if you don't want them to do too much turning, you need to move them, just keep moving them and then you can just keep cycling them through. You know, sometimes you want them to nuke an area, like yeah. you, you want them to kind of dig up stuff so you can stay longer. Um, the more confined the space is, the more impact they're gonna have on the ground, obviously. Mm -hmm. Wet weather is the hardest because all those little hooves just churn everything up to the point where if you step in, you're stuck, you step out of your boot, it's so muddy. Mm -hmm. um, and then when that dries, you know, it's gonna dry harder every time. Mm -hmm. So if you want a garden there, then you're gonna to wanna to be careful and move them out faster if you can, or just be prepared to really have to break through that soil. One of the things I noticed in the video is that in addition to having some kind of like more pasture type areas, and then, you know, as you said, there was a hard surface area for feeding when the ground is wet, there's also woodland areas. Mm -hmm. um, and usually you co-present with Sue Frank, right? Yes, Sue Frank. Who talks about the using the pigs in the forest. Yes. And I'm wondering if you can shine a little bit of a light on um, that world, um, even though I know that's her Well, my, my land was all trees. Okay. It was trees. Um, and I don't know, I guess you'd have to look back at some of the, the pictures and see all the dead trees behind me because what happens is first they were, and this has been probably 10 years in that space, they first go through and start killing off the undergrowth. And it, because I have more area, that mm -hmm. takes longer. That took a few years. And then they started going through and all the softwoods, they love to rip the bark off the softwoods, mm. which is handy. Some of the stuff, if you want lumber, your hemlock, yeah. they, they, they peel your hemlock yeah. for you. And then when it dies and dries a little bit, it's ready for lumber. Yeah. Your firewood, as they slowly mm -hmm. kill off the trees, just go out and cut it. There's your firewood. And then you just are slowly opening up the area if that's what you want. Mm -hmm. If that's not what you want, then you just, one, don't have as many pigs mm -hmm. and you don't keep them in the same space over and over because they will eventually kill off the trees. Right. But then you can go in and stomp and turn it into a pasture. Awesome. So that's where near fencing needs to be really good. If you intentionally want them to be in A area but not B area, um, yes. that's when all those fencing innovations <laughs> come yes. in. Yes, and no matter how much fencing you have, they will get out. As you notice in the video, the, the pigs right now, they get, they'll yeep at, when they touch this spot right here mm -hmm. that is fed by this fence, but then they walk through this fence. I'm like, really, seriously, stop. But right. they're more controlled in my place. But I did have one go visit the neighbors a couple of days ago, which is fine, my neighbors are cool about it. He just went, one of the big spotted ones in the video decided to go to the neighbors. Um, and usually, no problem, I just grab a bag of you know, I grab some treats, I mm -hmm. have a little bit of grain, I shake the grain, they come right to me, we go trundling back home. Yeah. He found acorns in the woods. Yeah. He didn't, he, <laughs> acorns trump everything. So I, it took a little while to get him home, but we eventually wandered back home and, you know, so it was no problem and my neighbors are really good about it. Acorns sound like something that would be fantastic to be feeding a pig Absolutely. if you have them. Absolutely. Is there anything, I mean, of course, and pigs have this reputation of like, you throw the slop out, they'll eat whatever. Is there anything that you would advise um, new growers to not send out in the slop bucket to their pigs? Well, first of all, when you get, most people go to the local convenience store and they get their compost or slop or yeah. whatever. And, and I've been with people where they just heave it in without, looking at it first. Yeah. So um, even when I used to get years ago, I would get the compost from uh, Belfast Co-op. Mm -hmm. Well, their compost is they took an end of your veggies that have a rubber band on it and mm. they whacked off the mm. end. So the rubber band and all is in that compost. Yeah. Um, people throw coffee stirs in there. They yeah. throw in tea bags with the strings. And yeah, yeah. So you, and, you just, a twist ties. Mm. So you need to sort it. Mm -hmm. You need to sort it. Um, I, one thing I don't know if it showed up in the video is um, if you are feeding slop, you are supposed to cook it. Ah. It's actually a state law. Okay. Especially if you are like, I sell my meat to restaurants and so forth. So yeah. if I were feeding that, which I tend not to because it's just 
with that many pigs, a little bucket, it's just, I give them all my kitchen scraps. Mm -hmm. But if you are going to feed slop, you are supposed to cook it. Okay. You're supposed to bring it up to, it's somewhere between 185 and 200 and some degrees, because mm -hmm. you have to kill off the bacteria that's in there, because things like trichinosis, all of that totally. still exists. So you are supposed to do that. I don't know anybody who does, mm -hmm. but you are supposed to. Yeah. So, and, and mold. Try to avoid as much mold as possible. I mean, they can have a little moldy food. If it's not gonna make you sick, it's mm. not gonna make them sick. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people go and they get lots and lots of the bread. They yeah. get like bundles of yeah. bread. And um, I had somebody get in touch with me because his pig was sick. And you know, he's asking me what about this right. and what about that. And I finally got down to the point of what are you feeding them? Mm -hmm. And he was feeding the bread. I'm like, is it moldy? Yes. Okay, so think about what you just told me. Right. You're feeding your pig mold. Right. Of course he's sick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you just have to watch out for things like that. There was a question earlier about, um, about whether folks could get in touch with you to buy pigs or to ask more questions. And I'll, I'll reframe it in case you don't want people coming to you with questions. But certainly if you have pigs for sale, please share with us and let us know how to get them. But mm -hmm. I'd love to hear... Um, some great resources that, that you know of that pig growers beginning, you know, middle advanced should be aware of. So well, that was many part question. I'll go back to if folks, do you have pigs for sale? Do you, are you selling out piglings ever that folks could get access to? I sell piglets in the spring. Okay. I'm already, my regular customers are already in contact, okay. um, sending deposits for next yeah. year. So I don't know that I would have any available. Okay. Um, but you never know. Okay. And people usually contact me from the fair. Um, you can use my email address. I don't know if it's beanscornerfarm at fairpoint.net. And I warn you, I only check my email about once a week. So don't, you know. Yeah. Don't think I missed you. And I also, just, I, I think before people holler at you with a lot of detailed questions that mm -hmm. you they're asking you to answer for free, I think it would be great to hear what some of your favorite resources are for raising um, pigs. You mentioned in the video the stories guide, which I know lots of people yeah, use as a reference, but are there other ones that people should be looking for um, from the library or looking for resources online that have helped Honestly, you? the most that I read are reproductions of old books from the 1800s to the 1900s because I want to know how mm. they did it before. I don't necessarily want to do everything because yeah. they used to think it was okay to like put kerosene on your pigs, which I don't think we're going to do today, but there's uh, Google Books has, if you just go in and put swine, swine husbandry, you will find all sorts of books. I have, and I usually bring them to the fair, um, all sorts of books on raising swine and um, from, again, from the late 1800s to the like 1920s. And there's so much interesting information cool. because they were, that was more geared for not motorized, not electric. Yeah. So. And, that, and you get, again, you're not going to do everything they say, but it gives you ideas and just really checking other people. Yeah. Looking around. YouTube. Joel Salatin has so much good mm -hmm. content on YouTube. Um, speaking of YouTube, a question came in from Valerie, and this is a continuation of what we were discussing regarding um, putting pigs in the woods. Any specific um, breeds that are better suited for that application? Any of the old breeds okay. are good. They're meant to be outdoors. Okay. They are not meant to be kept in cap captivity, which is why their numbers, one of the reasons their numbers drop so low. The other reason mm. is everybody started going, even a hundred years ago, they started going towards more lean. Yeah. But, um, and if you look at the pictures, if you go online and look at some of the old pictures of what a Berkshire, you saw my Berkshire. Mm -hmm. If you look at the picture, I wish I had it with me. I mean, they were just like these <laughs> rotund <laughs> because they raised them differently. Yeah. So, but um, I know there's a lot to be, yeah, a lot to look at. But but the heritage breeds are meant to be outdoors. Uh, pink pigs, sunburn. So make sure ah. you've got. Don't freak out, but make sure they've got shade. Make sure any of them yeah. have shade. But yeah, yeah. Pink pigs sunburn. I didn't know that. And they don't sweat. Pigs don't sweat, mm -hmm. so they need. Uh, water source like that big tub they climb in there and they they get all wet and everything um, otherwise a wallow because they need to cool down and a wallow helps the mud helps get the biting flies and stuff off mm -hmm. them as well helps protect them from that earlier when you were talking about the 
the registered um, breeds who've been assessed by the university and whatever you're talking about, the fat marble and all this. And I was like, well, I'm a little bit hungry now. <laughs> so one question I had, and this is maybe a little dorky, but it's like you had such a, a great rapport with all the animals around you and everybody's got a name and a personality that you mm -hmm. clearly know. Um, can you talk about how that those relationships um, kind of play out as you're sending some of them to slaughter and to become food and to you know be part of the food system kind of sometimes I cry yeah <laughs> but I, I look at it this way they are giving they're the making the ultimate sacrifice mm -hmm. to us so they should have the best life they can possibly have mm -hmm. and the best ending they can possibly have that's where it's so important on finding the right processor, making sure they handle the animals humanely and mm. well, make sure that you have a good way to transport them that isn't stressing them, that isn't injuring them. Um, it's our responsibility to make sure that their end is as good as their life. Mm -hmm. And that's so important. To me, that's, that's like really important. Um, so we're just about ready to wrap up. Mary, it's been really great to have you. Is there anything else that um, folks should know before we sign off? It's hard to say because um, there's a million things they could know about There's so many things pigs. to say. Just <laughs> the big thing, pigs are really cool. Pigs are very affectionate. And not one pig needs to have at least two because they are affectionate and they need each other. They need each other. Just like us, they need each other. They do. Um, Thank you very much, Mary. It's great to have you. Thanks. Out, come see us next year. Yeah, hopefully. We'll be here with all the pigs next year again. Yeah, two talks a day. We will be. A whole talk focused on, on forestry, too, with, um, with Sue, and mm -hmm. um, just kind of scratching the surface. But. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, thanks for sticking with us, y'all. We're going to head over to the country store, back to Ryan Dennett. Thanks. It was so nice to hear from Mary. I have to share that I too raised pigs and I started off back in 2012 with several litters from Mary. And um, part of the reason we got into breeding our own pigs was that we wanted to have more and more litters. They weren't always available from Mary and we could not find any other sources that rivaled the quality of hers. So take her advice. She knows how to grow a fantastic pig. Um, I just want to remind everyone that if you're watching through the Facebook live stream, we um, can go up to eight hours with a live stream and we're going to be hitting that limit soon. So we'll be starting a new live stream. If you find the live stream stops for you, you can just hit refresh and this should not be an issue for you if you're watching at fair.mafa.org or on YouTube. Um, as Sarah mentioned in our last transition, this has been a really tough year for farmers and a really important year to support MOFCA and the work we're doing to help folks. Um, I work in the Farmer Programs Department. I have eight other staff working with me, and we've been working really hard this year to help farmers pivot to finding sources of PPE, uh, establishing hygiene protocols on their farm, learning how to adopt um, online platforms to sell their food and, and pivot to new markets. Um, on top of that, parenting got really hard for a lot of farmers who lost their childcare. Uh, we've been holding regular um, sessions where par parents can get together online and talk about their strategies. I know um, a number of farmers had some big piles of sand dumped on their farm this spring just to like keep the kids occupied and safe. Um, and it's been a, a really important place for parents to connect with each other. And then on top of everything else, we're in a drought. Uh, this coming Tuesday, we're offering a webinar for farmers where they can learn about a, a novel shallow well design that they can dig themselves. So we're constantly in communication with farmers and trying to connect them with resources and, and help them out. And you can help us do that by becoming a, me a member or making a donation at mofka.org. Normally, I would be sharing all this information about our programs with you um, at the Mafka tent at the fair is sort of where I camp out. Uh, but the number one question I get there is, where can I get that t-shirt? Um, and I can still point you in the right direction. We have all of our t-shirts for sale at fair.mafka.org. And um, you don't have to wait in line this year. We've got shirts all over the place here, and we're willing to send them to you. So please visit fair.mafka.org. And while you're there, you can visit the online marketplace. We have 
200 vendors and um, you can buy, you know, I'm just thinking of another visual that I missed from the fair are those folks that are walking around with their bags of raw fleece. And you can buy raw fleece, you can buy sp spun yarn, knit socks, and sheepskins at the marketplace at fair.mafka.org. Um, we also have all sorts of artwork, pottery, food, you can still support, you know, it's great, we want you to be supporting us to help farmers. You can support those farmers ourselves, uh, themselves. A lot of them earn a lot of their annual income at the farmer's market, at the fair, and you can still support them by shopping at the marketplace at fair.mafka.org. Um, and circling back to fleece, um, I also raise sheep every year. I would be selling my raw fleeces in the fleece tent and really loved like getting to be part of that community, um, connecting with other shepherds, and have learned a lot about uh, the qualities of fleece and how to, how to produce better fleeces by um, participating in the raw fleece tent. And coming up soon, we're gonna switch to um, a video from Stacy Beyer of Pumpkin Hill Farm in Dixmont. And she's been the coordinator of the fleece speaker tent since 2015. So she has a lot of expertise to share with us. Um, so I'm really looking forward to that. She's gonna be talking with us about uh, natural dyeing with goldenrod. And that's one of the hands-on activities that you would be able to see at the fair. Um, and we're so thankful that we're still gonna to get to present that to you today. Um, and I'm really looking forward to doing some Q&A with her after. Uh, I myself have not um, tried out dyeing with natural fleeces, so I think I've got a lot to learn, and I'm really excited to hear from her and share that all with you. And now we're going to present Stacy Breyer. Hi, my name is Stacy Breyer, and I live in Dixmont, Maine. Prior to moving to Dixmont three years ago, my husband and I had a farm in Levant, Maine. Among other critters, we raised sheep and goat. I have knit since I was very young, but I learned to spin yarn while living on the farm. I also became very interested in dyeing natural fibers with plants that are locally grown. I have dyed with the classics, indigo, madder, weld, and a host of other plants from my backyard. Goldenrod is a common wildflower in Maine that can be used to dye wool and other natural fibers. It has a bad rap for causing allergies, but ragweed is the plant that actually causes the problem. Ragweed isn't easy to see and blooms at the same time as many goldenrods. The pollen of the goldenrod flower is too heavy to be spread by the wind. In the past, I would have looked at a field of goldenrod like this and said, look at all the goldenrod flowers. Thinking of goldenrod as a single plant species and tell a coworker of mine who studied goldenrods in college came over to my house and walked around. I didn't know that goldenrod isn't a single plant species. I learned that there are hundreds of species of goldenrod and that I have six of them in my six acre field. Once I learned about the different species in my field, I got the idea of doing a study to see if the different species of goldenrod would die differently. The species that I have in my field include early goldenrod or Saladago junkio. Early goldenrod is a tall growing plant. It has smooth leaves and notably has a basal rosette or a ring of leaves at the base of the plant. Another species that I have is the Canada goldenrod. This is a relatively ubiquitous plant and one that most people think of as being goldenrod in their fields. Canada goldenrod or Saladago canadensis is also relatively tall growing. It has veining on the leaf. So if you look at the close up picture of the leaves, you can see um, all the veins in the leaves. And it also does not have 
a basil rosette or a circle ring of leaves at the bottom of the plant. So this plant isn't actually in the goldenrod genus anymore. It used to be in the goldenrod genus, but botanists have now decided that it fits better in a different plant genus. This is grass leaf goldenrod. I kept it in the study because it still has goldenrod in its common name, and it also works pretty well in dyeing wool. The plant is grass leaf goldenrod or Euthamia graminifola, a medium to tall growing plant and distinctively is very flat on the top. It has really thin grass-like leaves that can have black leaf spots on them. Another goldenrod that I have is the gray goldenrod or Saladego nemoralis. This species of goldenrod is relatively lower growing. The flowers are in single spikes and they have a nodding shape to them. Then I have the rough stem goldenrod. During the study, my coworker and I started calling this the hairy goldenrod, and that is likely what I'm going to call it forever. The rough stemmed goldenrod, or Solidago rugosa, again is another relatively tall growing goldenrod. The leaves are wider, and the stem is very distinctively hairy, no basal rosette. Lastly, I have the tall goldenrod. This plant is really hard to tell from the Canada goldenrod. Thankfully, I had some with, someone with me in my field that could identify it during the study. I'm not sure that I'll be able to distinguish it from the Canada goldenrod. Again, this is something I plan to work on over time, but based on the dive bath results, it isn't really a high priority for me. So tall goldenrod is Saladego altissima, very tall growing, uh, later blooming, and has, according to the reports, thicker and firmer leaves. I used two yard samples of a two ply hand spun yarn in my dye study. The yarn was a blend of 80% merino wool and 20% angora rabbit. I used a combination of twist ties and bread ties to help keep track of the sample during the dyeing process. To dye natural fibers, often you need a metal or mordant to bind the pigment of color from the plant to the fiber. That helps with wash and light fastness. I tried two different metals as mordants, alum with cream of tartar and iron. The iron came from the filtrate on our drinking water well. When we switch out the filter, I collect some of the filtrate for use in dyeing. I know that my water is high in iron, so the filtrate is also pretty high in iron. I simmered each of the samples of wool in its mordant for 30 minutes and then let them cool overnight. Each species of goldenrod had its own labeled quart jar with four ounces of, five, of flowers. I simmered the flowers for 30 minutes and then let them cool overnight. So each quart of boiled flowers had to be strained out individually to keep the flower species dye baths separate throughout the process. This shows the results from my notebook for the study. The first page has samples with the alum and cream of tartar mortar that were only left for 15 minutes in a simmering dye bath for the flowers. Notes in the second page kept track of my study data, including the fiber type and quantity, mordant type and quantity, plant type and quantity, and the simmering time. What I found was there was variation between species, albeit somewhat subtle at times. My favorite from this dye bath 
was the early goldenrod. And you can see that sample down near the bottom. It's the second to the last sample in the picture. The early goldenrod produced a pretty intense golden yellow right away. Although most of the study was done in September of 2019, the early goldenrod run was done this spring in 2020. Early goldenrod had gone by in September 2019 when I was running the rest of the flowers. The one thing about natural dyeing with flowers is timing can be really important. I'm pretty sure that I hit the early goldenrod just right because I was competing with the bees for the flowers in the field. The original color of the fiber is shown at the bottom of each of the notebook sample pages so you can see the difference that resulted from the dyeing process. So this slide doesn't really do the colors justice. This is a picture of the samples with the alum and cream of tartar mordant after a 30 minute simmer in the dye bath. I also left the samples in the dye bath overnight. Gray goldenrod produced a nice yellow. Tall and Canada goldenrod were a bit darker in color. Early goldenrod down near the very bottom was a nice gold. Rough stemmed, my hairy goldenrod, had a very nice green shade. I'm particularly fond of the green that I got from the hairy since I like green better than yellow as a color. I'm going to try a full project creating a yarn for a garment using the flowers from the rough stemmed or hairy goldenrod sometime in the future. Again, the original color of the fiber is at the bottom. So here are the samples from the iron mordant and a 30 minute dye bath simmer. I didn't really see much in the 15 minute dye bath so I just left all the samples in for the full 30 minutes and let them cool in the dye bath overnight. The iron, true to its nature, dulled the colors. However, I didn't see a significant change in shade. I was really hoping that the green would get greener, but I really didn't see that in my study. So I also tried using an ammonia dip on some samples after the 30 minute simmer and, a, oh, and an overnight soak. Often changing the pH can create an interesting result with a dye bath, but I wasn't too impressed with the results in this case. The gray goldenrod turned out almost a mustard color and the others um, were a little bit washed out. So I'm not recommending um, using a an ammonia dip after um, this kind of a dye process for goldenrod. So thank you for your interest in my goldenrod species dye study. I would be happy to answer any questions that you have. I will be available live online after this presentation and I hope everybody enjoys the virtual Commons, Common Ground Fair of 2020. Thank you. Hi, we're here with Stacy to do a live Q&A to follow up with her video presentation. Thanks for joining us today, Stacy. You're welcome. I'm glad to be here. Uh, well, we have one question already. Uh, Quinn wants to know, do you have any books or resources you would recommend if someone was interested in learning more about natural dyes? Quinn is a knitter and a spinner and always looking to do more with fibers. Great. Um, there are a lot of resources available, both on the internet and, and as books. I do have um, three books that I go to on a regular basis. One is called Wild Color, and that's by Jenny Dean. And then I have Harvesting Color, and that's uh, Rebecca Burgess. And then the last one that's, that's a good one, I think, is um, Craft of the Dyer, and that's um, Karen Lee Castleman is the author for that book. So three good ones to get started. Great, thank you. Uh, let's see, what tips do you have for someone who has never died before? Are there any beginner mistakes we should be aware of? I don't think there's any, you know, particular mistakes that you need to be aware of. The natural dying is always a surprise. 
Um, you can, with even the same plants with different water conditions, different growing conditions, you can end up with different colors. So I just like to experiment and, and have fun. Um, I would start with, you know, with plants that are readily available around you. Goldenrod was one I've got a lot in my field, um, but there's all kinds of natural plants out there available and I just, I just get started and try it. <laughs> um, I'm wondering where there is sort of that, I guess, unexpected variation. Is there like a minimum number of skate, like do you dye for a, a single project or if you're, if you're just wanting to dye some yarn, should you dye a certain amount? Um, in one batch? A lot of the dyeing that I've been doing is in small samples, just so I can get used to it. I, I'll um, do just you know, two yard samples and see how it goes. Um, and then once I'm comfortable with a particular plant and the variety that might end up um, in your end product, then I then I'd, um, do a larger project. For example, I did on, on the, the um, dyeing with, um, Goldenrod in the field. You know, I had one particular species that I did. I like the colors so ready to go do a larger, you know, full game, loose game project. Could you talk more about uh, local plants are good for beginners? Uh, the questioner says they've also heard that onion skins are good for starting out, and they'd like to know what your thoughts are. Yeah. Onion skins are, um, are good for starting out. Um, onion skins have yielded a yellow for me primarily. One dye project that I really loved was I did an, an indigo dye and then over dyed with onion skins and got a variegated bluish green. It was, it was gorgeous. That was probably my favorite dye project. Um, some other plants, I've got a, a sumac going right now outside, um, doing a solar dye with sumac. Um, that's available right now. Um, some other pansy, if, that's, a, that's an invasive, but if you find a patch of it, that's um, it's a really easy plant to dye with, and it's a good use of getting rid of an invasive species, so get, all of, get all the flowers. Um, Let's see, what else is out there that I've tried? I've, most of the work that I've been doing is, is things that I've grown in the garden, um, like Cosmos and Indigo, Weld, some of the classics that I, I grow in the garden. Um, trying to think of some other wild harvest ones that I've done. Um, I've done Queen Anne's Lace, can result in a nice, nice color. Um, what else is out there? It's, it's all I can think. Like most of most of my natural dyeing has actually been from from plants that I grow from seed in the garden. Um, going back to the question about beginner mistakes, what do you do if you aren't happy with the outcome? One thing that you can do is over dye with something else. If you don't like the color that you got from one, try something that would end up with a little bit different or a little bit darker color. So for example, um, you know, if it came up with a, a light pale yellow that you don't like, you could try Cosmos, it's an orange, and it would over dye that and change the color. Um, I've had some indigo not, for some reason or another, come out really light and I just do it again. Um, just put it back through the, the dye bath and see um, if that could come out with a color that you're, you're, you're happier with. Uh, we have a question. Do you find natural dyes fade over time? The, if you use a natural dye that's been tested for, for light fastness and wash, washing fastness, then no, it shouldn't. Um, there, you know, there's some, if you do a berry, those are, are not light, sense, uh, light fast or water fast. Um, so if you have them in the light or if you wash it, those will fade over time. But if you, if you look up a, a resource, a dye book, and it's a species that has been tested over time and it is light fast and wash, wash fast, you should be fine. I haven't, haven't had any trouble with that. Um, sort of, how do you know that you're ready to, to try more challenging dye projects? And can you tell us a little bit about what those might be? Sure. Um, for, 
For most plants, the process of dying is the same. It's you boil the flowers or the leaves, whichever is, is rated for dying. Um, you strain it and then you put in your, your dye. Um, there's, you can either you know, use a, a water bath or you can steam it or you can use a solar dye, but it's pretty much the same process. If you get into something like indigo, or woad, that's a much more challenging process or lichen dyeing because there's more steps involved and there's chemical processes that you have to get right in order to end up with the color that you're looking for. Indigo, there's, there's several steps to get to the blue color that you need. And it's, uh, it's, it's probably a four hour process from the point where you start picking the leaves to, to getting a finished product. So there's much more involved with that. And lichen dyes can take, um, you know, you have to mix it with, with ammonia and let it sit for months and months and months to get the color right. So, so those are a more challenging uh, dye project, but, you know, you know, marigolds and yarrows or goldenrod, those processes are pretty much the same for, for every plant. So, and it's pretty straightforward. Does the dyeing ever change the feel of your yarn for better or for worse? If you're careful in the dye process, it should not. Um, if the one thing that you don't want to do when you're dyeing is boil your yarn, if you're dyeing particularly wool, which is what I do most of, if you if you boil it, if you have a vigorous boil, if you're stirring it hard, you can felt it and you don't want to do that. So what you want to do is bring the temperature of the water up slowly, if you want to uh, stir it, you stir it very gently and you, you don't want to agitate it or get it really in a rolling boil because then, then you're going to felt it um, and not be happy with the result. Uh, you mentioned solar dye a couple of minutes ago. Could you explain that more? Sure. Um, what I've got going on right now is I'm dyeing a, a wool sample in sumac flowers. So what I did is the day before yesterday, I took and harvested the sumac flowers, put them in water in a, in a quart mason jar and just set it out in the sun. Um, you could also use any kind of clear plastic tote and, and let it heat up in the sun for a day and overnight. And then I take and, and strain all the flowers out, put the, the dye bath back in the mason jar or, the, or clear tote and put the wool in. And, and I had it sitting outside all day in the sun, heating up you need that heat to bind the pigments to the fiber and I'll leave it overnight and then I'll, I'll take it out and rinse it. So it's, um, it's a way to get the fibers up, you know, the temperature up to bind the pigments to the, to the fiber, but not have to do it inside when it's hot. So. Now we had a question, what fabric or fiber holds color the best? The, you can have different fibers and they'll react differently. Um, Fibers that dye really well are wool, angora rabbit, um, mohair, silk. There's, those are all protein fibers that dye really well. Some of the plant-based um, fibers will also dye um, reasonably well, like um, cottons and um, bamboos, some of the, the, those, but it, it's usually a different type of dye. Um, and they'll react differently. You'll get a different color. So it's something you just need to experiment with or read. read the books. The, the resources that I have will tell you whether it's on a particular fiber or not and what colors you'll get, um, or you should get, <laughs> um, if you give that a try. Uh, we had a question uh, wanting to know if there's anything that you have dyed that you've made into um, clothing items or a blanket, what, what are you usually using your dye projects to make? I mean, you mentioned samples, but are you creating anything? Yeah, I've, uh, I've made socks mostly from the wool yarn that I dyed. Um, I've got a pair of socks that I did, um, I did actually, that was food, food coloring, solar dyed with food coloring that I, that I turned um, into a nice pair of socks. Um, Turmeric dye socks, the, a lot of what I've been doing, because I, I haven't been doing this all that long, is just doing samples, though. 
Um, we did have a question from someone who missed the beginning of the presentation. So if this has, she, they apologize if this has already been answered, but what breed of sheep is the dyeing done on in your presentation? In the presentation, that was a Merino and Angora blend. I think it was an 80% Merino, 20% Angora blend. And there's not really much variation among wool fibers as to what's most suitable for natural dyeing. Other, than, It's just really the felting concern. I think so, yeah. If you blend the fibers, so if you have a, a wool and you blend with Angora or with mohair, then the wool and the mohair, the wool and Angora might take the color differently. So you end up with a little bit of um, variation, slight variation of any um, Angora, the mohair has a luster to it, so it gives a different look. Um, so you did mention a project that you're, a dyeing project you're working on now. Can you tell us what you're going to be doing with that? Uh, the, I was just playing with the sumac, so that's just a sample. Um, I also have um, in the dye bath right now wool with a lichen dye. And I've been working on trying to dye all the colors of the rainbow with natural plant dyes, plants from Maine, harvested in Maine. And the lichen was from Maine. Um, I've been really struggling with trying to get purple and it's coming out a really nice purple, <laughs> really nice purple. I'm excited about it. Um, the thing with lichen is you have to be really careful about collecting it. Um, it is a slow growing plant species. Um, takes you know, hundreds of years to grow a colony. So I typically will harvest my lichen from the ground. You know, after a windstorm, the, the lichen that's come off the rocks, I, I've been using a, a lichen that's a, that's a black, the black leathery lichen that grows on rocks, but I collect it off the ground so that I'm not harvesting from the live colony. And that one, you know, if you make a dye bath with ammonia, like I said, it takes months or almost a year to get the chemical change from red to purple. Um, but I did get one that, uh, that did change to purple and it's gonna be a nice color. So the only color I have left is red. Um, I harvested some madder root today. I'm gonna dry that. It's gonna be you know, probably a month or so before I try madder again. The last time I tried madder, um, went through the whole process and it, uh, it ended up with a very beautiful rusty orange, but it wasn't red. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to try that again and see if I can get red. It's my last color. Will you be sharing your rainbow project and will you be publishing a list of what you use to create the rainbow? Again, yeah. I'm interested in doing that. If I can successfully get the rainbow. Yeah. That's great. And when you're harvesting the lichen, because it's already dead, it doesn't matter what time of year you're harvesting it? No, I don't think so. Uh, we have a question from Donna who would like to know, if you buy undyed yarn to dye, do you have to pre-treat it somehow? You do want to wash it. If you're buying a commercial yarn, there's a possibility that they used a spin oil in the process of spinning the yarn. And if that oil, spinning oil is still on it, it's not going to take the dye as well. So you do want to wash a commercial yarn before you dye it to try to get some of that oil off. So um, there are some, some good soap products out there that you can use um, to wash the yarn with. Um, often I will just use Dawn dish detergent. Um, it tends to get oils out pretty pretty quickly. Some other folks don't like using that, but it's readily available. But you do, you do want to wash it. And then if you're doing a dye, most dye projects, as I talked about in the presentation, you need to use a mordant. Um, it's a, a metal that will bind the pigment to the wool fibers or you know, whatever natural fiber you're using. Most natural plants will require some kind of mordant. The mordant I like to use the most is alum and cream of tartar um, because it's a, a little bit more environmentally friendly metal um, to use, but you will, you'll need it to wash out the oils and use a mordant for most natural dyes. All right. Well, thank you so much, Stacey. Um, I really appreciate you sharing your expertise with us today. You're welcome. And now we'll send it over to Sarah. Thank you, Ryan. And thanks, Stacey, for your great presentation. Um, we're coming right down to the end of the fair. It's the time of Sunday evening when you would normally hear that 
announcement come over the loudspeaker and you'd run to get your last, I don't know, fried shiitake mushroom if you're me or whatever those other treats are. Um, but tonight we're ending the programming with um, some really sweet music that's a kind of a landmark of Common Ground Fair. I know I saw these women performing together for the first time at the fair in 2004. So that's 16 years ago. Uh, but they've been playing together for over 30 years. Inanna Sisters in Rhythm is a super dynamic group of Maine women who have studied with drumming masters from around the world. They've brought in uh, they have brought their music into schools and communities all around Maine and of course to the fair every year where not only are they presenting really fun, um, vibrant music, but they're also dressed in fantastic outfits and dancing and it's just like super vibrant and super vital and just kind of a perfect cap to a weekend full of amazing programming here at Common Ground Fair. Um, these folks have um, put out over seven records in the history of their uh, performance. And it's really just kind of scratches the surface um, of all the different kinds of great music that comes across the stage at Common Ground Fair. Something for sure to look forward to next year. Something that you can actually look back at um, because each evening of this year's programming, there has been a bit of live music. So check that out. Um, and stick with us for the next half hour or so to listen in on Inanna. Thank you. Welcome, Common Ground Fair viewers, near and far. We are Inanna Sisters in Rhythm with special guest, Paul D'Alessio. Enjoy the show. <laughs>
Thank you. So we'd like to dedicate our performance to all of our teachers who through their kindness throughout the years have shared with us their musical traditions, their rhythmic traditions and their cultures and have given us their blessing to play this music. And we also want to send out um, our appreciation for all teachers who right now are really facing challenges to do the work that they do. And we really honor you all. So thank you. And that first song was called Jagba. We learned it from our teacher, our beloved Famadou Konate, who is from Guinea. He's Malinke. And it's a rhythm that's played at the end of um, Ramadan. It's a celebration. And uh, I think that's... Oh, I'm going to tell you about the next couple of songs, which um, are Yoruba. And uh, the first one... I learned from Issei Barnwell of Sweet Honey in the Rock, and it's called Ishe Olua. And it basically translates as that which the Creator has made will never be destroyed. It's really singing to that part of ourselves that's indestructible. And that will be followed by um, a chant to Obatala, who's this is also a Yoruba chant. Obatala is a, a Risha or a deity who is known for his compassion and also for is associated with honesty, purpose, purity, and peace, which are all qualities that we really need right now. So I learned this chant from Michael Wingfield, who's from Portland, another teacher.
Thank you. So we're so excited to um, be a part of this online event for the Common Ground Fair. It's such an amazing fair that, um, that supports local Maine music, local Maine artists, um, craftsmen, farmers. And speaking of farmers, we have a really great song coming up next that um, Anna Gret's going to tell you about. Thank you. So this next song um, and rhythm are in a family of rhythms from Guinea, West Africa, that are still to this day played for the farmers on the field while they're working their fields and hoeing or planting in rhythm to the drums. And the family of rhythms is called Casa. And the song I discovered actually online, as you know, the world is endless these days and you can find so many things out that other people have learned in their travels. And this song I came across and thought this would be something for the band. So we incorporated it in our um, rich repertoire of songs. And so we're going to start with a beautiful song called Kodonba, and accompanied by Paul D'Alessio on guitar. And then we're moving into the very exciting and uplifting rhythm, Casa.
you a big thank you to um, our sound man, Jeb Enoch. And a shout to out to our, the main music mill as well. And, um, and to John Trees, who's filming this for us. And thank you so much. We love you. Yeah. We love you. Hi, I'm Sarah Alexander, Executive Director of the Maine Organic Farmers and Gardeners Association. And I'm April Boucher, Director of the Common Ground Country Fair. And here we are, we made it, it's Sunday evening. Hopefully you've been tuning in throughout the weekend for the first ever online Common Ground Country Fair. This was our 44th annual fair, but the first time that we've ever been online. And what a weekend it was. There were so many great activities that happened, demonstrations, workshops. We had our keynote speakers, Leah Penniman on Friday, Barbara Damrosh on Saturday, and Winona LaDuc on Sunday. And um, the fan favorite sheepdogs did not disappoint. It was great to meet them on camera and get to learn more about how they work year round outside of the fair. Um, so even though we couldn't gather together, we hope that you learned just as much as you would learn in a normal fair and maybe saved a few calories from not eating all that fair food that you would have eaten if you were here on the grounds with us. Um, but tell us about what's coming up next, April. So for everyone who wants the fair to be more than three days and in fact would love a year-round fair, we now have a year-round fair on our Common Ground Country Fair website, fair.mofka.org. And you can go to Learn and Content Library, and we have over 30 videos. Some of them have not been aired during the live stream, so be sure to tune in for videos from the Maine Indian Basket Makers, our Low Impact Forestry Program, and all these other great educational videos that you can watch at any time that's convenient for you. And also that we're gonna have the live stream available. So if you missed a part during the live stream this past weekend, we will be archiving it there on the content library so you can watch it time and time again so you can get your sauerkraut recipe right and uh, just enjoy the fair year round. Yeah, and if you happen to miss out on getting your Common Ground Country Fair merchandise, April and I are wearing the beautiful Bee Bomb shirts from this year. Um, that, those are also still available and you can get them online. They're on the online store right now and you can just go to the fair website and click on shop and you'll be able to see all the bags and aprons and shirts and everything we still have left. Um, one other thing that maybe you haven't had a chance to do yet is to renew your MOFCA membership or to maybe join as a member of MOFCA. And you can do that right on the website as well. This year is more important than ever to support MOFCA and the farmers and gardeners um, in our year-round educational work. The fair is always an important time of year to help us with our budget, and this year is no different. So we hope you'll step up and renew, renew your membership or join this year as well. And for everyone who didn't get all your holiday shopping done in the past three days on our online marketplace, fear not because it's actually going to be live and going all the way into January. So we hope you'll visit it and support our local businesses and really get some wonderful homemade crafts that you can share with family and friends. Yeah, so we're already going to start looking forward to next year when we hope we can gather together again in person. What are those fair dates next year, April? It is September 24th, 25th, and 26th. So until then, join us online for all of the great programming of the Maine Organic Farmers and Gardeners Association. We hope you have a great evening and a great year, and we'll see you next year. MOFCA's vision for the future is to transform the way we relate to our food through organic agriculture. 
Become a member today at mafka.org and support our ongoing work to create healthier, more resilient, and ecologically based communities. Thank you to all of our supporting members who make this work possible year after year.